Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Dressel. On, that, on the last point, I did note that from the December minutes of the SSC and then see it again here. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering, has the SSC or SSC chairs conferred with the with the plan team on the need and value of, of such a paper or the stock assessment author? Um, I'm thinking that we did a workshop on this before and I'm I felt like we were uncertain whether there were additional tools that might be available. So the value of a workshop was a little bit in question with my with my recollection. So I didn't know if you had had that conversation yet with the plan team or author as whether those kinds of considerations could be addressed in the next assessment cycle or whether a white paper is really the most productive path forward. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball. Um, the SSC uh, didn't specifically go to the plan team with the idea of the white paper in the workshop, but the plan team and author has um, brought this up to the SSC annually for, for a number of years now that there's real concern over, um, over conservation of this stock, but that the tools that we currently have don't appear to be working well. So, I mean, obviously one option is um, doing separate ABCs for these areas, but the problem then is that since it's not a target species, it'll just increase discards. So while we have that authority, it doesn't it doesn't seem like a great option. Um, the MSSC um, was was a really positive um, concept, and we've heard from public testimony um, that the industry has worked um, incredibly hard to keep their catches below these uh, I believe MSSC levels, um, but at the same time, that hasn't happened. And so the SSC and the plan team and the authors have continued to be concerned, but don't, while we have tools to use, they don't seem like the best option. And so um, public testimony actually came in front of uh, the SSC, and I believe this was, I believe it was in December, um, and suggested um, sort of a couple of different ideas um, that, that might be possible. And so what the SSC was hoping was that, you know, with, with our, current tools, we don't have good options um, other than to, um, I mean, we can set separate OFLs. We know that the, that the a black splattered rough eye, um, the genetic differentiation increases with distance, but what we don't know is exactly how far. And so it hasn't, the SSC hasn't felt like the amount of information has been there to make that determination. And we also recognize that if we made that determination, it would have real impacts for the industry since this is uh, not a target species. And so the idea of the white paper was to try to look at, um, and I wasn't involved in the last workshop, but to try to see if there were any management tools that could be used to help with this process, and then also to outline uh, research that we could do in the future to try to clarify, um, clarify some of these questions. Thanks for that explanation. Mr. Mizzero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Dressel. I just, uh, I noticed earlier that you wanted to change the number of SSC members to not more than 20. And so I, my question for you, Dr. Dressel, is there's room at the table on our next round of SSC appointments to consider a social scientist without removing anyone else from the SSC that has another important skill set that we put them on there for in the first place. Is that correct? Through the chair, Mr. Mesereau, um, yes, the, the handbook that we received, one of the changes that was listed in there, and I think that that may have referred back to uh, the council SOPs was um, limiting the SSC membership to 20. So that was one of that was one of the revisions that was sort of proposed to us and um, and we didn't have an argument with that. And so yes, the, the 
requests that we were making would be to add an additional social scientist, but yes, like you said, um, not in place of one of our, not by um, taking one of our current members off, but actually just by adding some additional um, uh, support in that area of expertise. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. McGraw. Dr. Dressel, please continue. Thank you. Uh, with respect to prioritization, the discussion at the SSC focused, like I said, on making sure that we haven't missed or delayed a scientific review that would have implications um, for council actions in the future. And so uh, we had a few suggestions. And one was we requested an update on the plans for the completion of um, the fishing effects analysis of the essential fish habitat five-year review. And it was primarily an update on both the work that's being done and the timeline. The second one was we're requesting an update on how biological sampling plans have performed in fisheries where electronic monitoring has been adopted. And what we note in our meeting, I'm sorry, in our minutes is that um, we, this update may be already coming in the EM observer report we'll see in June, the observer program annual report, which we will also see in June, the upcoming trial EM analysis in October, and possibly also in the Alaska Fishery Science Center director's report, which may come before us in April or June. Um, wherever this falls, or if it's in a separate update, um, we recognize this as an, as an important issue. And so um, we would like to follow up on that. And the last one on, on this slide is we request a briefing on the emerging risks of climate change and marine heat waves for sustainable management um, of the marine resources off of Alaska. This is somewhat linked in that the SSA acknowledged that workshops for scenario planning to identify um, adaptation strategies that are informed by climate and then changes to harvest control will, will occur in 2021. And so um, these, these meetings will not overlap with the SSC meetings, but the SSC did note that some SSC participation will be needed for these workshops and we look forward to that. The SSC requests an informational update on seabird status. Um, and the SSC also requests uh, that during times of virtual meetings that informational updates on emerging science focus on the most pressing scientific issues. And this is something that um, the SSC chairs and council staff have been working on uh, very hard, but it was in trying to juggle our time and content, the SSC as a whole made that request. Um, finally, the SSC highlighted that sufficient time is necessary to review documents um, for the SSC to provide the council with thorough review. And um, the SSC really does appreciate documents that um, have been uh, submitted in, um, with time to review. And we also acknowledge that there are situations in which a short review time is required. So if the data comes to a stock assessment author shortly before a meeting. Um, but we were especially concerned about documents that have become available only days before the meeting. And we wanted to acknowledge that that impairs our ability to do a thorough review. And so we're just highlighting this issue um, again um, for the council. And then the last one was that the, the SSC, um, the presentations are now being posted on the SSC agenda. The SSC agenda, separate agenda has been really helpful and being able to see those presentations and download them has been great. Um, the SSC did receive some public testimony um, and then also reiterated uh, for the SSC body that if it's possible that presentations could be posted a few days before they are given, um, that would be really helpful and it would also allow for um, public review before uh, testimony. Dr. Dressel, uh, Ms. Kimball has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On your previous slide, um, Dr. Dressel, I just, I am trying to go back and forth between your full minutes and, and this PowerPoint, so I might be missing it in the full minutes, but I think we're all having a bit of trouble with 
you know, sufficient time, um, especially in our virtual setting. We also heard public testimony on that in our B report um, to review documents. And I wondered if you had detail on that on that recommendation on what the SOC thinks is sufficient time for full analyses or for discussion papers. Is that highlighted in your um, handbook or is there something standard? Or are you just generally saying we need more time to review documents ahead of time? For the chair, Ms. Kimball, thank you for that question. Um, the one the one specific, um, the handbook does name that for um, initial review analyses, the two to three weeks before the meeting um, is, is the general policy. And that is, uh, and two to three weeks for that is is certainly sufficient for the SSC. Uh, the handbook, I don't believe, specifies any of the other timing. Um, so there's certainly there's always a gradient of when when these analyses arrive, um, and especially because the plan team meetings are very close to the SSC meetings. Um, it, it just inherently becomes short timing, and I know that both the um, the plan teams and the council staff have been working on that turnaround and they've really worked hard on it and we appreciate that. I think what we were highlighting is there are some situations where we may receive, you know, a 200 page analysis um, or item on the Friday before a meeting begins and in in that we're really looking at the extreme, the extreme situations and asking if those can be given, I mean, a week would be, would be great. And so I don't think that we're asking for, um, we aren't asking for a change in everything. And we acknowledge that some things are already sufficient, um, but for some things uh, the turnaround has just been too short. Thank you. Um, so the next item that was uh, taken up was C5 um, Bering Sea and Aleutian Island Crab, and we received uh, final specifications for Norton Sound Red King Crab, model scenarios for Aleutian Island Golden King Crab, and then uh, the CPT report. So for Norton Sound Red King Crab, uh, the SSC supports the CPT recommended base model, which is 19.0. We support using total catch in the tier 4A calculation, and that is a change from previous years where retained catch was used, um, but this is more in alignment with other crab stocks and how um, uh, catch is, is calculated for the OFL. So the total catch OFL in this case was 0.29 uh, thousand tons. The crab planting recommended retaining the buffer between the OFL and ABC, which the SSC lapsed set last year at 30%. Um, they, they, did a, they lined out nicely what concerns were less, what concerns were more, and because of um, new concerns about cohort progression, growth estimation, and uncertainty in the discard estimation, they suggested staying at, at a buffer of 30%. The SSC, however, recommended a more conservative 40% buffer, which resulted in an ABC of 0.17 thousand tons for 2021. And I'll line out the reasons for that in the following slide. Overfishing is not occurring currently and Norton Sound Red King Crab is not overfished. So the SSC justification for this 40% uh, buffer had, I, I think it's six points. Um, first one is that uh, the one survey that uh, was completed in 2020 was the ADF and G survey, and the abundance from that survey is much lower than in 2019, and the model's not fitting this new observation very well. The second thing was that there's a retrospective bias. So if we look at a five-year peel where you take off one year at a time, um, the model in this retrospective analysis overestimates mature male biomass by about 26% in each year on average. And the overestimation of growth, which could be occurring, um, may contribute to this retrospective pattern. 
Uh, the third is that survey selectivity is poorly estimated. Uh, and we, um, and then we had three more. So the recommendation from the ABC is currently increasing. Um, the ABC, I believe that the ABC under the 30% buffer was about, was over twice that of 2019. And so while the ABC is increasing, the only available information 2020 survey estimate is low. And the fishery CPUE um, has declined steeply through 2019. And so the fit to the recent low commercial survey, or sorry, the low commercial CPUE, similar to the low survey estimate, the fit to that is poor. And so, and then there were also no NIMS survey trawl data uh, in 2020 um, to contribute to this assessment. So uh, the next one was, uh, while the SSC sees that estimating a total catch OFL is an improvement, um, we did highlight the uncertainty in the estimation of discards. Norton Sound is, um, is I believe, the one crab fishery that does not have um, observed observers on the boats. And because of that, um, we don't have a great estimation of the discards. Uh, the last one is that the high recruitment, which was discussed last year and that was supported by a high survey biomass estimate, this year the low survey biomass estimate um, lowers our confidence in the magnitude of the recruitment pulse. And because of that, uh, there's large recruitment. Um, oh, and in addition, this potential large recruitment is still mostly both below the preferred commercial size. So those were the reasons uh, that we chose to increase the buffer to 40%. Um, in addition to this, the SEC provided rec a number of recommendations to the authors that I won't list here. Uh, the topics and the topics are listed on this slide, but I won't go into the detail. So the second thing was uh, we looked at Aleutian Island Golden model runs. Uh, this is the model that uh, will come before the SSC in June. So the SSC reviewed uh, the assessment models and uh, endorses the four CPT recommended models. And these four models were 19.1, which is the model that has been used in the past with simply with updated data, X121.1A is the same as 19.1, but it happens to have a time period where a different time period for specifying mean recruitment. The next one is similar to 21.1A, but it has three selectivity time blocks in there. And the final one is similar to 21.1A, but it has observer CPUE standardization that includes a year area interaction that the authors have been working on for a while. The SSC supports uh, the CPT recommendation to include two additional models in an appendix. One is uh, GMAX, the Generalized Model of Alaska Crab Stocks, I think is the acronym, um, and because we're looking to see we're hoping to move towards this in the future and we want to see some parallel development. And so having that in the appendix would be great. The next one is an exploratory ver version of model 21.1A. And this version actually ignores this, the 2015 observer CPUE and instead incorporates um, the cooperative survey information. The SSE also wanted to reiterate two previous suggestions that we've had and these include looking at exploring a single area model instead of a separate area model between the Eastern Aleutians and the Western Aleutians, or possibly looking at a two area model that has some larval connectivity between the two. And the second one was to evaluate whether the NIMS Aleutian Island Trawl Survey could be used as an additional index of abundance for this stock. So then there were a number of items uh, that we received uh, reports on through the, um, through the plan team. The first one was it talked about survey planning and um, the SSC is pleased to hear that at present, uh, the Alaska Fishery Science Center is planning to conduct a full complement of surveys in the Northern and Eastern Bering Seas in, 21, in 2021. 
although the SEC does realize that due to the dynamic nature of the pandemic, um, staffing plans are subject to change and we don't have final decisions on this yet. Um, the CPT had had discussions on, received a presentation and had discussions on if uh, there was limited availability on this survey, um, you know, what's, what stations should be prioritized. And so the SEC concurs with the crowd plan team recommendation to prioritize survey stations based on the influence that they have in abundance indices for the different crab stocks, as well as the uncertainty. And one thing that the SSC recommended to support this is to conduct retrospective simulations um, where abundance indices are recalculated with and without the candidate stations to identify which stations are of lowest priority in the event that an unexpected reduction in effort is necessary. Uh, the next two topics that um, we received presentations on were um, for the possible development of risk tables for crab stocks, and then also an industry questionnaire. So for risk tables, the SSC endorsed uh, the development of risk tables for Bering Sea and Aleutian Island crab stocks. And uh, we're really pleased to hear that authors of the Snow Crab Chapter and St. Matt Blue King Crab Chapter have volunteered to prepare uh, initial risk tables for review in May. Uh, the SSC also suggested that Norton Sound and uh, Red King Crab may be a good candidate for risk table development. In relation to the industry questionnaire, the SSC concurs with the crab plant team that the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers Industry Survey provides a beneficial opportunity to gather useful information from fishery participants. And we appreciated the opportunity to, um, to look at this questionnaire. Uh, the SSC suggests that this industry survey may inform risk tables and uh, uh, ESPs associated with safe chapters. And finally, the SSC noted that, um, that the developers of this survey um, may wish to consult with the LKTKS task force since they are uh, developing protocols uh, that may be useful. The next two topics um, in the plan team report were on climate change and on vast models. So regarding climate change, the SSC received a presentation on research quantifying past responses by crab stocks to climate variability, and then also exploring um, dynamic reference points uh, for Bering Sea and Aleutian Island crab stocks. And so the SSC uh, does highlight that climate climate-driven changes in crab pot, uh, production dynamics and species distributions, as well as climate adaptive man management strategies are important areas for further research. We really appreciated receiving that report. The SSC also reviewed an update um, on uh, exploration of vast models for crab stocks. And the SSC wanted to highlight um, past recommendation for uh, ground fish authors to develop standardized reporting for documenting these, for looking at visualizing outputs and for describing model fits. Uh, we really were appreciative, appreciative of the continued research to evaluate these model-based index standardization methods and efforts to align diagnostics uh, for these crab stocks with similar diagnostics for, that we see for ground fish stocks. Uh, the crab planting also gave, provided us a report on their updating their terms of reference, and they wanted us to uh, review and indicate whether we supported the changes. And the SSC did support the proposed changes to the terms of reference. And these included providing greater consistency with groundfish state chapters, um, revising tables to match what the SSC um, provides to the council, and then also improving documentation of how max ABC is calculated. The SSC looks forward to reviewing the updated terms of reference uh, at some point following the May 2021 um, CPT meeting. 
The next topic was stock assessment frequency. And um, the SSC had asked the CPT to consider uh, whether the, the current frequency, annual frequency, biennial, triennial frequency um, uh, could or should be updated. And the CPT recommended changing St. Matt's um, blue king crab from annual to an, a biennial scale. And they suggested changing Pribloff Island red king crab from biennial to triennial. And the SSC supported these recommendations and uh, continued to encourage um, the CPT to consider additional assessments that might benefit from a reduction in frequency of the full assessments. And this is always a juggle. Um, reducing the frequency you know, could allow more time for model development, um, could result in greater fishery stability. It would allow um, the SSC and the CPT um, it would allow our time to review um, different crab assessments. And then finally, um, we also noted that um, abbreviated or partial assessments that only update catch or data um, could also be considered. So keeping the model structure, but updating the information going into them um, takes less review and also takes less time for the authors. I believe that this is the last item for the crab plant team report. Uh, the crab plant team um, completed their January modeling workshop and the SSC just wanted to commend participants, <laughs> not participants, participants on the stepwise, on the transition analyses that they're using to move from the models that they currently have to the, G, the standardized GMAX format. And then we also wanted to um, commend the process where they're using these modeling workshops to um, have experienced users provide assistance to all stock assessment authors. And that's just a vet we thought that was really uh, valuable for them. And so we, su we support these future workshops. We know that there are a lot of work and we wanted to commend them on this. Uh, the next topic was under D2. Uh, yesterday, you were, you um, received the um, the ESP application. Uh, on the SSC's agenda, we also received a report on an EFP that's been completed, and this one was the Aleutian Island Pollock uh, EFP. And in this, um, three vessels participated in an experiment to determine what factors were associated with Pacific Ocean perch bycatch in pollock trawling. And sadly, no strong predictors were identified, although the captains did seem to have some ability to pr predict uh, POP bycatch. And so the SSC supports the conclusions reached, recognizes that there wasn't a strong indicator, and really appreciates the efforts that were involved in the experiment. The SSC did suggest that the data that was collected could be analyzed in a multivariate way, and it's possible that there may be a chance of finding um, significant factors or finding fishing conditions that did affect POP bycatch. And so if the um, investigators wish, they could go back and, um, and do an additional analysis to see if anything comes out. And then the SSC recommended that um, future work might focus on um, identifying the captain's ability to predict, predict POB, POP bycatch. And this was initially, it, when it was presented to us, it was explained that uh, the captains believed that when fish schools were far from the bottom, that POP bycatch was minimized. And one of the things um, NOAA personnel are, uh, are indicating that work using hydroacoustic signatures to distinguish pollock from POP um, have continued. So that was just some additional information. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Dr. Dressel, there's been a lot of um, discussion. And in fact, you were kind of about to go into some of it with your next um, discussion item about um, how to incorporate local knowledge uh, as well as traditional knowledge into um, uh, in, into our sort of collective database. And, and it strikes me that this is potentially 
an example of local knowledge, um, the captain's ability to predict um, POB bycatch. So I'm wondering if the SSC, I understand they, they talked about, well, maybe if captains can do it, we ought to be able to find it using multivariate analysis. But was there also discussion about instead of taking that avenue, simply looking for an avenue to just incorporate the captain's knowledge, um, uh, first off, verify it and then incorporate it into um, into our, our assessment abilities and, and our management abilities just as local knowledge rather than trying to find a, a, a multivariate analysis that could replicate it? Through the chair, Mr. Twight. Uh, yes, I think that um, the multivariate recommendation was actually um, the the participants actually, or I'm sorry, the investigators for this EFP did a, I believe it was a, a, a univariate analysis. And we agreed nothing came out. There were no strong factors in the univariate analysis. If they wished to do a multivariate analysis, something might pop out, but we agreed that it was unlikely. The next step, like you were talking about, was actually that uh, captains appear to have some ability to predict POB bycatch. And so I don't know that the SSC actually specifically delineated that as local knowledge, but we were suggesting that that ability or that local knowledge is worth investigating further. Um, and that's why it was kind of exciting to know that the hydroacoustic signatures that were taken under the CFP were actually submitted to um, NOAA and they were looking at them to try to try to distinguish, and like you said, uh, to try to verify. Um, and so the, that work has continued, and I, I don't believe that we addressed it directly, but your suggestion that, um, especially if the captains, if the investigation into the captain's ability by themselves or any um, additional analysis from NOAA um, indicates that they've got an ability to predict, uh, definitely, that would be that would be a valuable piece of local knowledge. Please continue. The next item was a D three. It was a um, Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan, and. Um, the SSC received a presentation from the Bering Sea FEP team. The SSC noted concern that the changes to the language of the objectives for the LKTK task force um, might be perceived by those who harvest, share, and use subsistence resources as an indication that the council is not sensitive to the vulnerability of subsistence dependent communities to climate change. And I will note, however, that the SSC discussion occurred before the council took up D1 on community engagement committee and adopted the motion, which specifically relates to these concerns. Um, so I just wanted to put the timeline in there for you. The SSC uh, did suggest it may be appropriate for the FEP team and associated task forces to continue to explore ways in which interactions with subsistence communities can be benef mutually beneficial, um, which was the two-way engagement that the council had noted in um, the motion for D1. Um, the FEP team um, presented an ecosystem health report card and they, pre they presented updated information on the progress towards developing this report card and um, explained that this would fill a current information gap by providing longer term indicators of changes in ecosystems. And it would include high casts and forecasts, which stem from the climate change task force and are currently not captured in either the ecosystem status report or the uh, see if I get this acronym right, I apologize if I don't, the uh, economic, socioeconomic um, profile products. The SEC supports the development of this product and, and encourages the team's continued coordination across the ESR, ESP, and EHRC groups to avoid unnecessary um, 
uh, duplication in efforts. So the SSC um, also um, discussed and recommended that future iterations consider removing the word health from the name. And I believe this is a topic that may have come up in the past. And um, also suggested that in addition to the excellent outreach projects that are being developed by this team, that they, they perhaps consider tracking the use of these outreach products uh, to determine how successful they are in reaching the public. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Dressel, the, um, the Ecosystem Committee in, in reviewing these um, uh, struggled as well with um, getting the acronyms right. Um, and, and sort of on reflection, realized that that was probably uh, uh, in microcosm uh, a reflection of of what a large number of our stakeholders may experience when they look at this, um, the range of products that are being developed, uh, um, the closely related names, the acronyms and all that. And, and just really uh, the ecosystem community expressed a lot of concern about um, the impact that has on accessibility. Um, I see that SSC was concerned about unnecessary duplication and I, I that makes sense as well. Did the SSC also have some discussion about um, uh, how accessible or how usable these products to, or, or these different tools are, are going to be in their current state? Um, and did they have any suggestions for um, improving the, um, the accessibility of them if, if they were concerned? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Twight. Um, you know, the SSC did receive public testimony actually on the difficulty with all of the different products and committees um, for members of the industry, the public, um, to track all of these things. And the SSC, I guess there, there are two parts. The SSC has been focused on having these not be duplicative because, and and trying to identify where um, where specific pieces, where it's best that specific pieces of information are put, and then also trying to describe what is in those. So, in other words, if uh, figure out uh, what uh, data series are best represented in the ecosystem status report versus one of the others, and so some of that, our focus has been to sort of separate those out. But I don't know that we have addressed the difficulty in tracking all of these things. Um, the one thing that we we did mention as far as tracking was um, we've been really supportive of the um, outreach project products that have come out of um, some of these. So like there's a um, like a, a two to four page briefing on the ecosystem status report, and we've been really supportive of that because the accessibility for that compared to um, such a, a long detailed report, um, we think is great. And that was sort of the same thing here. Other than that, we didn't discuss, you know, if there should be less groups or anything like that. And we, we just left that up um, obviously to the council. Okay, then um, the next topic was sort of under D3, um, there was a report on the Climate Change Task Force. And so the SSC reviewed uh, the Climate Change Task Force's five-year work plan. The SSC um, finds that the plan lays out an important and an ambitious suite of activities that will effectively build bridges between the science um, of the fishery ecosystem plan, which is action informing, and the fishery management plan, which is actionable decision support. And so the planned contributions to tactical management, uh, the SEC found are, are well aligned with um, the existing products used by the, by the council, such as the ESPs and ESRs. Uh, the SEC does 
suggests the primary contributions of the Climate Change Task Force will be in advancing the strategic planning with a focus on the delivery of social ecological decision informing information. And the SSC um, notes that um, the council um, uh, will need to establish a, a rigorous scientific review of the climate informing products that come out of the climate change task force. And so that sort of leads into this slide where the SSC recommends that these products are regularly reviewed and approved by use, but um, approved for use by the SSC to ensure that they utilize the best scientific information and provide a reliable scientific basis for informing the council. Uh, the SSC does anticipate that um, its members will participate or some of its members will participate in workshops that are seeking input for scenario planning. And we recommend that the scenarios for possible changes to the existing time area management, allocation, including bycatch management, harvest control rules are developed. Um, these scenarios for possible changes are developed with close collaboration with the stock assessment scientists, plan team, SSC, AP, and the, North, and the council. Um, and we do believe that the climate change task force will add the, will aid the council in planning for urgent climate related issues. And um, the third part of D3 was um, an reviewing an actual module work plan from the local knowledge, traditional knowledge subsystems task force. And this work plan uh, is to develop protocols for incorporating and, and considering LK, TK, and subsistence information into the council's decision-making process. And the SSC notes that progress has been made on the development of the work streams and the products have been consistent with the council's February 2020 action. The SSC commends the task force on the progress that's been made um, on, in the on-ramps for accessing local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information into the council's process. Um, the SSC noted, and I, I don't know that it's actually in one of my slides, but we, we did put a specific um, um, note that, that we were quite impressed by the progress of this task force during COVID with all the limitations that they had. So in general, um, I wanted to note that. The SSC does recommend that this task force closely uh, coordinate with the climate change task force because the climate change task force has identified on ramps for this TK LKS information into the regular development and workflow of the products that have already been established for the council. And again, those ESPs, ESRs, and SAFE. The SSC is encouraged by the progress on protocol development and recognizes that this is a critical element in bringing local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information into the council process. The SSC then noted um, that the 12 initial high level guidelines that were included in the protocol um, represent a solid foundation um, for what is recognized as an ongoing protocol development process. Um, the SSC also recognized the importance of the progress that's been made on the development of a catalog of sources and an accompanying search engine for identifying and finding uh, existing, finding existing and soliciting um, LKTKS information. And I believe that this is the final note. The SSC recognizes the importance of this task force's work on a conceptual model for tribal engagement, given that LK and TK are living sources of knowledge, they reside in individuals and communities, and that building relationships are really key um, to fully bringing that knowledge into the council process. So the SSC also received in D4, we received presentations on the groundfish and the crab economic safe. Um, first, the SSC received an overview of 
and this actually responds a bit to Mr. Twight's comment, um, where the SSC itself is trying to track where different sources of information fall um, within the council products. And so we received an overview of the different sources of human dimensions data for groundfish, crab, other species, and where the summaries and descriptions of these data are located. And we found the summary ourselves very useful um, for clarity and consistency in addressing the obligations under National Standard 2 and National Standard 8. The SSC uh, finds the groundfish economic safe um, to be a useful reference on the status, economic status of fisheries. And it's a, it's a um, product that has become more useful, organized, and accessible to the public over time. And we've commended the authors on that. The next, uh, actually, let me go back and see if I... There we go. I think I just missed that slide. Yep. Um, so for the crab economic safe, the SSC recommended the development of a report card um, that reflects the needs and opportunities in the fisheries. And a similar report, report card uh, has been developed already, I believe, for the groundfish economic safe. And finally, the SSC noted that the rationalized crab fisheries offer a really unique opportunity to track the economic health of health of fisheries thanks to the comprehensive uh, data that's collected under the CRAB uh, Economic Data Reporting Program. Just one minute while I catch up with my own notes on these. Okay, so uh, under D5, the SSC received a marine mammal status report. Um, Due to COVID, there were limited uh, 2020 updates for population trends um, due to you know limitations in access and field work. And field work is anticipated to resume in uh, some, this coming summer uh, for a number of species. And the SSC recommends that uh, relevant marine mammal time series data sets um, would be valuable for integration into the ecosystem status reports uh, where this is possible. We received, as part of the report, um, we heard that a spatially explicit bioenergetics model for northern fur seals is being combined with outputs of an ecosystem um, model called FEAST, uh, acronym FEAST, and a multi-species stock assessment model, the acronym is Seattle, and then several other projects, and are seeking to improve the knowledge of both the numerical relationships and the functional relationships between marine mammals, fisheries, fish resources, and the physical environment, which is critical for council work. The SSC encourages continued efforts to collect diet data, um, as this is really an important um, and essential type of data uh, for integrating marine mammals, marine mammals into ecosystem models and for understanding the interactions with fisheries. Um, several presentations that we received noted changes in the distribution, timing, migration, or body condition of marine mammals in the Bering Sea. Uh, the SSE encourages continued efforts to monitor marine mammal populations in the eastern and northern Bering Sea. Uh, currently, there's, uh, because of some receivers that have been put out, um, there's documented north-south changes in distributions, and the SSE encouraged that if if possible, and if funding is available, um, to try to explore east-west distribution, changes in distribution as well. So this is the first year uh, that the SSC received information from a marine mammal co-management organization, and this organization was the Elliott Community of St. Paul Island, the Ecosystem Conservation Office. And this present, the information that we received was on a synergistic pro projects for research and management that are being conducted locally. The SSC recognizes the valuable information on marine mammals and fisheries interactions that become available from this and from also from other co-management groups, communities, and local communities. Um, 
the SSC did, and let's see if we have that in. No, we don't. Um, so the SSC actually received some public testimony on um, how there are numerous other either co-management local communities um, that can that would be valuable for the SSC to hear about. And one of the things that the SSC had said was that we we really support the efforts of the local knowledge tradition on knowledge assistance task force in finding and identifying on ramps for this information in the future. Um, it's not clear whether that would go directly, you know, all of these reports would go directly to the SSC or whether there were other mechanisms sort of within this council process that that information um, could be heard and um, heard, acknowledged and made use of. Ms. Kimball. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dressel. On your, on your previous slide, I, I think that's one of the things that we're uh, struggling with as well. And I appreciate your support for the efforts of the, the task force. And, and is, was this bullet supposed to just be cognizant of the fact that that task force is going to be identifying the, explicitly the places in which this information can be used in our process? you know, through the SSC or the plan team and or the council. So you're not um, you're not saying that work is done or that we know what that looks like right now, but that we expect that task force to lay that out for us in the future. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, exactly. Uh, and we look forward um, to when that is laid out and when um, to finding the appropriate and effective way to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the SSC on the last day of our meeting on Friday convened a workshop workshop on risk tables um, regarding um, allowable biological catch advice uh, to the council. And the workshop was motivated by a number of things, um, a feedback from stock assessment authors and plan teams, as well as the SSC has been planning to come back and reevaluate, reassess how risk table, how risk table performance is going and has been used um, once uh, risk tables, tables were filled out for ground fish stock assessments and, and presented to us. And so at this point, authors have filled out risk tables uh, across the ground fish assessments and we're kind of doing an evaluation and uh, um, I guess an evaluation of where we're at and where we're going, what has worked well. So the primary goals of the workshop were exactly to evaluate how is this risk table process working, um, to look at consistency issues with the risk tables as has been identified by the groundfish plan teams, assessment authors, and the SSC, uh, to provide guidance um, to the plan teams for and authors for moving forward through, and we did this through an open discussion between the stock assessment authors, plan teams, and SSC members. And it was really valuable to have all of us together in one room to discuss um, this risk table process. The SSC gives a big thanks um, to the workshop session leads. Uh, they did, they did a, a great deal of work uh, for us and they provided excellent presentations. And we also uh, appreciate the participants for contributing um, to the discussions that we had. We certainly found that the discussions obviously uh, cannot all be fit into four hours. Um, so what we came up with was the workshop highlighted the value of the risk tables in doing a number of things, uh, fostering increased transparency, uh, fostering communication between ecosystem process researchers and stock assessment scientists. Um, the risk tables have provided a venue for authors to capture concerns about whether um, in their work with the data on a stock assessment, additional precaution is necessary with respect to the ABC. And also um, provides a space to articulate authors' concerns and areas for additional consideration, which is really helpful for both the, uh, the plan teams and the SSC to see. The workshop showed that there is a mix of opinions among participants, 
regarding the purpose of the risk tables and the definition of risk. Um, they were productive, but definitely not conclusive in four hours discussions about whether and how to develop risk tables for non-target species or tier five or six species, and whether these tables should continue to be implemented um, to look at things in a qualitative case-by-case -case basis, which is what we've done so far, or be transitioned to support a more prescriptive quantitative approach for um, reducing the ABC if necessary. And the SSC recommends um, pretty much the, this workshop allowed us to get all of these issues out into the open and but did not have time to resolve them. And so the SSC recommends that the workshop proceedings be captured in a written report. And the SSC offered a list of suggested topics and questions for consideration in that report. So some of the key suggested topics and questions that came up were um, to clearly define the objective of the risk tables, uh, to develop a working definition of risk that is appropriate for this risk, risk table exercise, um, to decide whether to use qualitative or a quantitative method for um, defining whether ABC reductions should be made once table scores are assigned, and we also suggest including a review of the benefits and drawbacks of qualitative method or a quantitative method. Another key question is, are assessments of risk across species with different, fish, with different fisheries and connections with a broader ecosystem, are these, our assessments, our goal has been to have some consistency. And one of the questions is, with different fisheries and connections to the ecosystem, are these sufficiently comparable to fit within a framework like this recommending ABC reduction? Um, here's our, a few more of um, the suggested topics and questions for to include in this report. Um, one of the suggestions that came up in the workshop was uh, potentially a revision to the ranking categories from the existing four categories, which the levels were normal, increased, major, and extreme to a new four, um, unknown, normal, increased, or extreme. Or I think there was even a suggestion for possibly a three-level um, category. Another question is which species to include. For example, should species with catch levels that are much lower than the ABC be excluded from this process? Is it worth the time and effort to put together a risk table for those? Uh, Expanding on this, should the relationship between catch and ABC be a consideration in the assignment of the risk level? Uh, the last two are consideration of when and how traditional knowledge and local knowledge can help uh, when there are data lags and or missing survey observations within the context of these risk tables. And as always, um, we hope to address the trade-off between transparency and complexity that is always inherent in um, the work that the SSC does. And that is uh, the last slide of my presentation. I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Dressel. Kimball. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dr. Dressel. I have a, a couple on this last topic and um, I guess, first of all, I appreciate the SSC taking the time to do the workshop. Is is the intent from your slide that that report, there's a brief mention in your minutes, but is that the report from the workshop would come back to the council with some recommendations associated with these ongoing questions? And so we would see this in the future and be able to provide feedback to the SSC? Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, uh, yes, I, I failed to mention, um, the goal of this report was to sort of synthesize all of these questions. And then the suggestion in our minutes was that um, we address, address and discuss this report to try to come forward with some recommendations for the plan team in September. Because I believe that the plan team is um, has scheduled some additional time to talk about risk tables, but they really wanted some guidance on where to go first. The risk table workshop came up with all the questions 
but not the answers. And so the hope was that to get this report done so that the SSC can address it and come up with some direction, both either at the April or June meeting. Um, we did not include in our minutes um, presenting this to the council and getting feedback, but certainly if that's a, if that's a helpful avenue, um, I'd be glad to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think it, I think it is. I think the council had approved use of the risk table. We've continued to have, you know, questions about it and trying to help guide the use of it and um, meet its intended purpose. And so I think coming back to the council is a, is a good idea. I, I also wondered about your very first bullet, if I might, Mr. Chair, on, on trying to determine the objective of the risk table. And I, I understand that can, can create a lot of great discussion, but did the SSC discuss that, that the council has, has put forward even a motion explaining the purpose of the risk table um, from December of 2019 that we tried to lay that out with the uses. And I just wonder what the connection with the council's intended use of the risk table is. And I can reiterate what that is, but I, I'm sure you're well aware. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, um, actually, I if you, if you could clarify what that was, that would be that would be greatly helpful. Uh, and sorry, Dr. Holloway I'd led this workshop, and I don't recall if we've referred directly back to a council motion or not. But if you could share that, that might help me remember. Sure, Mr. Chair, with, um, and we can provide that at another time. I, I it just seems hard sometimes to make this connection, but but the council had put forward a, a motion that passed about the dual purpose of the risk table in the specs process. And it was to facilitate further collaboration and communication among stock assessment scientists and those in other disciplines like the ecosystem and climate scientists. And then the second purpose was to increase transparency and consistency in the rationale from reducing from max permissible ABC based on exceptional risks and circumstances that aren't already addressed in the stock assessment. So I felt like we had a guiding force, I guess, toward what the purpose of the risk table was. And I just was a little confused about maybe um, redefining that or, or questions about, about that. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, that, thank you, that helped. Yes, those, those objectives um, were laid out at the beginning of this workshop as, um, as goals uh, and objectives for this risk table. Uh, where this workshop continued, I guess, was that um, we got into a very technical um, discussion of what risk is. And, um, and so, and one of the questions that came up was, um, we definitely knew that um, transparency, cooperation, um, and only using this in sort of uh, extreme situations. Those were those were certainly acknowledged. Where where we discussed more was, does this risk table? What is the? And sadly, I do not have um, the different definitions of risk that we came up with. But one of the, if I may, sort of generally describe this. I think that the question was. Is the description of the risk table, is risk the likelihood of going over the overfishing level? If that's the case, then the amount of catch that's taken for, say, some flatfish fisheries where the catch is way below the ABC, the likelihood that that stock would go over the overfishing level is incredibly low. If that's the case, do you continue to do risk tables for these stocks when you really don't expect that that is going to occur? Um, and so we're looking at some effort um, assessment authors. The other question and other perspective that people had is that the definition of risk was looking at how much uncertainty there is outside of the assessment process. And so not really looking at, is this gonna go over the overfishing level, but is this, how much uncertainty is associated with the stock assessment? Well, that applies to all stocks. 
And so if that is the goal of this, if it's not a risk table that you say exceed the OFL, if it's an uncertainty table where you're defining how much certainty is associated with a particular stock, then we would want to fill it out for all stocks. And so we kind of got hung up on that and realized that we needed to know the objective. Is it, are we evaluating whether this is going to go over some bad, uh, sorry, some level or are we evaluating just in general how much uncertainty there is? And based on those, we need to define our risk or label our table differently, and that'll affect sort of how we go forward in that. Thank you, Dr. Dressel, and thanks, Mr. Chair, for your, your patience on this. This workshop occurred while the council was in session, so we we didn't get to listen to it. So I appreciate all, all the ability to ask questions. I am. Um, I do think that the council motion, uh, Dr. Dressel, is is the second version of risk. That does not mean I don't think that we could not reevaluate whether that's an appropriate approach. Um, but certainly, to date, we were talking about trying to capture uncertainty that is not included, you know, in the model and the stock assessment, not included in the tier system, not included in the harvest control rule. Um, so if there are SSC recommendations um, to move in a different direction for, for good reasons, it sounds like, then then I do think um, having that come back to the council so we're all in a solid understanding of where we're moving is, is important. And I also think, just since I have the floor, that um, you know one of your previous recommendations was, was uh, you know, supporting use of the risk table with the crab plant team and some crab stocks. And I, I wonder, this might not be your... Uh, expertise, but I wonder how we translate some of these evolving questions to maybe new users of the risk table. I would hate to involve a whole nother uh, a group or plan team without having some answers, I suppose, where we just continue to um, create more confusion. Did the SSC talk about that when they recommended the risk tables for use in crab stocks, or is that just a general recommendation and we'll all evolve together? through the chair, Ms. Kimball, um, our recommendation for the crab stocks actually occurred before the risk table workshop came about. And so um, I, part of our, I, I agree with you that I think that I, we need some answers to these things. And that's part of why we moved the workshop up. Um, it will, and so your comments are, I really appreciate your comments. I think that in May, two CRAB authors are going to, or two assessments are going to come forward with, with risk tables. And I think one of the key differences, um, obviously, for CRAB is that there's state management. And so we're dealing with sort of two different entities, and CRAB really are distinct from groundfish. And we started with groundfish because it was a little bit clearer. So it'll be interesting to see where those two come but I do really take your point that we need to answer some of these questions first before expanding and having people spend a great amount of time um, on this. And so perhaps when the SEC revisits the results of these workshops, perhaps we can um, address that specifically at that time. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Dressel. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Ms. Baker. Uh, Mr. Chair, my question is on a different issue. I wonder if Mr. Cross wanted to discuss the risk tables. Maybe he should go ahead. Looks like that's a Roger. Mr. Cross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Dressel. It, it, somewhat of the follow-up to Ms. Kimball, I, I had the same exact concerns as her um, following this. And, and the other the other part of that, my question is, is in this discussion, um, having sat through numerous, um, since the beginning of the risk table discussions at the plan team when it first came up, um, I'm wondering, was there discussion about who fills out the risk table? One of the complications that, I, that I've that i seen uh, going forward in the transparency and all this is, is understanding who's filling it out. And, and, and in the beginning, it was the stock assessment authors that were filling it out. And, and it seems to evolve, have evolved, um, that the plan team and SSC and other people are all 
kind of editing and, and continuing to fill out. Uh, so I'm wondering, was there discussion about how the risk table, uh, not only its use, which, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Kimball went through, and, and I agree wholeheartedly, um, but how it's filled out and by whom. Was there any discussion on that at the SSC or during the workshop? And I'm sorry, I missed the workshop. Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Cross, there was actually there there were a couple there were a couple areas of discussion. Um, one of them is the authors are certainly the most knowledgeable of the data that goes into their assessments and for the development of their assessments. Um, one thing that we have been told from the plan teams and the authors, however, is that they have really struggled because if this risk table is to be consistent across species, they can't be an expert in all of these species. And so there's been a real concern from authors that the SSC is expecting them to somehow know how their species fits in with all the others. And so the plan team, um, and so this year the plan team actually didn't didn't have time to uh, do any revisions or review of the author's recommendations. Last year I believe that they did. And so what the plan team did then was they looked across um, they looked across species and they 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 stuck with what the author had, except for they adjusted with their knowledge across, say, species within so if it was the Bering Sea. Planting, Bering Sea and Aleutian Island planting, they may have suggested to the SSC, the author suggested this level based on whatever context with other species for consistency or other things, the plant team suggests this level. And then the SSC finally looks at not only the Bering Sea and Aleutian Island plant team, but the Gulf of Alaska um, plant team and all those stock assessments and then makes a final recommendation, which is where sort of this reduction from um, mass ABC has occurred for some species. And so it has been an iterative process. We did identify that the authors, we want the authors to fill it out. We wanna know what those authors think. Um, and what we've actually specified, however, is that the numbers that you put down, what we wanna know is why you chose the numbers that you did. And so that's sort of required in this assessment and that helps us understand and generalize across species for the goal of having some consistency and transparency. We did suggest somewhere in this meeting, I can't remember where it was, that possibly an author, instead of filling out the risk table in isolation, might, value, might benefit from having two or three other authors, say at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center for Groundfish, also look at this to provide some context, especially if authors are feeling kind of like they're hanging out there and don't have a context for what values to put. So I think, so we did talk about it in, in those contexts. A follow-up, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Sure. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Duff. That, that helps that the, the, that discussion went forward. I, I guess, uh, along with Ms. Kimball, I, I'm hesitant to to see the crab take this on when we're still uh, as a as a as a group as a council family all the way from the plan team the SSC and stock assessment struggling with how to how to make this uh, really productive. Um, but I guess uh, on your last statement, um, was there discussion as as they because uh, this discussion went on at the plan team um, this two years ago was th this idea of uh, the stock assessment author um, conferring with other disciplines at the Science Center in filling out the risk table. And, and I brought up at that time, one of my fears on that is we start to lose the second uh, kind of uh, idea behind the risk table, which is transparency. And that discussion of each group putting their, uh, uh, their touch into the numbers that go into that risk table if that occurs at the science center and not in the public, it becomes, uh, we lose that transparency. So uh, anyway, thank you uh, very much. And, and I look forward to uh, both the SSC and the council, and especially the council having another shot to, to look at this and work with the SSC and the plan team on uh, developing this risk table in a way that's productive and transparent. Thank you.
Ms. Baker, we're ready to shift gears. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Dressel, my question relates to, I missed my chance back on D4, uh, economic state portion of your presentation. And I just, I need help orienting myself. You, you noted that um, there was an overview of the different sources of human dimensions data for a groundfish crab and other species um, and, and where summaries and descriptions of those data are located. And are those found in the safe documents themselves or where can I find that overview? I just haven't been able to do that. Uh, through the chair, Ms. Baker, I don't believe, I don't recall that they are actually in the safe documents. And so um, the SSC, the, the place that I know they are is in the presentation that was just given to the SSC. Um, and so it would be the very first slides in the, I think that they may have put up a single presentation for the, um, for the economic safe. That's the only place that I know that it's at. I can't recall if it's somewhere else. Okay, thank you. I um, I appreciate that. I consistent with the discussion we've had already a little bit today in terms of the difficulty of tracking a lot of these different things. Um, that uh, I will look at the presentation and um, perhaps if if the SSC has found them helpful. Uh, this overview, we can find uh, uh, an easily accessible place uh, to put that information. But I'll take a look. And thank you very much, Dr. Dressel. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dr. Dressel. I, I went back even further to the, uh, the uh, six recommendations you have that should be scheduled or considered, and a couple of those stood out to me. But I was wondering, do you do you have a, a ranking or, or anything that you know uh, uh, the one that stood out specifically, and 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 you acknowledge the urgency with the the work on black spotted rough eye rockfish, but uh, what what should we be looking at as far as or what's your your take on the, the urgency or the value added as far as a priority so with those six or maybe we should just look try to do them all <laughs> uh, through the chair mr marks thank you for the question uh a number of them i believe were um a number of them i believe were requests that the ssc had for their schedule um and so I don't know, you know, if the I don't know if the council needs to directly act on those. Um, we really didn't we didn't prioritize these recommendations, um, and so I don't know on behalf of the SSC. I don't know that I could that I could state uh, an order for them. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I have a better answer than that. No, that that's fine. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Marks. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was wondering, and I apologize, I didn't ask you about this at the time that you covered it, but um, Mr. Chair, I keep losing my video. Are, can you still hear me, though? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I'll just continue on. But um, I, I'm particularly interested in the comments that the SSC made about the recommendations of the Climate Change Task Force. And the one that caught my eye was um, on slide 26, your recommendation that scenarios for changes to things like time area management, allocation, bycatch management, and harvest control rules be developed in close collaboration with stock assessment scientists, et cetera. And I guess, I can you inform me any more about the discussion that the SSC might have had about the the scope of work products that we expect from the Climate Change Task Force? Because um, I apologize if if I'm I just haven't been tracking this, but I. I had not necessarily anticipated that the Climate Change Task Force 
would be developing scenarios for changes to allocation, for example. Um, and so I just was hoping you could inform me more about how that discussion went at the SSC. Through the chair, Ms. Campbell, thank you for that question. Um, the SSC did not recommend any changes in scope um, or direction for the Climate Change Task Force. Um, what that, that specific recommendation was, however, was to encourage if these activities are undertaken, um, that they not be done in isolation. And so like for harvest control rules to um, do this in collaboration or communication with the plant teams in the SSC, or if, or if things touched on time area management or allocation, that they certainly um, would need to be in close collaboration with the council. So I think our recommendation was simply that um, that the group continue and continue to um, communicate and to collaborate um, with our groups rather than in isolation if, if those uh, things were to occur. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dressel. That, that makes a lot more um, sense to me that the recommendation as I understood it, is, uh, your explanation is really about integration with our existing process and, and not necessarily an expansion of scope. So I really appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Any further questions for Dr. Dressel? Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I'm reluctant to bring us back to the um, to the uh, issue of the risk tables, but I just, I, I just, I, I, li I listened to everything, all the questions that were being asked, and I, I still didn't really hear the clarification. Who is going to be um, doing this this written report that you're recommending come out before the fall ground fish? Plan team, you have 13 different bullet points there in the full minutes, and you know it's a pretty extensive report. And also, what's not mentioned in there is the, the public comment that you received. I see you only had one person uh, commenting in the public on that, but the um, but it was you know he introduced uh, extensive comments in a PowerPoint, but that would be nice to see captured in this report as well. But I'm just I'm just curious if, if there's anything the council needs to do. I think it's important. There's a lot of frustration and and uh, um, and uncertainty, you know, in in uh, members of the industry that attend the plan team meetings, particularly when these risk tables are being filled out in real time at the plan team meeting. And if there's uncertainty as to really what even is the process for filling these out. So um, I'm curious on that. I just uh, maybe I, I missed something, but just on the creation of that report. Thank you. For the chair, Mr. Down. Um, no, he didn't miss anything. We actually didn't go into authorship, or I didn't go into authorship today. Um, we, when we were coming to the close of this workshop, we realized that there were so many questions and topics that had come up both through discussion, presentation, public testimony, um, that the first step likely would be to document and line those out because we realized that we had 20 minutes for an SSC discussion and it wasn't sufficient to come up with recommendations. And so uh, we actually, we have sent an email out to the um, presenters um, to and to um, SSC members that were involved in this, and it'll be members that were in this risk table workshop that we are asking for their participation to put this report together as sort of a summary so that it can be used for SSC discussion so that we can actually move forward. So those are the, those we have not yet defined who those authors will be. Um, it depends on their willingness um, to be part of this, but it'll likely focus on the people that were presenting the information as well as the SSC members that were sort of leading these sections. Uh, your other question about um, council participation in that, um, I, I think that, 
hearing hearing the feedback today has been really helpful as far as I mean what is what is useful for the council and so if there are obviously if there are directions that the council uh, suggests in the process about how we go forward we certainly welcome that yeah say thank you I, I, I um, um, mr. chairman I have another another question so I just would um, so I'm, I'm just assuming based on your answer here that it's you as the co-chair and, uh, and Dr. Hollywood as chair that will be following through with the participants um, that are listed in your minutes to gauge their willingness to to uh, combine to create this paper. That, that's the answer I think I heard. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Through the chair, Mr. Down. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Down. Not seeing any further questions for Dr. Dressel. Thank you so much for your time this morning, this week, and uh, all the work that you and the uh, the SSC do. Uh, we we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Have a good rest of your meeting. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to agenda item C5. We have time to get going on the staff presentation for that prior to uh, our morning break. So I'll invite uh, Jim Armstrong and Katie Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jim Armstrong, um, Council staff support for the crab planting very briefly. Uh, Plain team co-chair uh, Katie Payloff will provide the staff presentation. Um, the only action for the council under this agenda item is to specify OFL and ABC for Norton Sound Red King Crab for 2021. Uh, the, the safe sections are, are posted under C5 along with the action memo or the complete um, crab planting meeting report, the AP motion, and there are four uh, written public comments that address Norton Sound Red King Crab. Um, as you heard in the SSC report, there were quite a few additional topics that were addressed at the, at the meeting, uh, including an assessment modeling workshop. Um, Ms. Payloff will cover those items uh, very briefly since you already got a lot of detail. So again, the action for the council under this agenda item is just for what sound red king cred, OFL and ABC for 2021. Uh, that's all I needed to say. Ms. Payloff's ready to present. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, Kayla. Good morning, Mr. Um, Chair and Council. So as, as Jim said, I'll, I'll give you guys our uh, oral report here from our, our crab planting meeting in January um, for the Bering Sea Lucian Alley Crab Stocks. And with that, I'll just I'll kind of dive in. So just to, to remind you all, we're at our January, um, February assess, assessment during the year, and that will be, as Jim already said, said on Norton Sound Red King Crab. The other crab stocks that we look at are kind of divided between our, our May, June meeting and our September, October meeting. Um, in addition, just to point out here, uh, you already heard from the SSC that we did kind of look at our frequency and prioritization for some of our crab stocks. So some of these stocks are already done on a bi or triannual cycle. Uh, we, I have one or two slides just to kind of touch on that um, in, a, in addition to what Dr. Gressel presented there. Um, additionally, just a reminder here for our crab stocks, all our crab stocks are either tier three, four, or five um, based on life history information available um, in addition to, you know, the ability to model and survey information that's available for the stocks. The uh, tier kind of leads to um, our ABC buffer um, discussion for different stocks. It was a range that we've kind of indicated here on this slide, but um, as you know, that's kind of ever evolving as we continue on and potentially start to consider uh, other ways to look at buffers like risk tables um, in the future. So for our January meeting, this is a glimpse of our full agenda that we had at our January meeting. And the way I organize, we organize this slide here is that the bold items are those that are action items at this meeting. And you already heard some of that from the SSC report for Norton Sound, but I'll, I'll touch on a couple things that um, Dr. Dressel didn't go into uh, as a little bit more detail on. 
The black items here are other items that are included in our oral report um, that I'll briefly touch on. The blue items are not in our oral report. They are in our written report. Um, the reason for that is either they are either items that you've received in other forms um, through um, either SSC or on their own. Um, the CRAB Economic Safe was presented as its own agenda item to the SSC. Uh, for example, in addition, there's a, a number of research topics that we heard at our meeting that are ongoing. So you will stay tuned to um, more information on those as we continue and hear more updates um, in the future. So something uh, the SSC report did touch on, but I just wanted to reiterate right now, the plan is to have a, a full survey complement for the 2021 crab surveys in the Bering Sea and the Northern Bering Sea. But as you know, <laughs> things have changed over over the last year or year or so, um, we ask them for them to bring an update of that to our May meeting. So if anything does change between now and May, we would then update you guys at the June meeting. So with that, I'll, I'll jump into Norton Sound. Uh, as the SSE report already stated, there was one single model that we considered for Norton Sound. This is what we were recommended to the author from September. We wanted the authors to spend the time between September and now to really dive into the CPT and SSC comments, which they did a very thorough job with, in addition to working on a draft uh, GMAX model for Norton Sound Red King Crab, which is the generalized model for um, Alaskan crab stocks. So just a couple things to point out was the fishery data for this assessment. Um, there was not a data point for the summer fishery for 2020. Uh, the, there was no summer fishery, Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation did not buy crab. In addition, there was an emergency order put forth through the Board of Fish and the fishery in most of Norton Sound was closed for, tw for um, 2020 in the summer. So just to, to kind of point that out, we did have a ADF&G was able to execute their trawl survey in 2020. So we do have that data point. Um, in addition to, to reviewing this model, the CPT also received reports on ongoing research to look at um, things like the status of females in the stock, tagging studies, and pot loss. And I've included a slide on those and I'll briefly touch on those topics. Um, these are all ongoing research, but I wanted to touch on them because many of these topics are concerns that we have for the stock and why the buffer for the stock um, is higher than some of our other stocks. So just to briefly touch on the model itself, the solid black line in here is the model fit through the trawl survey um, abundance estimates. And here you'll see that Norton Sound has two different surveys. The NIMS survey, which is a, when it's done is the Northern Bering Sea survey. And those are the um, really kind of hard to see, but the turquoise or greenish dots here and the yellow dots are the ADF and G trawl survey. Um, so two things to point out, there was a really large abundance from the 2019 survey. And I'm gonna grab maybe, ah, there we go, all right. <laughs> Uh, anyways, the 2019 survey was pretty large, but there's a subsequent drop in, um, in 2020. In addition, in the years where we have both surveys, which there's not a lot, you'll see that in 2019 and 2017, there are some differences between those two surveys. Um, the main reason I, I decided, we decided to present this to you today is just to show that the model fit is kind of catching the upper end of the confidence of the 2020 survey. It's not dropping down to that um, 2020 abundance level that we see. So kind of overestimating potentially what, what's out there. Um, in addition, this is the CPUE for the summer survey. And uh, you'll see here that, here we go, I finally got the pointer to work there, sorry about that. Um, the model fit is once again, the solid line. The 2019 CPUE is, is down here, very low levels. There was no 2020 data point because of the, the fishery, due to the fishery being closed. However, um, you'll see that the, the model fit is not necessarily even in catching these, these low data points of CPUE that we saw in 2018 and 2019. So this just leads to some concerns that the CPT um, and SSC have over, um, over the model and kind of potentially overestimating the amount of, of crab that are out there. Uh, so as the uh, SSC report already stated, the CPT also recommended the, the one model that we have here, model 19.0 going forward. We recommend moving to a total catch OFL, and this is an improvement. And this hasn't been done previously for this stock because it is a fishery that's 
pretty difficult to have observer coverage on due to the nature of the fishery. Just a lot of small vessels in the summer, plus the through the through the ice fishery in the winter. So it's pretty difficult to get um, the observer coverage that we have in other crab stocks. However, we do have data, uh, some data of observer coverage in addition to stock side um, and data that the authors were able to look at a number of different methods to estimate discards so that we could have a total catch OFL. Uh, and so this is an, an improvement for this particular stock. In addition, the, uh, you saw that the SSC recommended a 40% buffer. The CPT had put forth a 30% buffer um, based on some of the reasons that we listed here that the SSC already went into detail into a lot of the concerns for the stock. Um, but just a couple that I wanted to point out is just in general, the, mo the model may be overestimating growth and therefore expects to see larger crab. And the model deals with this by having a higher mortality on large crab, but whether or not this is a, a co this is something that has been consistent in this model and something that we're looking to try to determine. Um, in addition, just concerns over this fishery in, in 2019, the low CPUE value, um, in general, poor recruitment, and also there's some concerns over female health. So. Um, this is a spec table, but the SSE spec table is more accurate since they're recommending a 40% buffer. Um, just wanted to forward that even with a 40% buffer, the ABC value from uh, 2020 is is close to double uh, what it was. Um, it's close to double <laughs> what it was in 2020. So quite a large increase in ABC, but there's uh, still a lot of concerns for uh, this stock in general. So some of the research updates that we saw that I thought I would highlight for you guys quickly, uh, we looked, they looked at some data on females. And the big takeaway here, I don't want to get into the details, is over on the right, you'll see um, these kind of large portions of the bar graph here that are red. And these are years, um, and it has occurred in the past. The three circles here rec represent three different times, where you'll see large portions of the females that are barren, which means they don't have any, any eggs. And so this... The thought is this may be a mismatch in recruitment where the female, the males may be too small to mate with the females that are present in the population. Um, but this is concerning because it's not really, sh we're not really sure what the reproductive um, fallout is from these events where we have kind of a reproductive failure in, in particular years with close to half of the females not having a clutch of eggs. So this is something that we want to monitor further, and we've asked the author to include more information on females from the surveys um, in the SAFE document. It's currently a male-only assessment model, but the females are an important portion of this um, stock since we need them to produce more crab. So it's we want to continue to monitor the female health going forward. In addition, there's some work being done on locating large males, some tagging work. I won't spend a lot of details on this. This was kind of a, a initial pilot study that looked at the crab from a shorter period of time, from I think July to October. Currently, there's more work being done to um, add more tag, more tags, and also to look for a longer time period to see where these these crab are going. Um, finally, there is research being done looking at lost pots. So as you'll see in, in the winter commercial fishery, in the past there has been a large number of pots that are lost during this fishery due to, to sea ice um, retreating, most likely. Uh, there's not necessarily requirement to report on these lost pots. So these are the pots that were reported potentially because the um, fishermen wanted to replace those pot tags, but potentially at the end of the season, uh, there's not necessarily as much of an incentive to report on lost pots. Um, while these pots do have, you know, cotton, um, cotton twine to that will open after a certain amount of days to let these crab out. Potentially, if they're actively fishing, there still could be some mortality when they're lost. In addition, there has been some studies um, throughout Alaskan waters and throughout um, other areas that have shown that the, there is potential for these pots to be ghost fishing in the future. Potentially, the cotton twine don't open when they're supposed to. If they have a lot of biofouling on them, um, they potentially may not um, break open within that 30 days or um, ever, depending on how the pot lands. So uh, just there's some work being done to determine where these pots may end up um, with some tracking. That's very preliminary. But potentially the idea would be if, if there was a determination of where these, some of these pots would be to obtain funds to start looking for them and seeing if ghost fishing may occur. 
So just some highlights of research. There's a lot of really great ongoing research with this stock. And as we continue to hear about this research, these are things that we can then take back and incorporate um, into our understanding and our modeling processes. So with that, I'm going to jump into a couple other topics that I'm just going to briefly touch on here in our, in our report. I think the SSC report uh, pretty adequately went over the proposed models that we'll see from Aleutian Island Golden King Crab coming up in May. Uh, just one thing I wanted to touch on is we really do support the author's incorporation of the cooperative survey CPUE index for this stock. This is a stock that we use uh, fishery only uh, data to assess uh, and having this cooperative survey really allows for us to have a, a fishery independent um, index. And while it's not ready for us to use this, this model to set facts, we do encourage the, um, the author's continued development of bringing in this the CPUE index. Um, and as, you, as, the C, as the SSE report already detailed, we expect to see four models um, to look at for consideration in May. So uh, the SSE report also touched on the fact that we looked at stock assessment prioritization and frequency, identifying two stocks that we could potentially assess less frequently, Cribble Fall and Red King Crab and St. Matthew Island Blue King Crab. And I'm just going to really fully uh, touch on our reasoning there. Uh, St. Matthew Island Blue King Crab, as you know, is, oh, is overfished and under a rebuilding plan. Uh, the rebuilding plan reporting requirements are on, on a biannual cycle, so every other year. So moving the stock assessment to a biannual cycle would align with that. In addition, while because the stock is in a rebuilding plan, um, it, it is anticipated that it would take several years before it got to a level where any sort of directed fishing would be appropriate. And so moving this assessment to a biannual basis would, would lighten that load and would also allow for additional survey results to be available in each assessment, potentially reducing um, misleading singles on stock recovery. So seeing a, maybe a high abundance in one year and a low in the next would even out by having a biannual cycle. This also aligns with the next two years that we expect ADF and G to do their POT survey in this area, which has now moved back to a, a triannual cycle. Cribloth Island Red King Crab are assessed biannually. However, there's no directed fishery due to conservation concerns for Cribloth Island Blue King Crab, which are also overfished and under a rebuilding plan. So Moving this assessment to a triannual basis uh, wouldn't, would not impact any potential harvest. The assessment uses GMAX, so there's pretty limited potential for further model development, and this would just also lighten our lighten our load um, for uh, crab plant team assessment authors and subsequent SSE, um, in, you know, level input. So uh, I think I just have two other topics here that I thought we'd briefly touch on in our oral report. Um, this is the Alaskan Bering Sea crabbers put together a fishy, fishery questionnaire in the SSE report. Um, did also touch on this. There, the thought here is it's a skipper survey. It was done after the Bristol Bay red king crab fishery last fall and is currently underway for snow crab. Uh, and the goal is to utilize industry and community data collection to help fill data gaps. And this kind of came from an effort after we did not have our survey this past summer of information they could potentially be collecting on an annual basis from skippers at the end of the season that we could then use to inform our um, you know, management and assessment process. So the CPT greatly appreciates this effort and we were also able to weigh in um, on the questions being asked and um, the you know, answers expected, et cetera. We asked for updates on this at our September meeting. And we really see this being utilized as a, as a good tool uh, potentially uh, as we move forward and with risk tables, um, but also just in the state tax setting process to have this information um, from skippers in a way that's consistent uh, from year to year too, which, which helps. I, we do, ADS indeed currently does collect um, information doc from dockside interviews of the skippers, but having this in a, in a survey where we have consistent answers will help to have it um, be comparable from year to year. So we really wanted to um, just re reach out our appreciation for this effort um, from, from the industry and the fact that they allowed us to um, provide comments and, and kind of um, suggestions for moving forward with us. And just one other thing, we, we I know you, um, you all already heard of the crab PSD groundfish um, action in the groundfish fisheries. 
But the CPC did have some comments, and I believe that the SSC report um, also kind of went into detail on this. We had we had, had asked the SSC for some feedback and advice uh, because one of our concerns from from this motion was not specifically on the motion itself, but on some inconsistencies across the stocks as to how these calculations, um, the inputs and the calculations were developed, uh, and then also just on the values that the PSC limits are based on, so the abundance estimates and um, if, they're, if they're being treated in the way that they were intended. And I believe that the SSC report, um, out of the SSC report, they recommended a white paper to look at, at some of these um, questions. And so that the, S the CPT definitely would support that um, also. And I think with that, that's the end of our oral report, but I'm happy to take any questions on anything I've presented in addition to other questions um, on things in our written report that we did not present on today. Great, thank you, Ms. Paylos. Any questions from council members? Kimball. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Ms. Payloff, I, I wonder if you heard the SSC presentation before yours and, and could give the council a little bit of a better understanding on how the CREB plan team intends to approach the use of the, the risk table in the next cycle for those two species. I think I got it right in two species um, in part because we just had a good discussion about how that continued to evolve and is evolving. and. Um, and I'm wondering if the crab plan team is well aware of those continued discussions. Yeah, through the chair, Ms. Kimball. Yes, um, I was able to catch that. So I did listen in on that. And um, yeah, we, we are aware. Um, we were aware of the risk table workshop. That's um, at our meeting in January, we had discussed, we kind of went into detail on risk tables for those of our members that maybe weren't familiar with them, those that aren't involved with the ground fish fisheries. And our initial plan was to try to have a draft for there was you're correct two stocks snow crab and St. Matthew blue king crab to look at in May, um, and I believe that is still our plan. But I think what where we would go from forward from that is in May, kind of seeing where the um, SSC risk table workshop where their report landed and see if it's appropriate for us to to push forward with looking at risk tables for our September cycle or if it's more appropriate for us to kind of put a kind of a break on that and pause until some of the ground fish stuff gets worked out. So I, we are aware of, you know, if there's a lot of things that are still being worked out with the risk tables and we don't want to jump ahead too much um, in trying to add to that um, confusion or uh, chaos there <laughs> as we try to, to hammer those out. So um, I guess the, the simple thing is we still plan to look at them um, for two stocks, at least in a draft form in May. Um, but we, we aren't necessarily um, committed to, to moving forward in this cycle if, if we find it more appropriate to wait uh, on ground fish and see where they're heading. So I, I think Thank the you. idea for doing the, yeah, the idea for doing the draft ones in May, I just wanted to get out there, is, is just to kind of see the feasibility and, and what they would look like for crabs. So we may find that we um, just want to give it more time to, to have um, a better idea of what should be considered in them before we move forward to. Great, I appreciate that. It does sound like, well, we don't dictate the time that the SSC would have that report and, and when the council would put that on its agenda to review, it sounds like there is some time between now and September um, to get further feedback before you, you press ahead with the use of those. So I appreciate you just being cognizant of that kind of background, thank you. Dr. Balsier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Dr. Philip. I, I found it very interesting. My main question was uh, already put forward by uh, Councillor Kimball, but I also am curious about the barren females. Uh, I, I looked through that report when it first came out, and, and uh, you're suggesting perhaps the males aren't big enough to mate with the females, all of them, but I noticed the data that I think is in the report would suggest that the big females are almost always mated and it's the smaller females that aren't. So I'm curious about that. I also noticed in the table that it appears those years that NOAA does the survey, there's less barren females. So I was 
that last part is just a joke, but I, I didn't see that in the table. And I'm sure it's because they didn't collect all that data. But if you have a comment on the, the sizes of the males relative to the size of the females, that, I'd be curious about that. Thank you very much. Through the chair, Dr. Belfer. Um, yeah, that was some, just looking at those histograms, something that the researchers in, in from ADF and G group pointed out that there were some differences in the overlap of the size distributions. Um, it's not something that we really dived really deep into. Um, it was just kind of an initial hypothesis. I think there's more work to be done on this female um, data. In addition, one of the things, it's funny that you mentioned that, but one of the things that the um, researchers are looking at is the consistencies between how the females are considered a barren between the ADFNG and the NOAA survey. So at what size would a female be considered mature versus immature? So an immature barren female is not, um, you know, unique, right? We don't expect them to mate. But once they become mature, we would expect them to have an egg clutch. So there are some um, kind of inconsistencies in those data. And I, I think the researchers in, in NOMA are working on, on trying to tease that out. So I, I think this was a great initial kind of putting all the female data together to get a good look at it. But I think there's still more work that needs to be done to, to really try to understand um, why there, there are, there seem to be these years where we get really large barren females. Um, you know, if some of it might be uh, data collection differences or if it's um, actually the fact that we're seeing, you know, a reproductive potentially a failure in, in certain years. So um, it's something that the CPT recommended tracking in further years and getting more reports on from, from the research group. So that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but hopefully it, it helps a little bit. No, thank you. That's very good. Uh, thanks for tolerating my latent interest in science. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been on the Bering Sea with a crab in my hand, but I have done that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Dr. Balthiger. Uh, thank you, Ms. Payloff for the report. Hey, it's uh, uh, just after 10 here. Let's go ahead and take our, our morning break and then we'll uh, come back at 10.15 uh, and hear public comment and take action on agenda item C5. Um, I'm gonna have to step away for a, uh, a short time and so Mr. Twight will uh, call the, the meeting back to order here at 10.15.
Well, we do have a quorum, uh, so we're still lacking uh, at least one council member, but uh, council will come back to order. Um, uh, council members, are there any additional questions of staff regarding the presentation? I'm not seeing any. Mr. Witherall, are, are we ready at this point to move to public testimony? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, um, I wanted to remind members of the public who are signed up to give testimony, please make sure you're now connected to the meeting via phone. The sign up list, um, for those of you who want to be able to follow along for who signed up, um, is posted on the e-agenda. Um, and um, for testifiers, the, uh, the timer is displayed, but um, I'll be tracking as well. And looks like we have just two testifiers signed up. The first one is Charles Lean. Charles, are you with us? I'm, I'm here, can you hear me? You're coming through well. So the floor is well, thank, yours, you. thank you for the opportunity. My name is Charles Lean. I'm the chair of the Norton Sound Fish and Game Advisory Committee and uh, testifying with regard to the Norton Sound Red King Crab model. We are uh, very concerned because management seems totally dependent on this model for the Norton Sound fishery. It's a bit of an unfair burden in that the, the model seems to drive all the decisions and there's very little input otherwise. This is contrary to the uh, Fish and Game Regulations, 5AAC 34.080, and that's the policy on king and crab, tanner crab management. It, it brings up a number of in-season considerations that you would think would would weigh heavily on management. Things like ice movement, hot rods from ice movement, um, handling mortality, and such. Um, the modelers aren't aware of some of these issues until they're informed of them, and that's been a problem in the past. I would point out some things that were brought up here earlier in this discussion. The, uh, there's a difference between male and female maturity, it's about a year's difference. Females reaching sexual maturity about a year before the males. <clears throat> and that that goes to uh, inform why there was that lag in uh, in female fertilization and clutch, uh, clutch abundance. And then uh, another issue is that uh, crab that, that bear the male crabs that bear the burden of most of the reproduction, um, they spend a lot more energy and often skip molt. So that that equates to a higher mortality on those crabs that are most active. Um, that's important because approximately 20% of the mature male crab right now are legal size, meaning 80% are sublegal. So those crab that are that are of the legal size are the ones suffering the greatest mortalities. Um, another issue that seems to be overlooked is the, the huge difference in handling mortality winter and summer. So in the winter fishery, crab that are uh, that, that are uh, not returned to the water immediately upon pulling and to suffer frostbite to varying degrees. Now that can, that could occur, it could be uh, immediate mortality, or that could be long-term mortality when the, uh, when the crab fails to molt. Uh, when crabs are frostbitten, it's very difficult for the old shell and the new shell to separate. Sometimes they get stuck half in, half out, and don't make it. So those are things that aren't addressed in the model things like differential mortality with the seasons, the uh, 
the mortality of the mating age class, regardless of whether it's a big crab or a small crab, and things like that. We, we see that as a, uh, an issue with the model and something that needs investigation. I think Martin sounds kind of unique in that it, it has two fisheries in the year, one in the winter and one in the summer. So currently with the, uh, the skewed population of males and the fact that the majority of them are still sublegal, um, what an effect we have is a recruit only fishery. Very, very few post recruits in our fishery or in our population now. So that's expressly forbidden in the crab management policy. And the reason it's there is because it was noticed in the eighties when, when uh, the Gulf of Alaska fisheries declined that, uh, that having recruit only fisheries is a real bad deal. I know this firsthand because I was a North and Sound crab manager and attended those meetings when that policy was put into effect in 1990. Um, it's, it's aggravating, it's alarming, but this past wisdom that's captured in the rate book laid out fairly clearly isn't respected today. It's, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between the biometrics and the biology and managing the crab fishery. It's a, it's a huge concern of ours. Anyway, in, the, in both the North Sound Advisory Committee meetings and the federal RACS meetings, the OSM meetings, both bodies are are very concerned about this recruit fishery and the fact that we're the, the early early notice was that uh, you know the fishery was going to quadruple now it's only going to double the, the quota from last year is only going to double from, from the year before uh, my goodness you know what what are people thinking and we would we would really like to see the fishery closed for another year until we have some depth in our legal size crab that is more than one inch class. But anyway, I understand the 40% moat is uh, is uh, the precedent. I think it's too little. The advisory committee thinks that's too little, but it's better than nothing. So uh, please keep us in your in your thoughts here. It's a uh, we're in crisis, we're in a rebuilding mode, and uh, we're very concerned about the model. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Uh, let's see, are there any council member questions? Um, Dr. Balsiger and then Ms. Bush. So, so thanks, uh, Mr. Lane, for the testimony. I uh, don't have a question, but I, I just wanted to compliment you on, on uh, getting on the phone and, and talking to the council on this. And I'm hoping that your insights are provided to the crab team, and I think they are through the ADF and G people, but just wanted to thank you for coming. Thank you. Ms. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Lean. Um, I appreciate it. I, I did read your written comments as well, and um, understanding that um, the council's crab fishery management plan um, outlines the responsibilities for both the council and the state for managing the crab fisheries, whereby the council sets the status determination criteria, the OFL and the ABC, and then delegates to the state the responsibility for setting the guideline harvest level and are closing the fishery. Um, so I'm, I, I'm wondering then, um, uh, you, you have, have you brought, um, these concerns up to the Board of Fish uh, because they are responsible for setting the harvest strategy or um, is there something you would like the council to do in terms of amending the SMP or um, specifying things differently? Because the concerns I, I, I hear you saying are are more related to the state's harvest strategy and, and, and not something that this council can influence. Thank you. 
but to the chair, um, we, we brought this to the board of fish last year, and in the six to seven, a uh, six to one decision, they agreed with us that the, the fishery should have been closed, and they closed the, the summer fishery where red king, king crab are most prevalent. They left open the portion of the district where blue king crab and, and spiny king crab exist. Um, so it was essentially a red king crab closure last year. We we uh, we had quite a discussion about whether to close it a second year or not. We were hopeful that management would see the light. They did not. Um, we understand that the GHL is set by the state, but we also understand that state regulation mandates closures and restrictions. And and when we bring those up at the advisory committee meeting and other places, we're told not to worry about that. That that's a policy. It's it's not. It's a regulation. It's thirty four point zero eight zero, and. Uh, it seems really clear cut that the state should follow their regulations. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your testimony, Mr. Lean. Um, just a, a quick question. Is your advisor committee recommending that, uh, I think you said that in your testimony, that the crab fishery not be open this winter and coming summer? Is, is that what, what the desires of the advisory committee would be in your area? To the chair, Mr. Jensen, yes. That, that is the recommendation of the advisory committee, and it's also the recommendation of the OSM RAC, the Regional Advisory Council that reports to the Federal Subsistence Board. A follow-up, please, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Chair, thank you again, Mr. Lane. Yeah, um, I, I remember the discussion well last year on on closing that fishery, and I, I think the Board of Fish did the right thing at the time. Um, and have you uh, submitted like a agenda change request, or see that we're not having meetings this year? It probably have to be an emergency petition in order to close the fishery. Has has your advisory committee or somebody from the public done that up there in your area? No, we have not. Um, we didn't realize there was an opportunity. Yeah, you broke up there, Mr. Lane. I, I believe he said he didn't realize there was an opportunity. Mr. Jensen, did you want to respond to that? Uh, he, he, um, I, I would uh, definitely give it a try. Emergency petitions could be held anytime, and, and we can, and the Board of Fish can convene to go to the commissioner and then to the Board of Fish. But it'd be worthwhile your for your worthwhile effort for you folks up there if you don't want a fishery. So thank you for your testimony and thanks for your comments, Mr. Link. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further council questions? I'm not seeing any, Mr. Lean. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Thank Raymond you very Yacoubian. much. Ms. Raymond Yacoubian, do we have you with us? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning, council members. My name is Julie Raymond Yacoubian. I'm the Social Science Program Director for CoERIC Incorporated. COERIC is the regional tribal consortium composed of 20 federally recognized tribes in the Bering Strait region. COERIC is very concerned about the status of Norton Sound Red King Crab and would like to add our voice to the, the letters and the testimony that you just heard. We would like to highlight the importance of Red King Crab to Bering Strait region tribes and residents. Crab are an important subsistence food and the harvesting of crab is an important cultural activity. Particularly in these times of climate changes and ecosystem shifts, food security is of great concern to our communities. Steps must be taken to ensure that the Norton Sound Red King crab populations grow, rebound, and are available to be stewarded by future generations of subsistence harvesters. Bering Strait region residents are heavily reliant upon many subsistence harvested resources, including Red King crab. Prices at grocery stores in our region are very expensive. 
In some of our communities, a gallon of milk can be as much as $25. Harvesting subsistence resources is both relatively inexpensive compared to buying store-bought food and encompasses cherished cultural and family traditions. Subsistence practitioners harvest what they need to get them through the long winter months and share their harvest widely in their communities and beyond. In Nome, local grocery stores will sell four or five Red King crab legs for about $80. This same amount of money can be used as gas to get an individual out on the ice to set a crab pot, and that individual could then get as many crab as they want or need under subsistence crabbing regulations. The recent trawl surveys indicate that Norton Sound Red King crab have not fully recovered. According to the latest survey results, most of the crab documented were juveniles. It will take a year or more before these juvenile crab are large enough for legal harvest. Action should be taken in order to help preserve the crab stock, allowing it to grow and rebound. In 2021, the subsistence king crab harvest by permit holders in the Bering Strait region is one of the lowest on record. This is another indicator that the king crab population needs additional time for recovery. Climate change should be another factor in determining harvest levels. Research indicates that ocean temperatures are continuing to increase. Warmer ocean temperatures create unfavorable king crab habitat, which is additional reason, reasoning for taking a precautionary approach when deciding harvest limits and other fishery actions. Court strongly believes that the current stock for the Norton Sound red king crab needs at minimum lower commercial harvest limits in order to preserve a king crab fishery that has not yet fully recovered. Coeric believes that state and federal cooperation and fisheries management is crucial and that regular and consistent communication and collaboration is crucial and would like the council to be aware of these concerns and to do everything possible to ensure the survival and the thriving of this stock. Uh, Koyana, thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? Dr. Balsiger, is that a legacy hand or a, a fresh one? Ah, um, well, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Ms. Raymond Yacobian. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So with that, uh, council, are we ready for action on this agenda item? Ms. Bush, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe uh, council staff has our motion. I see it now. Uh, nope, that's not the right one. There we go. <laughs> um, the council accepts the Norton Sound Red King Crab Safe Report and adopts the SSC's recommended total catch OFL of 0.29 thousand metric tons and an ABC of 0.17 thousand metric tons for Norton Sound Red King Crab. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Ms. Thank Bush. you. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I would like to thank the, assess the assessment author for his hard work and both the CRAB plan team and the SSC for their careful consideration of the available information. As noted in the SSC minutes, uh, we are moving to a total catch OFL and ABC for the stock, which represents the best available science. Um, I also wanted to, uh, again, address concerns that we heard um, with some of the written and oral public comments requesting that the council close this fishery and would like to encourage those members of the public to forward these requests on to the Alaska Board of Fisheries. Um, under our CRAB FMP, the council sets the annual overfishing limit and acceptable biological catch level, and the FMP then authorizes the state to set the guideline harvest level or close the fishery according to the regulations established by the board. Um, I will certainly pass these concerns on to our department staff, uh, but wanted to clarify for the public how these different responsibilities are partitioned um, in our FMP. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Um, are there any council member questions uh, about the motion? I don't see any. Um, so the floor is open for any amendments that council members may have. And closing that window of opportunity, um, a new one opens. Council members, any comments on the motion? Mr. 
Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for the motion, Ms. Bush. I, I will be in support of the motion and I go along with what you uh, told the public over the airwaves here at, at the, and I've already talked about with Mr. Lean in, in public testimony and I know the public uh, written comments are all pretty much uh, in opposition to a uh, crab fishery. Ed, and so the next step for the public is to go to the Department of Fish and Game and, and go through the Board of Fish process and, and try to do what they did last year. And it did go through and it probably gave them some uh, comfort that they didn't have a fishery there. Uh, they had a small fishery outside of the area, but the main fishery wasn't open. So thanks again for your motion, Ms. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Jensen. Any other council member comments? I'm not seeing any. Um, are we ready to vote? Mr. Weatherall. Calling the roll on harvest specifications for Norton Sound Red King Crab. Mr. Cross. Yes. Mr. Down. Yes. Mr. Jensen? Yes. Ms. Kimball? Yes. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mesero? Yes. Dr. Balsiger? Yes. Ms. Bush? Yes. Ms. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Twight? Yes. Yeah. Motion passes 10 to 0. Thank you, Mr. Weatherall. Is there any further action for the council on this agenda item? I don't see any. Then I believe we're moving on to D3. Is that correct, Mr. Weatherall? That's correct. Okay. Uh, looks like this will be a multifaceted presentation. Um, Ms. Evans, were you going to explain how this is orchestrated? Mr. Chair, yes, I will. Just a moment, let me pull up the presentation. Thank you. We'll stand by. Okay. Good morning, members of the council. My name is Diana Evans, council staff. And as you noted, we have several parts to this presentation um, and several groups of presenters. So the, you will be getting a report from the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan Team. They met last March. Um, so, and because of the of COVID and the pandemic, we did, haven't had a chance to report back out to the council since then. Um, I'll be presenting that with Dr. Kiram Iden. We are both co-chairs of the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan Team. Then you will be getting a report from each of the two task forces that are working on specific action modules coming out of that fishery ecosystem plan team. And you will be getting a report from uh, Dr. Stram and uh, Dr. Kirsten Holzman, um, who are co-chairs of the Climate Change Task Force, and then uh, Dr. Hoppala and Dr. Wise for the Local Knowledge, Traditional Knowledge, Subsistence Task Force. And then finally, before you, uh, the final staff report will be the Ecosystem Committee report on this issue. So with that, I'll move straight into, um, actually before I move straight into that, just noting for the whole of D3, um, so all of the different parts here, uh, we just wanted to make uh, clear to the council what the action required here is. Um, you're getting reports from the Yelke TKS Task Force and the FEP team. Um, while obviously we appreciate any feedback and direction from the council um, on our work, uh, the only action item that we're specifically looking for from the council under the agenda item is to endorse the work plan for the climate change task force. That's something that you did for the LKTKS task force when you met, I believe, last February, a year ago. Um, but the we haven't had an opportunity to do that yet for the climate change. And with that, if you now, we'll get Ms. Evans, before you go on, um, a couple of other yes. just reminders. First off, um, I suggest uh, council members to hold their questions for natural breaks as possible. Um, and secondly, um, for members of the public who may be interested in signing up for public testimony on this, um, they need to do that before the end of the staff report. 
Uh, just a reminder that the sign up is located on the E agenda and that if you're planning on testifying, please be sure uh, that you are connected by phone before your name is called. So again, uh, if deadline for signups for public testimony on this is at the end of the staff report. Ms. Evans, back to you. Excellent. So this is a, just a really a fairly brief presentation here from myself and, and Dr. Iden. We're going to tag team a little bit, so I'll begin and then he can introduce himself when he takes over for me in just a couple of slides here. Um, the FEP team, you can see the members listed on the right-hand side of the slide here. As I said, we met in March of 2020. I think we were one of the last uh, in-person meetings before everything went virtual. And because of that, um, we were slated to report to the council last April. Um, but this is the first opportunity we've had to do that. Um, we are now in the process of our new role as an ongoing management of the FEP team, as opposed to our previous role of development. So this has been our second meeting. And we focus on the tasks that were identified in the fishery ecosystem plan for our plan team um, to manage action modules, to provide strategic advice on, on the Bering Sea ecosystem monitoring, um, outreach and communication. So I'm not actually, although the written report is attached to this agenda item and, you, and it's available to you, a lot of the recommendations in a lot of our meeting focused on the action modules that were then in development. Um, since that time, our March meeting, there, there's been a lot of work happened within those task forces. So rather than give you recommendations that have been incorporated and superseded through time, I'm going to skip over that part of our report to you, uh, noting that, that uh, those, those comments have been incorporated and you're hearing presentations on those topics. So the other things that we talked about at our FEP team meeting were the primary uh, time we spent was on development of the ecosystem health report card. We had a mini workshop on that and Dr. Iden is gonna give you a little more detail about that in just a moment. Um, we were asked by the SSC last February to provide some input on research priorities as a plan team, what um, information would be useful for the SSC as they come up with their comprehensive holistic list of, of research priorities for the council that they then um, funnel to you. Um, so I have, I'll have just a slide on that in a moment. And then the other two aspects of the written report that you can see, we talked about um, one of the intents through the FEP was to do a better job tracking how concepts and information about the ecosystem-based fishery management and specifically the fishery ecosystem plan are taken up into the council process or into our general process. And we try to make that an agenda topic at every meeting. Uh, to keep that um, recognition going as we as we move along about how the council is making progress. And then we also talked about some of the uh, updates to our website that we're planning and communications project product, products related to the FEP. Um, so just one slide here on the research priorities to share with you. And we, we've shared this with the SSC as well um, at their request. Um, we, as one of the council's plan teams, um, in addition to all the other plan teams as well, put forward uh, kind of our top three or four research priorities. And what we really wanted to focus on, in on was the priorities that are embedded in the action modules that have been adopted by the council and moved forward by the council. And so um, the priorities that you see below on the bottom side of the slide here reflect um, that connection with the LKTK module, the climate change module. And then the third bullet is about um, another aspect that was part of the FEP to look at uh, an assessment of, of council's bearing team management with respect to EBS um, so that we could look if there were gaps or areas where we could improve our practice. So we have provided these to the SSC and you will probably see how they how the SSC pulls together that holistic list um, when they discuss this in April. With that, I'll pass over to Dr. Iden for the discussion of the ecosystem health report card. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, so I'll discuss the Ecosystem Health Report Card briefly. It's um, a product that was uh, first suggested um, to the FEP team and uh, reviewed and brought before the council bodies in 2019 at some point. Um, and the recommendation was uh, to do some reorganizations of the council ecosystem projects and, and really the goal here was to pull strategic and longer term indicators of change into a new style of report. And to be very clear, since, since we've received some feedback on the proliferation of acronyms and reports, um, 
it doesn't really matter if this is called its own standalone product or whether it's called a part of the ESR. That might be an uh, intelligent uh, name for it to, to, to uh, limit confuse, confusion. Uh, the key point of this is that over the years, the ESR itself has really been honed toward tactical management decisions. Uh, in other words, what you need to know stock by stock to maybe uh, fill out a risk table uh, in December or in November or December and all of the very direct and tactical indicators that go into those sorts of decisions. Whereas the, the things that we would pull aside for the ecosystem health report card would be far more strategic. Uh, an example from the single species world would be the fishery stock sustainability index or FSSI. Uh, that simply counts the number of stocks subject to uh, that are overfished or subject to overfishing. This is a, a NIMPS NOAA uh, index that they've created. So, so those sorts of more strategic uh, indicators. And the reason that we we brought them together is uh, our review of uh, best practices in fisheries ecosystem plans highlighted the fact that we don't no FEPs in the past have really tracked the success of their ecosystem projects. Uh, holistically and strategically. So that would be the primary purpose of this report card. Um, it's organized around the B Bering Sea FEP's uh, goals and objectives. So it's got a specific tie uh, to indicators that, that, that measure whether we're succeeding in those objectives that, that were approved with the base FEP last year. Um, currently, there's an FEP team work group uh, that's being led by Elizabeth Sidden uh, to, to develop an initial framework um, and the intent of this will be developed, that anything we develop um, will be reviewed in full partnership with plan teams, uh, SSC, Ecosystem Committee, and the Council before, before it's uh, published finally. Um, next slide. So this, this, this slide just highlights a little bit more what I just said. Uh, the ESR and the ESP, those two acronyms, they've been... Uh, always directed or uh, at annual tactical management decision, whereas the Bering Sea Health Report card, um, and as you noted with the SSC uh, report a little earlier today, uh, the exact name of that is another thing that's certainly open to discussion, uh, but it definitely links to strategic issues. It may link to strategic issues that you hear about later today with the Climate Change Task Force, uh, but can, it can be limited to other uh, climate forecasting. Uh, the work here is ongoing. Uh, this table down here was, is just an illustrated example, and I, and I have to apologize that the row heading, or sorry, the column headings uh, are not actually FEP objectives. They're a set of sub-objectives. I, I grabbed the wrong pivot table the other day. Um, but uh, so these are several sub-objectives relating to our FEP objectives on community condition, uh, on community composition, ecosystem, commu or sorry, biological community, not human community here. Um, but this is just an example of how we're trying to categorize indicators that we track in order to, to uh, and develop the science behind the, for the ones that are, um, some of the ones that are more theoretical uh, to then uh, propose uh, for inclusion in the report card. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, that, so that in a sense is our, our, our so that, in a sense, is the main FEP activity we've been engaged in for the last year. Uh, again, the, the other meat of the work has gone on in the separate task teams that you have or will be hearing reports on. Um, but I wanted to summarize the overall uh, Bering Sea work plan for the next year or so. Um, so here, uh, initially right now, um, we're presenting this to the uh, Ecosystem Committee and other council bodies, uh, the, this progress. Um, our plan is to meet in May 2021, um, a virtual meeting, um, a few-day workshop at that time, uh, similar to other plan teams. Um, at that point, we'll check in with the progress of task forces and have a work, initial, an initial workshop on the development of the health report card and uh, the range of initial indicators we might propose for that. Um, at that time, we expect we might brainstorm on other emerging issues. Um, but we wouldn't expect necessarily, um, unless directed or unless directed or requested otherwise, uh, to look at new major deliverables. In other words, we're not looking to immediately spin up a new set of task forces, given uh, given that these the task forces that have been going already are fairly young in their lifespan. 
Uh, from June to December 2021, um, of course, task teams will be working, task forces will be working in parallel to, to their own deliverables. But the main FEP team deliverable will be to uh, complete this draft report card process. And to be clear, uh, that window of time is meant to, to build in uh, review time, stakeholder feedback, uh, and other forms of an open public process. So it, it's meant to be a very back and forth process. And of course, if that um, takes longer, that's, that's fine. Uh, for February 2022, uh, we suggested that uh, a lot of this work might be reviewed in coordination with the Council Ecosystem Workshop that's currently being proposed. Um, and that point would be a, a, a good place to uh, review progress on the FEP team overall, uh, but also to get uh, input on uh, in that sort of broad workshop for, uh, forum on new action modules or other new activities that we might take up. Um, and then in March through May 2022, things that come out of the workshop uh, might have, uh, would affect what we took into the meeting that we might plan for May. Uh, 2022. So uh, that's a brief uh, outline of what we expect for the next year, year and a half. And I believe that's my last slide. Um, so before going over to the climate task force, this might be a good point to pause if there are questions. Ms. Kimball has a question. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I just I'm trying to get a grasp of what the report card really means. And I heard you say it would include some kind of long-term productivity issues. And I, when I hear report card, I think of a grade. And so I know you're still working on those indicators, but can you give the council, you know, kind of some sense of how this would work as a deliverable when we won't be seeing, you know, kind of a linear effect on all species, you know, climate change impacts a report card may, may be very positive for some species and very negative for others or positive for a fish species, but negative for marine mammals. And I just, maybe you could just help us understand a little bit more about how a report card would be used. Yeah, through the chair. Um, I, so, so actually that very question it was actually key to uh, deciding that we should develop a report card like this. We really, we mean this report card to not have things like just straight up temperature uh, that might be positive to some species and negative to other species. So those would, would still remain in the, uh, maybe the tactical realm of the, of the ESR each year. But these are meant to be ones that there is a general agreement on direction. Another, uh, as I said, the example of the fishery stock sustainability index where you say, well, we, we all know that we want fewer overfish stocks, so, so that has a directionality implied. Other ones like that might be the trophic level of the catch or length structure of the population, um, or sorry, not a population, but of the whole ecosystem, where if you look at that strategically and you say, well, well things, are go things are going in a poor direction, and again, you hope the science would be there, and, the, and again, through this iterative process, we would define yes, we, we think that moving in one direction on this is bad and the other direction on this is good, but that doesn't lead to anything resembling a, a, a reduction of a max ABC for a, a specific tactical stock, but that allows us to reflect on saying, well, our policies across the board, our, our cumulative policies are causing issues. Does that need to move into some kind of FMP, strategic FMP consideration? So uh, that would sort of be an Sort of an early warning on uh, these sorts of much more cumulative and ecosystem-wide effects, and and try to stay away from individual species where you say, well, it's good for some but bad for others. That's helpful. Thank you. I'm. I, I look forward to to further discussion on those indicators. Thanks. Right. And I. Don't see any further questions, so I think we're ready to move on with the staff presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. This is Diana Stram, council staff. Hopefully you can hear me okay. 
you're coming through well, Dr. Stram. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going, uh, Kirsten Holzman and myself will be providing the Climate Change Task Force uh, Work Plan Overview. We'll be tag teaming this presentation. I'll provide some introductory material, then turn it over to Dr. Holzman to go through some of the more technical details of our work plan. And then um, we'll wrap up at the end with some additional information from our, our, uh, our most recent task force meeting, as well as our future plans and uh, clarifications. I just want to point out while we're on the, the intro slide, this is the membership of our task force that we're all appointed um, at the end of 2019. And as I'll walk through in a few slides, we've had a couple of organizational meetings, but we're obviously with COVID a little bit lagged behind. Um, we do have a very diverse um, task force um, with membership from the Aleut community of St. Paul Island, um, NRC and Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation, which obviously is, is quite crab focused. Um, we have regional office staff as well as uh, marine mammal um, science center staff, science center staff, obviously, that are ecosystem modelers. Um, we've got membership from NGOs and Ocean Conservancy from Sea State, which you're well aware of with respect to groundfish um, uh, catch management, as well as um, a social anthropologists from Sandhill Culture Craft. So it's been a really diverse and um, really helpful work group. In terms of our work in 2020, oh, I'm sorry, before I move on, I just want to point out to you what's available on your council agenda. On your council agenda is the draft work plan that we're going through today, and I'll go through it in a little detail um, as to some of the revisions. Uh, minutes from our meeting that we had in um, December, this just past December, that's also posted to your agenda, and I'll walk through that on the next slide. Um, we also have posted a revised figure six. And again, this is something that Kirsten will be walking through in conjunction with our presentation, why that figure's been revised and the rationale for that. Just to provide you a little overview of what we have done thus far, we had a very brief spin-up meeting in January of last year. And you heard from us at that time with um, just a quick update on what our plans were for the overall work plan and how we were intending to develop it. We then had a three-day meeting in February, a virtual meeting um, as a working draft where we went through the initial development of the framework for this work plan and the proposed process that we are trying to develop that again, we'll walk through in just a few minutes. We had coming out of that meeting an initial very rough draft of the work plan that we were intending to turn around and then present to you at the March, April council meeting that obviously was canceled. Um, a couple days after our meeting and before we'd finalized our work plan, we provided an update to the FVP team at their March meeting. So that was just a, a brief PowerPoint update to them as we were still working on this very draft work plan at that time. Then with COVID, we were delayed in meeting again until um, with this draft work plan. So we were not able to present it to anybody and um, we refined our ideas and then had a three day meeting um, just after the council meeting in December. So that meeting um, as I'm showing here was uh, December 14th and 16th. And what we did was break it out into um, public sessions and then work group sessions with, with homework assigned to different task force members to come back um, in another day to report back on that. So the whole goal of this meeting, we did have some members of the public. I would note that we're going to try to advertise, I think, much better. And we do the normal FR notice, but I think we'll try to do a better job of making sure that the public's aware of our next meetings, because I think the LKTK subsistence task force, as you'll see in their meeting, has done an excellent job of um, reaching out to the public so they had much higher public attendance. Ours obviously given timing right after the council meeting. We, we did have some attendance, which was wonderful. Um, I think we'd like to have um, some broader representation as well as members of the public and other state and agency staff attending. Um, again, the goal of this work plan was to, the goal of our third meeting was to review where we've come from since February when things kind of got stalled out and then to finalize our draft work plan for review. So that's the work plan that's posted to your agenda. This is really the first airing of this draft work plan um, in, its, in its final shape right now. So we are recognizing it is still draft. We intend to um, provide additional revisions. We have the benefit of, and you'll get a report from the ecosystem committee. We had the benefit of review by the ecosystem committee two weeks ago. That was really helpful. And we have um, since modified the way we, that we are describing and presenting things in this PowerPoint and trying to make it very clear in presentation to the council. Uh, I think had we had the benefit of a review and that kind of public airing of this entire work plan prior, we might have been able to um, make those changes in the work plan itself. But to alleviate any 
confusion by revising the work plan for terminology purposes and reposting it during the council meeting. We're just providing those revisions in this PowerPoint presentation to you. And then with the intention to go back and make those modifications with the council's concurrence um, coming out of this meeting. So just to step through some of the overarching aspects, this is the, the goal of the climate change module is to facilitate the council's work towards climate ready fisheries management that helps ensure both short and long-term resilience for the Bering Sea. We want to stress uh, that this, the key to this is that this entire aspect is action informing and not policy prescriptive. We've tried to make that clear throughout the work plan. Um, again, we will work to revise the work plan um, to ensure that it's clear that that is the intention of this. I will also note, and we'll walk through in presentation, that um, as we, as you've heard from the FEP team, we have not met directly with the FEP team, nor have they had a chance to review our work plan. And so some of the terminologies for the exact same documentation and intentions have different terms coming out of our work plan and coming out of theirs. And to the extent possible, um, we'll try to explain which those are, but their ecosystem health report and our climate briefing, our climate report, those are intended to be the same document. So it's more of a naming thing and the fact that it highlights where we really need to coordinate more, um, which we all intend to do moving forward. So the key to our entire work plan is that we're seeking to use existing on-ramps to deliver climate information to the council process. We're not trying to create new on-ramps we are trying to use the existing ones and augment that with, with climate information. We understand that this will be an iterative process that will be refined over time with input and feedback. And so the, the scope of the work and the timing of the work is intended to be iterative so that we have a chance to keep um, improving upon both the process we're proposing as well as the products we're, we're trying to feed into so that at the end of the task force lifespan, we have the best process and product to put forward to the council to meet your goals of this task force. And so what we're proposing then is an inclusive approach to provide the council process with the best available information on climate impacts and effective adaptation actions to reduce impacts. And that's providing information from all knowledge sources as we will walk through when we get into the work plan itself. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Holzman now to walk through some background and then the details of the work plan. And then I'll come back at the end of the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. So, sorry here, let me get the presentation going. So the, the impetus for this work, of course, is uh, facilitating a way to get the abundant information that exists uh, surrounding climate change impacts and adaptation uh, measures, uh, and both uh, scientific-based local knowledge, A wide suite of information to the council in a systematic process. And the reasoning for this, of course, is uh, um, very clear, I'm sure, to the council. The recent anomalous events that we've been experiencing in the North Pacific, which are shown here in the plot on the upper left, so this is uh, sea surface temperature anomalies from uh, last fall. Warm colors indicate warmer than normal. Uh, relative and normal being the average of 1980 through 2010 sea surface temperatures. White is neutral and blue is, is cooler than normal. And these sorts of warm uh, conditions, anomalously warm sea surface temperatures that we've seen in our region have persisted for multiple years. Uh, many of those, like the blob, have recently been attributed to climate change. And if you look at uh, the lower right here, this is um, sea surface temperatures for the entire globe for September over time, starting in 1880 through uh, present, uh, uh, just this last uh, fall. So as you can see, there's been a trend in increasing uh, temperatures. Of course, these sea surface temperatures are indicative of larger scale ecosystem changes that are associated with, uh, with climate driven uh, changes, both to the circulation, the temperature and the chemistry of, of our uh, marine environments. And looking forward, we anticipate that some degree of continued change will, will occur, especially in the North Pacific. So this is now forward looking uh, to 2030 through 2060. Again, sea surface temperature anomalies here, warm is warmer than, than average and uh, blue is cooler than average. And then as we kind of step forward in time, and these are projections uh, from the latest uh, coupled model intercomparison project 
And as we step forward in time to the end of the century, we see in some scenarios uh, some significant warming. The degree of warming, the degree of ecosystem changes that may be accompanying that uh, is, is at the end of the century is up to, um, uh, is, is a little uncertain and it's due, it's due to global uh, uh, scenarios of how we address carbon, atmospheric carbon in general. And so the goal of the Climate Change Task Force is to, to help build a process that will allow for decision making in this uh, relative uncertainty going forward and in particular help sustain marine ecosystems and fisheries and fishing communities in the North Pacific. And one of the things that has emerged from uh, recent evaluations of ways in which management can help support adaptation is that uh, management uh, has a fairly large lever to pull in terms of adaptation. So climate may cause impacts, but some of those impacts can be attenuated through, through management and uh, climate smart planning. And so these are two examples. And the, the takeaway from these two analyses is to build a climate informed process and to, to mainstream climate information through each level of the, the management um, scales and, and policies. So all throughout um, the management and the advice, both that's um, used to, to uh, make tactical and strategic uh, decisions be climate informed. And there is a, a quite a bit of information that can inform those. And so the, the key is to provide a inclusive process for getting that information into the council process. And this can include things like climate informed spatial management, uh, at the sort of intermediate temporal scale, next generation climate enhanced stock assessments, for example, that are being developed. And at the short term scale, uh, measures like uh, now casting and forecasting maps of bycatch risk or uh, key areas, hotspots of high uh, fish productivity or growth, these uh, or conversely areas where fish may be experiencing carrying capacity restrictions, these sorts of information, the sort of now cast information can enable agency uh, within uh, fishers and, and stakeholders within the system can help promote adaptation in real time. And then at the, at the further level is, is that's um, streamlined and synthesized uh, in concert with some of the longer term management measures to make sure that those are synergistic. So one of the things uh, before we step into the technical details of the proposed work plan is that there is some terminology in the work plan. It is, it is technical and there is uh, in particular some terminology we want to take a minute to define because it's important to how the work plan approaches evaluating um, or synthesizing, I should say, not evaluating, but bringing in information and, and the sort of net it will be casting to gather information. Um, and this is a, a somewhat jargony term, and so I just want to take a minute to define it. It's a term called social ecological system. It's a term that's been around since the 80s, um, but is, is really garnered support because it embodies a, con a conceptual framework for the system that is extremely useful when consider climate impacts and how they may propagate through the system and, and how adaptation may propagate through a system as well. And so the idea is that there is, of course, a natural system, and then there is this uh, social system or human system. And uh, rather than thinking of them as two uh, realms that are, are somewhat divided and then maybe linked through a couple of connections, the idea of a social ecological system is that those two systems are uh, tightly coupled. They're, uh, they're uh, tightly coupled through dynamics, and so a change in a biological uh, part of the system may propagate through the biology, of course, but it may also propagate through the social system. Similarly, a change in, in things that happen within the social system may propagate throughout the social system and influence uh, the biological system. And the reason it's important to consider this is that as uh, climate um, change is brought into the evaluations for how things may have um, cascading impacts, it's important to consider the social implications, the uh, economic and social implications of that, not as a end result, but as a dynamic component to the system. And that's a core concept of the Climate Change Task Force. 
Uh, the other reason why this is important is that the concepts of adaptation and resilience, which are, are uh, sort of central to climate change impacts and adaptation um, information, uh, those are different. Uh, they're related and there are similarities, but they're different for the two realms. So they're different. Adaptation in the biological sense uh, is different than how we might think about adaptation on the social side. And similarly, resilience in the biology may be related, but it's different um, than resilience in this, the human uh, social system. And so part of the Climate Change Task Force initial efforts is to help develop uh, definitions, working definitions that are specific for the Bering Sea uh, ecosystem, social ecological system that reflect these concepts of resilience and adaptation. And those are included as appendices, uh, draft appendices to the work plan. But the idea is that these will be uh, living documents uh, that can be updated and reflect the current conceptualization of the system. The other thing we wanted to take a minute to do was talk a little bit about some example fishery climate adaptation tools. Uh, this is mentioned in the work plan and uh, the goal of the work plan, will, one of the products of the work plan will be to develop a table that lists a number of these tools, how they might map to different drivers and how they might be applied or their potential utility uh, to uh, informing management. All of that will, of course, be taken up by the council process, but the goal here is to, uh, to synthesize and bring that together and collate the potential tools to build the toolbox for climate-informed management. And so some examples of this um, are provided here. The one on the, if we start on the far left, these would be examples of some of those near real-time um, dynamic management tools that can enable um, uh, efficiency even when you have somewhat unpredictable, increasingly unpredictable ocean conditions. Um, this, is, this is really designed to help uh, fishers um, and, and people uh, out in the system react in real time in a way that's uh, most efficient. And this is an example from a, a recent project along the California Current that is producing near real time maps of uh, bycatch risk that help fishers avoid uh, entanglement and uh, bycatch um, risk. And so they can use these maps to help uh, navigate uh, the changing ocean conditions. That's a tool that can be supported through some of the products that are being developed right now uh, and, and uh, being rolled out. And so these capabilities exist uh, for, the, for the Bering Sea and, and will continue to be building uh, going forward. In the intermediates, uh, here's an example of some climate enhanced stock assessment models. These are being evaluated for skill and performance, um, including uh, bringing in uh, information about temperature, for example, to help predict fish condition or growth, or information about the ecosystem and carrying capacity to help predict uh, recruitment and distribution. And so those uh, uh, indices and models are being developed and providing a way for them to be reviewed systematically uh, is one of the goals. So these would come in through the, the council review process. And then finally on the far right are uh, longer term strategic um, approaches. And these include things like uh, uh, reevaluating some of the uh, larger cross-sectoral interactions, shipping, for example, or, um, or uh, other developments and, and uses of the system across sectors where fisheries is a, a big part of that and understanding uh, how climate change may um, uh, bring new opportunities or may bring new challenges that require perhaps a couple of, uh, a, a decade or so of lead time to evaluate and work through. And there's a lot of work being done on uh, sort of climate smart blue economy initiatives. Okay, so now with those examples, let's we'll take a minute to step through the, the work plan. And uh, one of the the primary things we want to really emphasize is that this module as part of the FEP will support the council's capacity to more effectively incorporate climate change information from various sources in the decision-making process. The module will also support the council's capacity to evaluate and implement management measures that can help preserve 
livelihoods, economies, and health. We are not proposing a new council process, and the Climate Change Task Force itself will not be doing those evaluations. Um, part of the task force could be help to help organize uh, meetings or workshops uh, in consultation with the SSC, the AP, the Ecosystem Committee, and the public, but the, the task force itself is not initiating those. That would be through the council process as part of um, as part of the eventual uptake in the FEP. Uh, the end goal of this, again, is to operationalize the delivery of climate change information to the council. So there's really a three-step process proposed. They are listed as objectives in the work plan, and some of the feedback we got early on um, in the ecosystem uh, committee presentations was that, uh, that maybe the term objective is a bit uh, confusing, and, and really these are steps, and so they build on, on each other. The first step is to collate the information Holtz. to help. Uh, yes. Dr. Holtzman, sorry, I hate to interrupt. Um, no, that's fine. Uh, but I think Ms. Kimball has a question at this point, and um, so I'd like to, rather than waiting to get all the way through this, because this is a, there's a lot here, I think it'd be useful to have Ms. Kimball's question at this point. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Holzman, on that. Uh, and yes, it's a, it's a long um, PowerPoint, so I was just afraid I would lose it. Um, but on your previous slide, uh, this is, I think, come up uh, with questions from the public, questions from council members, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how this module will support the council's capacity under number two. I think I think there might just be some you know, communication difficulty or, or maybe my own in reading the work plan on understanding what would come in front of the council to help us change, modify, or evaluate our actual management measures through our FMP process. Or, or maybe you're not even talking about that. But I think, I think the number two is a little bit confusing without a little bit more explanation. If you could give that a try. Thanks. Through the chair. Yes, yeah, thank you. And um, hopefully by the end of the presentation it'll be clear, but if not, please raise this uh, again and we, we can discuss it. The goal of this is to um, bring, so to, to collate the information that's out there and, and, if you will, to help organize it uh, and drive it towards the respective council processes. So if it is a climate-informed stock assessment model, that would be going through the, the um, plan team review of stock assessment models. It would be then going to the SSC and the AP and the council process. If it was a, uh, and, and allocations and things like that would all go through that process. Um, it's just to help take this information that may be coming um, through opportunities to the council and, and make it more standardized, make it more regular, and make that process very clear so that if somebody has information to inform that process, they know where to go and where to present it and how to get that information to the council quickly. Eventually, it'll probably get there, uh, but under climate, uh, these uh, increasingly anomalous conditions that we've been experiencing, having that information flow quickly and clearly to the council is really important. So that's the main goal. So there's there's two pieces that we wanted to target that the council would be doing um, that we would target with this process, and that is uh, this, uh, these one and two here. But the, the two in particular, which is to reiterate for those listening, evaluate and implement management measures. So the council would be doing this. Um, but those management measures preserve livelihoods, economies, health, and well-being. There is an iterative process. Uh, for information and feedback that, that needs to be supported and making sure that there's a clear way for the various voices that are part of that iterative process to be included is, is one of the goals of the task force. And we have a five-year horizon to build this process, and the, the goal is to use as much feedback during the development of this process building, uh, if you will, um, to have feedback so that this process is effective for all the stakeholders in the Bering Sea and, and for the council to make the most informed decisions. And uh, hopefully this revi the, the slight revisions to figure six 
that I'm going to step through next will help clarify this. So please, again, um, raise the question if it's still not clear uh, at, after that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll do that. I'll listen to the rest of the presentation and, and maybe think if there are any possible uh, true examples uh, you could provide throughout. That'd be helpful. But thank you for the response. Okay, so I think we were here. Um, so the three steps that are proposed, the first is to collate information. So this is coordinating the review of existing and emergent climate information on impacts, adaptation, and residual risk. And we'll talk in a moment about how we plan to do that. Uh, step two is assess key climate change impacts, adaptations, and residual risk. So this is really synthesizing that information and organizing it into um, uh, bits of uh, information that may be helpful for the council. And we'll talk again in a moment about how we envision that may take place, but that again will be iterative as we do it over the next couple of years. And then finally, the third step, and this is really the heart of the work plan, is to communicate that synthesis and breadth of information to the council. And uh, that has three uh, on-ramps we envision and uh, we can discuss the details of that, um, those on-ramps in more uh, detail if you like. Uh, the, the basic uh, premise here, I think you've heard me say it a, a number of times, is there's a lot of information out there. It's uh, increasing exponentially in terms of, of impacts of climate change on various components of the Bering Sea, but also in terms of adaptation actions, things that could be used to help minimize those impacts and reduce uh, reduce their impacts on uh, the, the Bering Sea system and fisheries. And the goal of the task force is to take all of that information and uh, collate it and bring it to the council through these three on-ramps. And the first one is stock assessments, the second uh, is ecosystem status reports, and the third is the FEP report or the FEP report cards that you heard in the previous presentation. These on-ramps already exist, uh, so we are really trying to coordinate and plug into existing processes. We're not trying to generate new documents as much as possible. We want to mainstream climate information through existing deliveries of ecosystem-based management advice to the council. So. There was a figure six in the technical work plan that was intended to reflect our vision of this process. Excellent feedback on the figure revealed that it uh, had arrows that didn't quite capture what we were envisioning for the process. And so we have taken that feedback into consideration and we'll show you the revised figure. We have provided that as, a, um, as an attachment, but we have not altered the original work plan at this point when we will do that uh, following feedback from uh, the Council, the EP, the SSC, and the Ecosystem Committee. So this is now the revised figure, and it's uh, complex. And so what I want to do is take a minute to step through it piece by piece, um, but it is helpful to have it in one place, at least for the task force, so we can keep track of where uh, the products are that, that we're um, aiming for. So this is the current council process, and we'll just zoom in on the first part of this. Um, and this is structured around the ground fish process. Uh, we also envision doing a similar exercise with the, the crab um, uh, uh, planting process, and we just have not provided that here. We're going to go through using the ground fish uh, assessment process. So in the spring, uh, there are a series of workshops. This is a good time to review information about the ecosystem prior to some of our surveys that take place to get information about how fisheries are performing. And that information is reviewed currently as part of a, a couple of uh, workshops that take place. It's synthesized. And the idea is to really to get a, a heads up on the system before the fall assessment uh, crunch. And that, so there's uh, red flags may be identified during this time, indicators that maybe should be considered in uh, the stock assessments or maybe need uh, more information, so could inform surveys, those things are highlighted during this time. And we uh, envision plugging into this process. Right now, a lot of this information is, is um, focused on the near-term advice, as it, as it should be for the stock assessments. And there is a broader set of information about longer-term 
management strategy evaluations, performance of, of uh, different models and harvest control rules, for example, uh, longer-term projections for the conditions in the Bering Sea, and, and different adaptation tools. These, these um, bits of information right now don't have a, a uh, clear flow, and so we would, plug, we would uh, hold a climate briefing um, meeting along with these spring meetings. It would be open to, uh, to, to really get as much information as we can from local knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge, and science. Uh, and bring that into uh, in a similar process into um, informing the surveys, model updates, risk table evaluations, et cetera, that take place currently uh, in the summer. That information would then feed into, as it does now, the ground fish stock assessment process the, uh, that is reviewed by the plan team in September um, and, and then again in uh, November. And so similarly, that information was reviewed by the plan teams during that time and passed them through the council process, the SSE and AP, uh, AP and council. And so again, here we plan to coordinate the information that is collected in the spring and, and summer and through additional workshops as needed, um, that that information would be, if it's near-term advice or it's context for near-term advice, that would be fed into these initial um, on ramps. So that includes uh, climate enhanced models, any climate information that may be relevant for the risk table analyses, uh, climate indices, and, and um, uh, uh, components for the, the ESPs. And that information is collected in the safe individual chapters of the safe report for stocks. If it's ecosystem wide and, and looks at uh, um, maybe lag from the system, uh, for example, if there was uh, new information, like there has been, that marine heat waves, for example, are have now been attributed to climate anthropogenic climate change, that helps provide a context that marine heat waves may be occurring in the future, and the information in the ecosystem status report that talks about the uh, implications of marine heat waves across the ecosystem that now has a longer term context. So it would be just plugging in um, the context and the information to help provide um, longer term context for the near term advice. And those are near term tactical and strategic advice, all reviewed through the council process. The, the next piece is uh, the FEP on ramp three. So this is the longer term ecosystem advice, the, the uh, report card that you heard um, discussed previously, which includes things like the conceptual models for the system, the indicators, all of the products that are part of the FEP that have a both near and longer term um, perspective. Here we would collate the climate information, especially around adaptation uh, options and performance, uh, um, co-benefits uh, and, and other um, uh, potential opportunities or implications or potential uh, uh, conflicts that might arise due to climate change. And there's quite a bit of information on this. It gives a heads up to the council. We, this, is, this is quite a bit of information. So the synthesis of this, which includes filling out that table of potential tool impacts, tools, and adaptation measures and sort of a risk assessment framework, that, but all of that information would be done uh, systematically and regularly, but it would probably be outside of the annual process, maybe every other year or every three years. And that's one of the things that we need to, to get some feedback on as we start to develop this. And this is, again, the strategic and longer term advice. It's related to the near term advice, but it's a bit longer term. So that's the, that's the uh, general approach that we're proposing. And um, again, this is the communication step of that approach. The this last synthesis report step, this on ramp three, um, would include a review of the recent information. It may be uh, also pulling from national and international strategic documents uh, that, that identify the Bering Sea fisheries and impacts and, and potential implications. So all of that would be collated and summarized there. Um, it also would include those updated and living uh, up-to-date versions of the adaptation uh, considerations and briefing notes, the resilience uh, briefing note. And uh, we had a couple of proposed 
um, appendices, which uh, um, Diana will talk a little bit about. Um, but those uh, right now, we're going to we just uh, cross them out here because we need to figure out the technical aspects of that. Um, but we may include summaries and things like that as well. Um, the key of this report is that it would also help um, provide a, it would be developed in coordination with LK, TK's assistance task force and the Variancy FEP plan team. And of course, um, uh, with public input and feedback and, uh, and uh, feedback regularly with the SSC, the AP, uh, the ecosystem committee and the council is needed. And the, these uh, last steps um, are something that we will be asking for some feedback on. And so with that, I think, um, oh yeah, and we just to, to mention when we uh, presented this previously, one of the things that we have heard is that a, a regular check-in every six months during this initial five-year spin-up uh, is desired. And so that is what we're targeting presently. Thank you. Okay. Um, just to follow up then, a couple of other aspects of our um, our last meeting as well as, as as Kirsten touched on some of the appendices. So starting with that, um, you'll see there's an appendix to the work plan. This is really uh, still a work in progress. Um, we kind of drafted a climate briefing form where we were looking at a Google form that we could um, circulate to folks prior to a workshop. Um, a diverse group of knowledge holders, including scientists, fishermen, local and traditional subsistence. We were really trying to get a real broad net reach um, to pull in different issues that we could then synthesize and um, discuss at the workshops that we were proposing uh, for the spring. We haven't gotten very far with that. We're still working out the process and the utility of that. So that was just a draft um, cut at it, and that's why it's just an appendix to the work plan as opposed to being an, an action item in the work plan itself. Additionally, in our minutes are, is some discussion of case studies. Um, we started to draft what some criteria for case studies would be. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about the LKTKS task force on their Norton Sound um, consideration of that as a case study. Um, we also provided some examples of case studies. But what we ended up doing, at least for the time being, is um, kind of table the case studies and instead include them, the table that Kirsten referenced, with respect to um, an output of our work plan. So not something that's included in our work plan, but something that we thought would be a useful long-term um, outcome would be this table that we've started to work on summarizing the drivers, the impacts, potential responses, resiliency targets, data gaps and needs. And then that's where we thought um, case studies would best fit within this context in terms of um, walking from, from left to right to summarizing these things um, identifying potential management responses, identifying what might be a case study that would relate to that. We may or may not be pursuing those case studies, but we would be identifying them for future consideration in the same way um, as MSEs that we would be summarizing or suggesting as a potential um, research priority moving forward. Uh, we also were looking for um, some feedback on, I think I have it in the next uh, we noted in our meeting that we we intend to meet again as soon as possible following this council meeting once we've received direction uh, from the council and the advisory bodies, including the ecosystem committee, on how best to uh, redraft and revise our work plan to meet the intent and to clarify some of these things that were a little bit um, confusing in terms of terminology and uh, work product. And so as part of that, we're also coordinating more closely with the chairs of the FEP team and the LKTKS uh, task force. So uh, tentatively, we would be having a meeting um, possibly in, in late March. And the overall goal of that meeting would be to have this revised work plan that's primarily not changing our, our process and ideas, but revising it for clarification and for coordination with um, naming conventions and work products from the FEP team as well. And then the point of the next meeting would be to then take that, that revised work plan and structure out how our timeline looks in terms of making working that process through and beginning this iterative process and putting all of the pieces together. So we're waiting for concurrence on our direction and our work plan, and then we will be planning that next meeting. And following that, we'll have a much clearer idea of the timeline for um, how we're meeting this. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll pause now. It looks like Ms. Kimball had, Kimball had a question. Thank you, Dr. Stram. Ms. Campbell. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Diana. I am I'm really trying to um, ensure that I understand what I guess I would call um, on ramp three. And if if I look at um, some of the materials in the work plan, it it really talks about recommendations coming out of the climate change task force for short, medium, and long-term actions that could be considered and initiated through the council process. And if I go back um, to the, the complex graphic in this presentation, it shows this new on-ramp um, for those types of recommendations. And so I want to make sure that I'm understanding that what's being proposed here is a new entree into the council process for recommendations for council action that come directly from the climate change task force. Is that is that understanding correct? Is that what's being proposed? Uh, through the chair. Um, and Diana, please jump in if, if you'd like. Um, the, the, the goal of the on-ramp three is to provide a tool that organizes uh, if there is information that one potential management action or tool performs better than another, a recommendation that that is a higher performing tool. If that information doesn't exist, then they would be provided equally. The goal is to have that table, that resource of potential actions that could be taken uh, and or technological advancements that are needed this, the sort of uh, foundation for responding to climate in a systematic way. And through the chair, if I could just follow up on that, and I I was listening to the uh, question and answers with the, the SSC chair earlier today, and um, I think that there was some misunderstanding from the SSC, uh, similar the the discussion that you had with those explicit examples, those examples are not present in our work plan, nor are any of our intention, nor is working in a vacuum. Um, that's why we were proposing this process that we're working through existing on ramps and providing, um, and we we're providing overall recommendations to the council that would be embodied in these reports that would be synthesizing existing work and looking at the context in, in which it would be beneficial to the council to, to look at a range of, of different adaptation um, measures moving forward. But in, in no way whatsoever were we thinking that we would be coming back to you as a council with an explicit list of recommendations as to those kind of um, driving management measures that you consider uh, on an annual basis within your own specifications process. It's just um, we would be providing some overarching guidance as to which directions are, are preferable under different climate scenarios. I don't know if Kirsten wants to follow up on that or not. I, I think that was an excellent summary. And if I might, Mr. Chair, Diana, I think it, I was, um, thank you for that. And I was looking through the work plan and, and the appendices and I, is there a draft of this table somewhere yet, or is that still under construction? I'm trying to get a feel for, I understand, I think, pretty well the need to synthesize this information and um, bring it into our stock assessment process and, and um, have been very appreciative of the ecosystem status reports that we've been getting that are supposed to be, you know, the early indicators, things that we may need to be considering. I'm having... Um, a little more trouble envisioning how it might fit into our process outside the stock assessment process. Some of the things that, you know, that we've been talking about here, these potential responses, um, how the, the the research needs might fit into our existing process for prioritizing research. And, and it occurred to me that if there was a draft for more of the table, maybe it would help me wrap my mind around it. Thank you. Um, through the chair, Ms. Campbell. We have a draft of that table that we started to do at our our meeting in December, and our new, initial intention was to embed that in the work plan. But because it is such a, a first cut at it, um, we really weren't comfortable going forward with it because it becomes a little bit of a lightning rod. And I think what we need to do is further develop it 
and um, at, at our next meeting to provide a, a better example, especially once we're trying to take case studies and recommendations and just trying to carry them forward in a logical manner, just off the cuff, it just seemed like that might be a little bit premature. Um, I'm going to turn to, to Kirsten because um, she might be able to provide you an example of kind of what one line of that table might look like. Yeah, thank you through the chair. So we have, uh, right now we have a good way to review uh, near-term tactical advice and, and bring climate information in. And it already does flow in there. Um, and so this would be making that systematic for the on-ramp one and two. But on-ramp three is um, something that can provide a, a decadal or even two decadal um, uh, landscape of, of how the system is unfolding. And the way that we can do this in a quantitative manner would be something like is taking place right now as part of an integrated project at the Alaska Center uh, where we're evaluating the performance of things like the existing uh, ecosystem-based fisheries management approach and how does it perform uh, if the world gets very warm and how does it perform if the world continues to look like it has in the past and does the do things like the two million ton cap continue to uh, provide the same uh, role and function in the system going forward right now that inf and and we have some results on that um, that show that the ecosystem based approach uh, does impart stability and and does um, uh, forestall declines and, and that, you know, till well after mid-century. And so there is a uh, clear benefit to keeping those tools in the toolbox. But right now, it's, it's, there's not a clear way to bring that information in a systematic way to the council. And so the proposal here would be that the task force could take some of that new information and provide that, um, summarize that, and, and point uh, the council and the people owning that information, put them together so that that information can be reviewed and discussed and, and evaluated through the council process. So I, I hope that's a helpful example. Thank you for that. Thank you both for the clarity. Um, I, I understand why you don't have a draft of the table yet. That makes sense to me. I, did want, I just want to make sure I wasn't missing it somewhere in, in my materials. So thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Following this this line of discussion, it is is the product from. I don't even know if I'm using on ramp right because I that's a new term for me. But the product from on ramp three is this uh, biannual report on climate change and fisheries. I, I'm trying to understand whether this is a new process or just we have such a public process now. If this is just very a lot of clarity around providing some of these long-term trends in, in climate and ecosystem into our existing process or we're creating a new process and whether I should really be more focused on the fact that this would be a report in our existing process. I, I was listening carefully to your responses uh, to Campbell, but I guess I need another try at that. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Kimball, the one new on-ramp, as you, if you will, or product is in conjunction with the FEP's proposed report. In their report, they called it an ecosystem health report card. We referred to it as an FEP report. We were intending that on whatever periodicity their report is intended to be provided to the council, we would work with them to augment that report for this climate information and um, overarching sort of uh, synthesis of, of recommendations, not that we're coming up with them per se, but we are synthesizing existing information to provide that information to augment what they're already intending to produce as that report. Understand that we need to work more closely with the FEP team to understand so that we fit in with them. But that is that our intention is to be a part of whatever that report ends up being. Um, and on the whatever periodicity makes the most sense for climate information, which may be different from the periodicity that they um, propose in their report. And then we're still kind of trying to work out the, 
those details um, with the FEP team. And I'll, I'll look to Kirsten if she wants to augment that. Through the chair, I just want to clarify, uh, that was great, thank you, Dana. Um, On-ramp three does exist, but it is new through the FEP process. And so we are, we are tying into that um, on-ramps are the way in which information is provided to the council. And so that is a um, proposed route through the FEP and we are trying to tie into that, not to create a new, a new one if that helps. Thanks. And then I just didn't catch the response to Ms. Campbell's question about whether should we primarily be thinking about this information as, as influential or helpful in our specifications process or, or are there pieces of this, this potential response that you mentioned in the slide that's on the screen now that would be for other fishery management actions? And if there's any examples of that, um, that would be helpful. Is it like, um, you know, we should be moving away from using fixed areas or is it very specific or just any other examples to help me think outside the realm of the specification process? or some clarification if we really should be thinking of this primarily for first steps in the specification. Yeah, through the chair, thank you. Um, the, the challenge here is that there is very little that will take place that won't need some climate context. And so the goal of this task force is to, to plug into those different levels. And the specification process, um, uh, for example, that that may there may be some information that is helpful like uh, climate projections that at a certain thermal threshold fish will move northward for example that that's useful information to have beforehand uh, to know if the surveys need to be uh, initiated to the north or um, if there needs to be some consideration of the area in which the biomass is considered and so the the goal is to rather than be in a reactionary space with some of those decisions and trying to assess real time is to provide a bit of foresight through the existing information if, if there is some mm -hmm. uh, that can be useful. And so uh, that's, the, that's the challenge that we're faced with and we do want to make sure we do it in an iterative and effective process of, of directing that information to the right places and, and so that it, when we step, when the task force steps away in five years, that the process that's set up will allow for a systematic flow of climate information and importantly, adaptation measures that can be effective, um, that, that, that that information is clear and available. Right now it's out there, but it's, it's very hard uh, to know where to gather it. Thanks. I think the adaptation measures to be effective is where I'm, I'm really looking for, for example, but it, this is evolving work and I understand, I understand that as well. So thanks for those responses. Doctors, uh, Stram and, and Holtman, just thinking about when a, a natural break point for lunch would be, are you planning on covering um, the appendices? Uh, past the slide, or, or was this the last one you were going to cover? Mr. Chairman, um, no, this is our last slide that we were going to cover. Um, the information right. on the appendices uh, is there just for um, for interest. Uh, so in terms of, we were looking for council concurrence on the, the general direction of the work plan. Again, not specifically all of the wording, but generally our, our process that we're intending to be iterative, but the overarching process that we're trying to put into place with our existing on-ramps and how we would be fitting in um, the general overall steps that we've um, outlined and activities in the direction, as well as the proposed lifespan of the Climate Change Task Force. The plan was um, initially drawn out to be for five years. Um, the FEP originally estimated it to be five to seven years um, in our discussions with the SSC. Obviously, um, some of these things take time, and we've lost um, we've lost one year essentially due to COVID. But I think we're making a lot of progress now, and we can continue to to step through this work plan. I think that um, to help alleviate some of the, the the questions and confusion that 
I think the next time that we're able to um, provide information, whether it's through the, just the ecosystem committee or directly to the council, I think we'll be able to provide you more of a, a direction and a timeline as well as the examples of the output. I, I think that had we been able to really work on the table one, that would have provided you what we see as, um, as an outcome. I think it'll also give us a chance um, the next time that you hear from us to um, be more aligned with the FEP team. And as Kirsten had indicated, while you haven't seen their on-ramp three yet, it is part of their work plan. And so we're just working within what will already be done by the FEP team. And so we'll, we will be more closely coordinating with them as well as the direction that the LKTK Subsistence Task Force will be going. The appendices then are just for your, your interest um, in terms of, as uh, Dr. Holtzman noted, living documents of um, how to define adaptation and resilience, as well as our draft climate briefing form that we're still working on. The intention was for the table one to be another appendix and for the reasons that we, we outlined and so as not to um, add confusion based on just a, a quick cut at how we would be doing this. We didn't want to um, do that quite yet, and we wanted to just get through uh, getting some feedback on the work plan, and then we would be coming back to you um, with more specifics on in terms of our timing, our meetings, and um, perhaps a draft to um, show you what we mean in terms of that long-term um, recommendation. Mr. Chairman, that would conclude our report, but we're happy to answer additional questions. Dr. Stram and Dr. Holton. Additional questions from council members? I don't see any popping up here. So let's go ahead and take a lunch break for the day. Uh, let's come back at 12.50 Alaska time.
Council, please come back to order. Um, good afternoon, everybody. We are about ready to start back up with the, the last of our uh, presentations here on the uh, LKTK Business Task Force update. And then, of course, we have a uh, uh, ecosystem committee report uh, update from Mr. McLean as well. Maybe before we jump into the presentation, uh, we could um, I, I talked briefly with um, Mr. Witherell about the, the balance of the, the schedule, and it, and it appears possible um, that uh, we could potentially wrap up with the, uh, the staff tasking later on this afternoon um, if council members are are willing to potentially work uh, a little a little past their our, uh, four o'clock Alaska time cutoff. So that's something that I would be uh, interested in, in doing and intending to, to do so long as it didn't uh, conflict with, with uh, any council members need to uh, to wrap things up and, and Mr. Witherell, I don't know if you had any further considerations on the on the matter, but I think that is certainly a possibility. That is certainly a possibility. Okay. Um, all right, well, um, with that, um, Again, I just want to make sure council members and the public were aware that that was a possibility. Um, with that, we can go on to uh, the, the LKTK task force update. Uh, Dr. Kate Hoppel will be giving us the, the report, and Dr. Sarah Wise is available for questions. Dr. Hoppel. Thank you. Uh, for the record, this is Kate Hoppel with council staff. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the Local Knowledge, Traditional Knowledge, and Subsistence Task Force, along with Dr. Sarah Wise, who's with the Alaska Fishery Science Center. Um, I will be giving the presentation today for the council, uh, but like the chairman had mentioned, uh, Dr. Sarah Wise will also be available for questions. This presentation will be giving a high-level overview of the work that has been completed by the task force in 2020, as well as some of our next steps for 2021. The major theme for the presentation today is to show how we are moving forward in relation to our tasking from the council at the January 2020 meeting. A reminder that there are several attachments to the e-agenda for the council related to this task force. Uh, specifically, there's the presentation, the report from our most recent November meeting, as well as our work plan. And today I will just remind the council for this task force under the D3 agenda item, the action for the council is to review our recent progress, provide any feedback and make any recommendations as necessary. So I'd ask you to please recall the last time the local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence task force provided an update to the council was at the January 2020 meeting. At this meeting, the co-chairs presented on the outcomes of the first meeting in January 2020. And at that meeting, the, the task force developed two overarching goals as well as six potential objectives based on the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan document. And we also established the internal ground rules for completing our work. The council took action to approve two goals for the task force's work, and they're shown here. And the goals are for the task force to create processes and protocols through which the council can identify, analyze, and consistently incorporate or include local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence information into its process. At that January 2020 meeting, the council also took action to approve five of the task force's proposed objectives. And these objectives are linked to the two overarching goals, and they are oriented towards creating useful processes and protocols, as well as products that will help staff, agency partners, and the council, as well as its advisory bodies, again, identify, analyze, and include local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence into the current decision-making process. In its first year, the task force had three meetings, two of which were conducted virtually. And despite the challenges of the global pandemic, this group was able to be productive in a virtual setting. And our meetings have had a high level of participation from both members and the public. This has created an opportunity for valuable public comment and input on our work throughout the duration of the year. On the right-hand side of the slide is the task force's membership and uh, 
I would just remind the council that this nominated body is comprised of both indigenous and non-indigenous issue experts. In 2020, we were able to finalize the work plan, which was updated with the council's goals and objectives after that January 2020 meeting. Uh, we've also made progress on completing the glossary of terms as requested by the council. The glossary of terms is a very short document uh, defining key concepts like local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence, and it's intended to guide our work as we move forward. It may also prove to be a valuable resource at the conclusion of our work, uh, helping end users of our products to ensure consistency when terminology is being used. And both documents are available under the task forces page on the council's website. The task force has also continued to make some progress on other work that I will highlight uh, next in the presentation, including identifying on-ramps for LKTKS information, critical development and other work for processes for identifying and soliciting LKTKS information. The council's February 2020 motion directed the task force to identify potential on-ramps or points of entry into the council's process for LKTKS information. And at our second meeting in April of 2020, the task force reviewed a preliminary document that was looking at and flushing out different on-ramp options and we weighed the pros and cons of each potential one. And these are four preliminary recommendations and they represent the options the task force came to a consensus to on potentially being the most meaningful for informing council decision-making over the long term. And these four are a starting point and the co-chairs anticipate additional on-ramps being added over the course of our work. But broadly, these four preliminary recommendations are aiming to contribute to the collection and streamlining of LKTKS information into the council's existing process. And so this graphic here is really meant to provide a simple visualization of some of the rationale for these preliminary on-ramp recommendations. Under the fishery ecosystem plan, uh, the LKTK and subsistence action module was created to develop these protocols for identifying, analyzing, and including local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence to support the council in ecosystem-based fisheries management and to help the council better meet national standards two and eight. And so with that in mind, when the task force met in April, 2020 to discuss potential on-ramp recommendations, we collectively took a step back to think about what options might be potentially the most useful for including local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence experts, as well as information into the existing decision making process. And so how the task force had informally organized these ideas was under three high level categories. And these are building relationships, analytical capacity, and really looking at existing products. And so by looking at potential on-ramps in this way, there was consensus on further flushing out both relational and analytical options. And this is because both local knowledge and traditional knowledge are living sources of knowledge, which means that in cases where research is not readily available to inform a council's action, the information is housed within individuals and communities. And so this living nature of both local and traditional knowledge means that relationship building is key. And at the same time, there are existing documents, bodies, and processes where LKTKS information or expertise uh, can be included in a rigorous way. And I would just like to note that the task force will continue these conversations on including and vetting additional on-ramp options at our March 2021 meeting. At its most recent meeting in November 2020, the task force started to develop the protocol's content. It's very early in the work process, but the co-chairs envision an accessible guidance document with four main sections. So first would be the overall purpose of the document, likely including contextual information as well as definitions of key terms. And the second would articulate high level guidelines for local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information. And at this November meeting, the task force came to a consensus on 12 preliminary guidelines and I will speak to them on the next slide. The third section of the Envision document would contain practical guidance for how you might operationalize the guidelines. And the final would likely contain references to other related tools and work and information. As co-chairs, our goal is to create a document that's effective and we are looking for it to be grounded in practical advice. So the core of the document we see as being sections two and three, and we are looking for it to be very usable with very clear language that will make it useful for informing council decision-making as appropriate. At its November meeting, the task force 
identify these 12 initial high level guidelines uh, and we do anticipate that they will be further developed throughout the 2021 meetings. The task force is at an initial stage in this work, which means the language and supporting rationale will need refinement. So some of the language that you are seeing here will change as we move forward to make sure it's very clear that this is an inclusive process, an inclusive document, so no relevant expertise is left out. So for example, uh, something that Dr. Wise and I have spoken about is that we could see guideline six as reading appropriate entities instead of just referencing tribes. And this would better speak to the many constituent bodies who may hold local knowledge or traditional knowledge and be involved in the council's process. And finally, these guidelines are also interrelated. And so much like the whole of our work as a task force, uh, we've cautioned against any individual piece being extracted. Um, and so these guidelines will need to be operationalized so they're practically meeting, meaningful. And this is again, what the March meeting that's upcoming will be dedicated to. But an example, uh, a very high level example of how guideline one might be operationalized with some practical guidance would be to say that staff should become familiar with key concepts and definitions, as well as any other resources that may be developed by the task force prior to initiating particular work. And there are resources being developed like the glossary of terms that are intended to help with this. And other operationalizations for guideline one might include directing staff or agency partners to follow communication rules, which are set out by fishing associations, tribes, or municipalities, so they can respectfully identify the right authorities to create an appropriate approach for working with local knowledge or traditional knowledge systems. And the guidance the task force will provide will differ based on the entity or process that's being looked at. So for example, there will very likely be different steps to follow to appropriately engage Alaska Native elders versus tribal governments or sector, skipper, sector skippers, excuse me. And the task force is looking to provide guidance on how to navigate those nuances. The next slides are gonna focus on the overarching work the task force has been engaged in. So over the last year, the task force has spent some significant time with the question of how we might be able to leverage the expertise of members to help identify and define sources of LKTK, uh, the social science of LKTK and subsistence. And in an effort to answer this question, the task force has identified several peer reviewed or publicly available reports from agencies that are relevant to local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence. And specifically, we were looking at sources that would actually contain interviews or ethnographic work that are related to local knowledge and traditional knowledge. And the curating of these sources is very much still ongoing, um, but it is guided by a very specific set of parameters to ensure the documents have the best chance of being useful. So for example, the parameters include the large marine ecosystems, specific fisheries, marine mammals, climate change, and other elements that are under the council's purview. And the task force is working on a tool that will function much like a search engine to help council staff, agency partners, and the public identify these types of sources. And a major benefit of this type of tool is that it will help the task force to pilot, to pilot our protocols and with forming final recommendations. So for example, one on-ramp would be that local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence information be more rigorously included in appropriate analytical documents. And so the task force recognizes that each document is responsive and very much related to a specific action, which may limit the usability of certain sources if they can only provide a very high level context. So the value of this type of effort is that it will help us to gauge how these types of sources can be used in an analysis. And in short, it's really trying to create a useful feedback loop that will help the task force create an iterative process for ground truthing that protocol development. And then in the end, we also are anticipating this to be a highly usable tool for council, staff, agency partners, and the public. It was also mentioned briefly in the Climate Change Task Force's presentation that we've been discussing the Norton Sound Red King Crab case study. Uh, and we're seeing this as um, an, a way to eventually pilot protocols. So the purpose of a case study for this task force would be to better understand how to achieve including local knowledge, traditional knowledge, the social science of local knowledge and traditional knowledge as well as subsistence information into the council's process. And this particular case study is of interest because it's responsive to a request from the SOC. Uh, there's also local awareness of rapid environmental change on the Northern Bering Sea 
and local knowledge and traditional knowledge may be able to, to meaningfully contribute to key questions that are related to species distribution and abundance. And currently the case study is still on the table where the task force is continuing to talk about the possibility of what this would look like rather than systematically walking through it with the protocol in hand. And that's just because we're so early in the protocol development stages. Um, but nevertheless, there is consensus that the case study could provide a valuable opportunity to, again, ground truth those protocols with a region specific, fishery specific approach. And that means the task force would intend to use the case study to test how useful and accurate different parts of the initial protocol are prior to making any final recommendation, recommendations. Excuse me. Although this is a fishery specific approach, the task force is considering the value of being able to take a reflexive look at how effective the protocol is before we're able to complete our work. This slide is just meant to provide the council a very simplified illustration of our project timeline. Um, this is not inserted into the work plan because it's a simple evolving tool that the co-chairs use to keep our workflow on track. And I'll leave this up for a moment. Um, and I would just note that our next steps as we move forward will be to have the March 2021 meeting. The dates are set for that at the 16th and 17th. And at this meeting, the task force will continue to build out the protocol um, specifically for guidance on achieving, specifically for operationalizing the steps to achieve those high level guidelines. And then we'll continue our ongoing discussions on the on ramps or potential points of entry for local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information. And then I'm just gonna briefly circle back and remind the council of the action for D3 today. Um, the fishery ecosystem plan team and the local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence task force are looking for the council to provide feedback on progress as well as um, future work and to make recommendations as necessary. But the climate change task force is looking for the council to endorse its work plan today. And I can pause for a moment if there are any questions, Mr. Chairman. Um, otherwise, we have uh, Mr. McLean's slides for the Ecosystem Committee report built into this presentation, however you would prefer to proceed. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hoffa. Yeah, let's go ahead and pause and see if there's any questions. We are ready for Mr. McLean. Very good, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the council. I'm Steve McLean, staff for the Ecosystem Committee here providing comments on the Bering Sea FEP team report and the Climate Change Task Force work plan that you just heard. I will note that we did not at the committee receive an update from the LKTKS task force as we had received that in November, 2020. And I would uh, refer the council to the Ecosystem Committee minutes from November, 2020 if they have any uh, questions about the, the committee's response to that report. Um, in the interest of time, I'll keep this as short as I can. I'm hitting some of the salient points, but leaving the uh, council to refer to the minutes if they for details, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, regarding the very CFEP team report, we received a report um, from Diana Evans and Dr. Karen Aiden about the Bering Sea uh, Fishery Ecosystem Plan Team meeting from 2020 summarizing um, their meeting, focusing discussion on development of research priorities for the FEP team and the development of the ecosystem health report card, as you um, heard. The committee members did have questions about the development of research priorities, whether that was at a high general level or if there were specific research topics that had been identified um, by the team. Uh, and the committee members also had questions about how the research priorities are forwarded to other agencies and founding and sorry, funding agencies and how that progress towards implementation and completing those tasks are monitored. Um, Ms. Evans replied that the priorities uh, are a broad level and not specific priority topics um, designed to be considered by the SSCN's council as they develop uh, research priorities through the normal council process. The committee noted that there's a lot of fishery science expertise, but not specific fishery operational experience on the FEP team and the committee um, asked about the transparency of that process to develop the ecosystem health report card and specifically where input from the public takes place. 
Uh, Dr. Aiden noted that there's a small ecosystem status report team at the AFSC that's been engaged in an expansive literature review. Um, and the intention is to bring that list to the FEP team at its meeting planned for May 2021, um, which is intended to be an open process where the public is invited uh, to provide recommendations to the team. Um, there's also noticed that there's been much discussion uh, at the team about how to repair, prepare the report card with input from the public and other council advisory groups. Um, and ultimately the committee requested clarification of whether the process intends an opportunity for the ecosystem committee to review and provide comment on that draft report card. Regarding the Climate Change Task Force, we received that overview of their meeting um, presenting the work plan from Dr. Kirsten Holzman and Dr. Diane Stram um, from their 20, uh, December 2020 meeting. This is the first time that the committee has had a chance to review uh, the report from the task force and the committee had a number of questions and some concerns about what were identified as objectives at the time. I think that the uh, task force uh, presenters clearly heard the advice from the committee and um, did modify their presentation for the AP and the council. Um, I think that that's a welcome change from the committee. Uh, the committee did recommend that the authors um, review the document and edit its bride more clarity about how the process is intended to be carried out in the future, especially noting that the CCTF was uh, designed to be dissolved once their report was presented. Both Dr. Holzman and Dr. Strand responded that the task force is piloting that process to mainstream climate information into existing uh, on-ramps into the council process um, they do not intend for the CCTF to have an unlimited lifespan, um, rather developing a process that fits well within the current council framework. The team also uh, asked whether the, the committee asked whether the team envisions that their synthesis of information could be useful for other purposes um, in the council process and fishery management process in general, such as NEPA analyses. Um, and it is the, the uh, authors intended that the information could be used for multiple purposes um, throughout the management process. Um, there was some concern from the committee that there's a lot of work that is now happening regarding climate change and we're concerned about the overlap between the task forces work and other processes and the amount of time that it requires to be up to date on all of the initiatives. Um, Dr. Olson acknowledged and appreciated that feedback and noted that um, the intention is that the other climate change initiatives would feed information into the council process um, through the task force rather than the task force duplicating any of those efforts. Um, they also noted, um, the committee also noted that the language is, is fairly technical and may not be effectively communicating the plans to a general audience. Um, and they know, the team acknowledged that it can be simplified um, to identify and help clarify concepts such as resilience and adaptation. The uh, one of the committee members noted that rural residents may be aware of immediate changes that are occurring um, and questioned how those immediate changes are addressed and included in the task force work plan. Um, it was acknowledged that those immediate changes are an important piece to highlight um, and places where those sorts of data can be integrated is extremely important. Um, and everybody agreed that the more frequent updates are important and suggested um, that the committee received updates at least twice per year more frequently if necessary or useful. Um, there was some discussion about what were identified as objectives in the work plan. Um, there was general concern, um, sorry, general agreement for what were identified as objectives one and two, but there was some concern about objective three, specifically one committee member questioned how information is integrated in the council process over time um, and especially once the task force has been dissolved. Although it was acknowledged that some of that material is complex, um, most of the, the committee felt that objective three was an important piece of the overall work plan for the climate change task force. And let's see if I get that. Yeah, the general consensus uh, of that committee was that the work plan should proceed and that the presentation and report should be edited to more simply communicate 
the intention of objective three and how that information will be integrated into the council process. Um, and I think that you saw the results of their response to that today. Uh, the committee also suggested that the, as the task force, um, that the task force would benefit from including industry participants to address some of the concerns that were raised by the committee. Um, they also noted that the task force work plan and outcomes are valuable not only to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, um, but that it resent, represents a cutting edge approach to the science and management of fisheries under climate change, um, and that the work plan would have national and international impact. And those are the end of the Ecosystem Committee report. I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Mr. Twight, did you have any comments? I don't have anything to add to Steve's very thorough presentation. Great, great. Thank you. Council members, any questions on the Ecosystem Committee report? All right. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Thanks again, Dr. Hoppala. presentations on D3 that will bring us to public testimony. And we had at least a couple signed up. I'll refresh. Okay, yes, it looks like we have uh, two members of the public signed up to testify. First up will be Lauren Devine and then Mike Levine. Good afternoon, Chairman Kinnan and members of the Council. Apologies. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. For the record, my name is Lauren Devine. Uh, I, I'm represent the LU community of St. Paul Island, and I sit on the Climate Change Task Force. I would just like to provide some comments on the um, report that you heard from Dr. Holzman and um, Dr. Stram. And I just want to speak to uh, some of the questions and some of the discussion. I, I think this has been a very exciting uh, task force to be a part of. I am very appreciative of all of the hard work that has gone in um, by a, a huge number of um, staff, of uh, participants, of the FEP team, um, Alaska Fisheries Science Center uh, staff, researchers, um, the, the public. We've just had an incredible amount of information and discussion and iterative um, work go into forming the work plan, the, the outcomes, discussing case studies, just all of this very rich um, work. And it's very apparent to me as a member and what makes me so excited to be part of this um, process at the, at the council at this time is that this really, there seems to be a lot of um, interest in, and motivation uh, to see this works through. And I think that that's, um, it just serves as a model. This um, council continues to be for this kind of work. And as a lot of our management frameworks are uh, static or, you know, not, not inclusive of climate change, I think this is very timely work um, that we have right now. And so I just, I want to express my gratitude and, and really echo that it, there seems to be a swell of um, interest and support around exploring the climate change task force and the possible uh, on ramps and, and outcomes and outputs and, and products. I know there is um, some concern um, about the different, you know, climate informed tools and management options. I, I think as this evolves further, uh, that, well, my hope is that the, the plan team, the science and statistical committee, the advisory panel, and uh, you as council members will be able to see um, that we're hoping to accomplish all of this through a very transparent and um, structured way in which we have that rigorous scientific review, uh, regular feedback, and that everything that we're proposing is really about synthesizing the huge amount and, and diverse types of information that are coming into the process through a variety of on-ramps um, and really making use of that information uh, in a way that is helpful and benefits 
um, and, and kind of infuses the processes of the council to help you with decision making in this more uh, unpredictable future that we that we find ourselves in. So I I know there's um, work that we have to do to uh, help help uh, you know make everyone clear about how we don't want to duplicate, how we um, will be more uh, informing, not, you know, action forcing. I know that language uh, tends to keep popping up and maybe you just haven't done a quite a thorough enough job of, of explaining those things. But I, I want to do one thing and draw your attention to a recently published article uh, that Dr. Strand actually just sent out to us task force members. And it, I think it paints a perfect picture of what we seek to do. I'm just going to read the abstract. This is from a uh, Thompson et al. in July uh, 2020 that was published to Fisheries uh, and it is a peer-reviewed article. The abstract states, ecosystem transformation can be defined as the emergence of a self-organizing, self-sustaining ecological or social ecological system that deviates from prior ecosystem structure and function. Transformations are occurring across the globe. Consequently, a static view of ecosystem processes is likely no longer sufficient for managing fish, wildlife, and other species. They present a framework that encompasses three strategies for fish and wildlife managers dealing with ecosystems vulnerable to transformation. Specifically, managers can resist change and strive to maintain existing ecosystem composition structure and function. They can accept transformation when it's not feasible to resist change or when changes are deemed socially acceptable or direct change to a future ecosystem configuration that would yield desirable outcomes. Uh, I think this really highlights kind of what we hope to do. And it goes on to speak about a suite of management strategies that can be implemented using a structured approach of learning and adapting as ecosystems change. I think that is beautifully put out um, how we hope as a, as a task force to feed into the broader fishery ecosystem plan team efforts to the SSC, um, to other council processes in this specific action module um, of the FEP. And I think uh, once that plays out, the council will see that um, this is a piece that makes the council stand out from other regional advisory bodies um, in this fisheries management process. I think um, this is something that we're really looking forward to bringing to you as a council to help you improve your decision making. So I'll wrap it up there um, for time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Devine. Questions from council members. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Up is Mike Devine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, this is Mike Levine. I'm the second half, I suppose, of the rhyming, um, the rhyming duo of public testimony this time. I'm senior Arctic fellow with Ocean Conservancy and also a member of the Climate Change Task Force. Um, I would just wanted to take this opportunity first to thank Diana and Kirsten for all the leadership and work that went into developing the work plan, um, particularly in the strange times we live in. This was difficult over uh, COVID and over Zoom. Also to thank the other task force members for all of the time and thinking and expertise that's reflected in the work plan. Um, it's been both rewarding and humbling for me to work with that group of people um, with so much experience in thinking about climate change um, and how best to adapt to the um, impacts to ocean resources and move toward climate ready fisheries. Um, also wanted to thank the council for furthering the fishery ecosystem plan and the climate change task force. It is an important part of moving toward ecosystem-based fisheries management, climate-ready fisheries, and sustainable, inclusive science-based management. Um, Kirsten and Diana uh, and Lauren earlier did an excellent job of going through the plans and the process. Um, and I won't um, endeavor to, uh, to repeat it, but as I see it, we are um, charged with gathering and synthesizing information um, and recommending ways to the council for integrating that information in its decision making um, process. And as Lauren noted, um, it should be very clear that the task force understands and appreciates that our work is intended to be action informing and not action forcing. Our, our goal um, is to help advance and advise the council um, to make the best decisions and continue to be at the cutting edge and the tools available to continue to um, 
address climate change and move toward climate-ready fisheries management. Um, and I think uh, Diana and Kirsten did an excellent job of identifying that to the extent that wasn't clear in the work plan, um, that probably reflects the um, difficulty in working over Zoom and the difficulty in communicating with the other with, with the other bodies. And lang it's a language issue, not an intention or understanding issue among among the task force. Um, and so, uh, just to summarize, um, I reiterate my thanks to the um, the leadership of the task force um, and encourage the council to continue to lead in the effort to ensure climate ready fisheries management by furthering the work plan. With that, I'll uh, gladly take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am. Um, thank you, Mr. I have a motion. I'm trying to get it to council staff. We can uh, stand by while that transmits. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the motion reads as follows. This is under D3 for the Climate Change Task Force Work Plan. The Council supports the goal of the Climate Change Module as developed by the CCTF to facilitate the Council's work toward climate-ready fisheries management that helps ensure both short and long-term resilience for the Bering Sea. The Council also approves the three objectives slash steps from the draft work plan. The Council's existing public process incorporates extensive, primarily near-term ecosystem and climate information in decision-making. The CCTF work plan should focus on how to incorporate long-term trend information from a diverse knowledge base into our existing processes, assisting the Council in maintaining sustainable fisheries in a changing climate. The Council approves the CCTF work plan after the following revisions to incorporate one, regular check-ins with the SSC and Council, including prior to using resulting work products in existing Council processes, two, a list of deliverables that relate to the module's objectives slash steps and the task force's remaining time frame of 2021 through 2025, three, identification of NIMS and or Council groups proposed to take on ongoing maintenance of new climate information once the work of the CCTF is complete, and four, input provided by the Ecosystem Committee intended to simplify and increase readability of the work plan. The Council is cognizant of the multiple tools developed and in development in recent years to assess the impacts of climate change on our ecosystem and species. The Council recommends the FEP team review the CCTF work plan when revised and work with the CCTF to review the list of existing and newly proposed deliverables related to ecosystem and climate information to focus and or consolidate products where appropriate to make them more accessible. The list of products there, economic and social profiles, an existing product, ecosystem status reports, existing risk table, existing Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan, existing climate impact update for contribution to the ESR proposed annually by the CCTS, that's new ecosystem health report card proposed by the FEP team, new and uh, Eastern Bering Sea Climate Change and Fisheries Report proposed biennially by the 
of CCTF that's new and any additional CCTF products not listed. And with a second, I would speak to it. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Is there a second? Down. Second. Thank you, Mr. Down. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I very much appreciate the presentation that we got today. We hadn't seen this work plan yet and, and hadn't had a chance to interact with the task force for almost a year, I believe. So I, I think the engagement with the council at this meeting has been really helpful. And I, I appreciate staff's work on this, the task force work on this, and trying to respond to all our questions um, so that we know what we're doing here and we know how we can use it in the future. I think it's extremely important for the council to be engaged in this work. So this motion is, is pretty clear that it supports the goal that was proposed by the task force. There's no revisions to that goal and the three objectives, which I think in the staff presentation, they clarified as might be better um, characterized as steps. So I've left that kind of open to how they wanna reword that to make that clear. Um, but basically it, it provides what I'm trying to do is boil down the added value of the work plan um, from this task force. And I think through the discussion, we've gotten um, a lot of good, you know, back and forth about what our existing process does and then where we're trying to add some value into our future process. And for me, that that became clear that it's focused on incorporating this long-term trend information from a diverse knowledge base. And so I put that explicitly in the motion to show why we're moving in this direction. Um, I also uh, explicitly provided um, approval of the work plan in this motion with some revisions. And I'll just briefly walk through those revisions. The first is regular check-ins with the SSC and council, especially prior to using any work products in the existing council process. And I think this was an SSC recommendation. I think it carries over as a good council recommendation. Uh, number two on the list of deliverables, um, being very clear how they relate to these steps and the task force remaining time frame. I believe that was an FEP, um, uh, what do we call them, FEP work group recommendation, as was number three, um, identification of who carries on this work once the task force is complete, because the task force does have a defined term. And so I think that was also an FEP work group recommendation. And then finally, number four was trying to capture some of the ecosystem committee comments um, intended to try to simplify the, the work plan itself, um, not just the language, but the, the steps involved and what we would expect as deliverables or products from those steps, and just generally to increase the readability. So I picked up those, those comments there. Um, the, last, the last paragraph is also just intended to, to help us work through several of these products. And I, I think it would really help us to have the FEP team and the task force work together and coordinate. I understand from the presentation now that some of these might be the same thing even. Um, they might not all be individual products. They might just have a different name in the FEP team minutes than they do in the, in the climate change task force work plan. And so even just you know, consolidating or, or dealing with those levels of inconsistencies, I think will be really helpful. And I think that's not because we're trying to inhibit new climate related products, but because if we have too many, we and the public are both confused on where to focus our efforts. Um, so working through this process as we continue to coordinate and, and likely virtually for the near term, I think will be really important. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that ecosystem committee did, did have a recommendation to add potentially um, someone else to the task force that would be more a local knowledge person or someone from industry that's um, working in the fisheries that we manage. And, and I thought that was more appropriate to deal with in, in staff tasking if the council wanted to go that direction. So I'd be glad to answer any questions. That's the whole of my motion. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Kimmel, uh, for your motion and for speaking to it. Uh, we can go to questions. I would note uh, that the motion is posted in the IT chat box, as well as under the D3 agenda item on the E agenda. Mr. Mesero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Kimball, for um, putting this sort of complicated issue into words in your motion that really help bring it all together. I think, you know, some of the questions that have been asked in the presentation um, are are sort of focused on the last paragraph that you included in your motion. And I appreciate you putting all of the different products down 
on a list like that and providing some guidance for the FEP team to re review this. But who, my, my question is, who would you envision having oversight to determine if some of these things are overlapping or they're not? Or do you think that SSC would be the one that would be reviewing these things? Or would it be the staff or the council that would be sort of figuring out how all these different products fit into our ecosystem component of management. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau, for the for the question. I, I think I, I've i tried to be explicit that at least I think the first, first chance that this should be with the FEP team, since they're kind of the oversight group for, for the FEP in general, and then both task force modules that are working under the Bering Sea FEP. I think that work needs to start first. And then I do think, you know, what I put earlier in the motion about, you know, checking in with the, both the SSC and the council as kind of the general oversight for where we land on what kind of products are going to be most useful, what we would expect to see in the future. Um, I think it, it has to come through the SSC and council as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau. Further questions for Ms. Kimball? Um, any amendments to the motion? Comments on Ms. Kimball's motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Kimball, thank you for a really, um, as Mr. Mesereau pointed out, a, a motion that really synthesizes um, the discussions around this issue that have really happened in, in several virtual rooms at this meeting and, and through the Ecosystem Committee. Um, and uh, that's not easy, but I think the fact that you're able to do it indicates that there is actually a lot of, of, of common viewpoint on on this product as it evolves. And, and I, I think that's a great sign too. Um, I just wanted to briefly address um, the issues around um, a lot of these tools that are being developed uh, for us to work with. Um, they are, uh, there, there is a confusing number right now, but uh, that's no criticism on the developers at all, at least in my mind. Um, that's the nature of how these things build is that um, tools get developed and, and then uh, we figure out how to make them work together effectively and where there may be some redundancies and all that. And we're, we're, we're sort of transitioning into that stage, which is great. Um, the tools themselves are amazing. And, and I think we shouldn't lose track of, of what's been developed so far. Um, they're in, in whatever form they end up in finally, they, they are really going to help us as, as a council, as a council family, as a community that's tied to sustainable fishery management in the Bering Sea, they're gonna be incredibly helpful to us uh, as we confront managing fisheries in a changing climate. Equally, they're important to uh, fishery managers globally. They're already being picked up. We learned that um, Tools like these aren't really available anywhere else in the world yet. So we're developing tools that are going to be used much more broadly. We, <laughs> the scientists working with us, uh, the people involved in the, particularly in the Climate Change Task Force, but also the, the scientific community that's backing that up, uh, are developing products that can have a really broad use. And, and that's the sort of thing that always both impresses me, but also I think should have us as a council feeling good that again, we've, we've chosen a path forward to deal with this that has value, not just for us, but has value much more broadly. And um, as, as we think about this motion, and as we think about what our contribution as a council is to shaping these and, and ending up where we all know we need to end up in terms of the ability to adapt to climate change. Uh, I just didn't want us to lose sight of 
the groundbreaking nature of the work and the value of this work, not just to us, but more, more broadly. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Kimball, for the motion. I very much appreciate it, and also the work of the task force. A lot of work has been done, and, and it's, it's good work. You know, I just when I look at look through that, especially I found myself looking through the uh, the uh, fisheries management flow chart and thinking about you know kind of th some of the the range of tools that we'd be presented with, and and it lays out a systematic process and and uh, how that ultimately uh, relates to development of good policy and and. Uh, you know, I think it's important to think about how, how the council will respond or through adaptiveness or our ability to respond to the, the uh, different changes we're faced with and, and that we have that latitude to, to respond and again, that, that we uh, have good strong fisheries, but, but meet the conservation needs through, through a changing climate and a changing habitat. So, so it's pretty exciting stuff. And, and again, my, my support for all of it, and I'll definitely support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Dr. Balsiger. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks for the motion, Ms. Kimball. I think it's well constructed. Uh, thanks for that. And of course, as we've mentioned a few times throughout the meeting, we owe a great deal of thanks to the many bodies, the task force, all of the people have actually worked for a year to put these pieces together. So uh, I appreciate that you including that ref those references in here. I particularly like the first paragraph where you mentioned you need to incorporate long-term trend information from a diverse knowledge base. And so to me, this speaks to the need for the for local knowledge, traditional knowledge kinds of things that we've talked about a few different times at this meeting. And so I appreciate you putting that in there. I think it's a good motion and I will support it. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will be supporting the motion as well, but I wanted to note that as a council member who's fairly familiar with this process, I had to spend quite a bit of time really and mental energy sorting through what is the role of the council, the SSC, the AP, the Community Engagement Committee, the Ecosystem Committee, our plan team, our FEP plan team, our uh, climate change task force, our LKTK task force. And I think, uh, I don't even, I guess those are just the groups um, that doesn't even talk about the tools or the document. And so um, while I'm very appreciative of this work, I just, I want to caution that I think the members of the public who we are most hopeful to engage and are most likely to have some of this local and traditional knowledge already find our process somewhat dense. And so I'm just putting on the record that, that my hope would be that as this moves forward, we can provide more clarity um, around the roles of these various groups and these tools and how they're going to integrate into the council process. Um, because if I, as a council member, um, had to spend you know quite a bit of time thinking through these various pieces and how they fit together, I worry that the public may find it challenging as well and may have trouble figuring out where to best engage in our process. And so it's not, um, it's not, I'm not saying anything negative about the work that's been done or the motion that's on the table. It's just a cautionary uh, note. And my hope is that all the staff and folks who are doing really a lot of hard work on this will be able to keep that in mind and will be able to help provide more clarity going forward so that we don't lose the very people we're trying to engage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Campbell said it much better than I could have. I was going to say the same thing. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cross. Additional comments on the motion? Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I think, um, well, I'm supporting my own motion, but I didn't, um, I didn't say thank you to uh, Dr. Stram and 
and Kristen Holtzman, who, who worked through the work plan, have been leading this task force, and I think that is due. And I think in light of the comments of um, Mr. Cross and Ms. Campbell in particular, you know, I think staff are taking that to heart, you know, that the only way that this becomes something that's not just put on a shelf but usable um, in our process, in our spec process and our management process, is if we all well understand it and know how to how to how to use it. And so I feel like staff are being um, listening carefully and trying to take our comments into account. So I, I appreciate all the comments by council members and the work by staff and thank you. Seeing any more comments, I think we're ready to vote. Is there any opposition to the motion? No opposition, the mo motion passes unanimously. Anything further under C3? Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, that will bring us to our uh, staff tasking agenda item. Um, uh, Mr. Witherell, uh, walk us through this. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a short PowerPoint. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to go through the e-agenda item and what's in the action memo. Uh, first is we have a number of meetings that will occur in now through May that we know of, and some of these are set in terms of the dates and agendas, and others are tentative. I'm not going to go through each one of those, but we can answer any questions about what might be on the agenda. Uh, second part is we have a couple of one being the balance of the ecosystem committee report and the other is um, a notice of an upcoming uh, stakeholder workshop on Pacific Sablefish transboundary assessment. And so starting with the ecosystem committee report, I'd ask uh, Mr. McLean to take over the mic and give us the balance of the report. Okay, Mr. McLean. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Again, Steve McLean is staff for the Ecosystem Committee. I'm going to go through very briefly. Again, all of the information is there available um, on the Ecosystem uh, Committee report that's on the agenda. Um, Dr. Jerry Hoff from the Alaska Fishery Science Center um, provided a summary of a work plan for the Deep Sea Coral Research Technology Program Alaska Initiative that is taking place here um, from 2020 to 2023. This is part of a uh, eight-year national effort um, rotating region to region to uh, study and understand deep sea coral in each of these different regions that's currently um, in place here in Alaska. Uh, the general focuses on research and collection of new information on deep sea coral taxonomy, distribution, diversity, and life history, and natural and induced habitat changes. Um, Dr. Hoff identified a number of projects and partners to make up the science initiative. Projects include uh, um, validation of coral and sponge distribution modeling in the Gulf of Alaska that's responsive directly to a council request. Recruitment, reproduction, and larval supply of Alaskan deepwater corals. A joint Canada-USA seamount exploration in the eastern North Pacific. And assessing the effectiveness of area closures uh, and for maintaining healthy deep sea coral and sponge communities. Um, there was a question um, about the cooperative crews between Alaska and Canada. Um, Dr. Hoff explained that these are seamounts that are very infrequently um, surveyed and the intention was to collect data to evaluate, evaluate the connectivity, isolation, biodiversity, um, and using drop cameras, uh, environmental DNA samples, and et cetera, and represents a good opportunity to um, review information and, and an ecosystem that is very rarely visited. 
uh, community member noted that there's a process at the North Pacific Fisheries Commission to close or prohibit fishing on CMATs outside of 200 nautical miles in the Gulf Basin and asked whether there were plans to conduct any surveys outside of the EEZ. There are not um, at this point because uh, the deep sea areas there outside 200 nautical miles are likely too deep to survey with the equipment available to the program. Um, but however, the committee did um, recommend and encourage the program to consider collecting information outside of the EEZ to reflect the needs of the parties of the NPFC. Um, next, we heard a presentation from Dr. Clay Shotwell um, presenting information about the ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles as EBFM operationalization at the Science Center. Those, uh, as you know, are a scientific uh, standardized framework facilitating the integration of ecosystem and socioeconomic factors within the stock assessment process. The committee did uh, have some questions about whether the information that gets into BSP is peer reviewed in the same way as other documents and information used in the council process. Um, Dr. Shawla explained that they received, uh, the ESPs received scientific review along with the safe documents through the normal AFSC um, process. The committee asked um, how the preview of ecological and economic conditions or peak overlaps or does not overlap with the ESPs as they both have on or asked for early information um, about ecosystem processes into the council process. Uh, Dr. Shaw will explain that the peak provides an early look at what is happening in the ecosystem as a whole, while the ESPs would use that information in consideration of a particular stock for which the ESP is prepared. Uh, Dr. Shotwell identified a dashboard um, that is available to the scientists at the AFSC. Um, and the committee asked whether that dashboard describing ecosystem status was a resource available to the public. It is currently not forward facing, public facing, but intended to be used by the stock authors and others at the Science Center because some of those data are confidential. But there is there are plans or a, an outward facing reporting page that would summarize the data that are presented on the dashboard um, in order to address the issues of confidentiality. The committee asked um, whether subsistence information or information from community members as part of the ESP process and whether the ESP team has had opportunity to speak with the community engagement committee about how the local information can be evaluated in the assessment. Dr. Shaw well responded that all of that information is welcome, um, particularly social um, in, and local and subsistence information um, and specifically information on how to engage with those local communities. Currently, the information that they use comes from the annual community engagement and participation overview or the ASEPO report. Um, because the ESP program is not set up to gather first-hand information and must rely on existing programs. Um, one committee member noted that using data collected from a different program might invite a gap in communication, at which point Mr. Shotwell, Dr. Shotwell responded that she um, would love to have information about closing any communication gap um, and how to increase communication um, with the ESP team and local communities. Uh, it was asked whether the ESPs are done in other regions or um, what species might be next for ESP development. This program is unique to Alaska, but there is interest from other regions about what is being done, specifically from the Pacific Islands, Northwest and Northeast Science Centers. Um, and there are East ESPs for Eastern Bering Sea Pollock and Ectomacro being developed currently. Uh, the committee reiterated its interest in the development of those ESPs and for continued communication from the uh, EBM working group. And the committee looks forward to the next update from the team and information about how its feedback can be most useful. Thanks. The committee heard a report from Ms. Linda Shaw um, from the Alaska region uh, on best practices to prevent aquatic invasive species from spreading due to biofouling on commercial fishing vessels. It's noted that uh, globally 55 to 70 percent of the non-native species um, are established after spread by bio biofouling. In Alaska, the colonial tunicate um, DVEX, um, which you have probably heard about, is established in Sitka. And the European green crab um, is currently established on Haida Gwaii and could easily spread to Alaska. 
and the best practices are intended to prevent the speeds of those, the spread of those marine invasives from biofouling on commercial fishing vessels. Um, the committee suggested that the marine invasives program should reach out to the United Fishermen of Alaska and be able to communicate best practices to commercial fishers throughout Alaska, um, especially for those smaller vessels that might uh, not necessarily be part of the council process or have heard that presentation. Um, they also, the committee also suggested that there should be some way to track vessels at higher risk in spreading invasives. Um, and it was identified that some vessels that are uh, traveling from Kodiak to California for this good fishery um, as an identification of, of that type of vessel. Uh, the committee also noted that with climate changes and an opening of the Arctic shipping lanes, there is increased potential for the spread by commercial shipping vessels um, of marine invasives into the Arctic and ports where those vessels transiting the Arctic lanes visit. Um, Ms. Shaw noted that Dutch Harbor is at high risk for marine invasives because of the risk from shipping and fishing, and noted that there are um, international efforts to address risks in the Arctic, including the Arctic Strategy Plan um, and new efforts to coordinate NOAA work in the Arctic. The committee noted that globally marine, very, marine invasives are seen as a large threat to the marine ecosystem integrity, um, but did notice that there was not information about the impacts of marine invasive programs in Alaska in the ESP presentation that the uh, committee heard previously, and they suggested that that might be a useful um, data stream to include into those ESPs. Um, finally, the committee recommended that that marine invasives presentation should be presented directly to the council um, and encourage the program to duck outreach through UFA to reach smaller vessels that might not participate in the council level. Regarding the ecosystem workshop, the committee recommended that the steering committee meet soon and begin planning for the state of the ecosystem workshop that was authorized by the council. That meeting is um, currently being planned. We're um, selecting dates um, and expect that to happen soon. Regarding the future ecosystem committee work planning, the committee recommended that the committee chair and the council staff schedule a time to identify a list of priority agenda items and schedule a meeting with the sole agenda item to review those issues and develop a work plan for the committee. Um, the committee requested that the next meeting occur soon to continue the momentum on issues, including marine debris issue that the council had tasked to the committee. And that is the end of the ecosystem committee report. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Mr. Clayton, any comments to add? I do have a couple. Um, First off, as you can tell, this was a very full uh, ecosystem committee agenda, and I really appreciate Mr. McLean's efforts in getting a, a very rich and useful set of minutes out um, about a very full meeting almost immediately before the council meeting. Um, a lot of pressure there, and, and he delivered, and that's much appreciated. Um, secondly, um, the committee is definitely, um, we caught up some um, from what we sort of developed as a bow wave last year, but we haven't fully caught up. And as, as I think the council understands, there's, as we work through the climate change and the, uh, and the LKTKS task force um, work and then ongoing development of other things within the FEP, the committee expects to be uh, part of the council's process for reviewing and, and um, discussing what's happening uh, in, in those forums. And um, so the committee is expecting a, a fairly full agenda for the rest of the year and, and wants to start that with uh, basically some workload management. Uh, so a, a discussion of workload management would be primary at, at our next meeting. Um, and we hope to then report back on that to the council um, for the council's um, blessing or um, or suggestions in terms of uh, how they want to use us. Um, so those are the two major items. Um, I, I will flag, uh, as, as Ms. Kimball brought up um, in her uh, action on D3, uh, we will flag for the council the committee recommendation of uh, adding another member to the Climate Change Task Force. And, um, and then, I, as I say, I'll have some um, work planning type, uh, I'll have at least one work planning type motion for 
when we act on, on these issues at the end of this agenda item as well. Thank you, Mr. Twyke. Any council member questions on the ecosystem committee report? All right, thank you, Mr. McLean. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Stram to take the mic and provide a short summary of the Sablefish work, upcoming Sablefish workshop, because I anticipate some questions from council members relative to the goals and objectives of that workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stram. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Witherall. Um, so just a, a quick overview, the Pacific Sablefish Transboundary Assessment Team, the PSTAT, so that's a, a collaboration, a scientific collaboration between scientists from the Northwest Fishery Science Center, our Alaska Fishery Science Center, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and our Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So stable fish are assessed and managed separately in each of those regions, um, but of these four collaborating partners, but there, there are tagging programs and tag recovery data that obviously show that table fish moves between these management regions and that that could lead to greater uncertainty or bias in the assessment estimates of biomass. So this collaboration was developed to um, develop a spatial management MSE framework and movement models for the Northeast Pacific stable fish using data from all regions to determine if scientific advice to managers may be improved. So in conjunction with that, um, they are organizing a workshop for stakeholders from the U.S. and for Canada to learn more about this stable fish management strategy evaluation project and to provide feedback on the goals and objectives of the MSE. So we have a steering committee that includes um, members of all four of those scientific collaborating partners, as well as staff from the Pacific Fishery Management Council and from the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. And we've been meeting weekly to organize this workshop um, and to uh, come up with facilitators with questions, um, with goals and objectives, there will be breakout groups. And right now what we're looking at, and it, it just changed this week, it's tentatively planned for April 27th through the 29th. Obviously it will be virtual. Um, we're working on getting um, facilitators and we'll be, we're um, looking for different facilitators for different um, breakout sessions. And we will have information and an agenda posted as soon as it's available. It'll be a workshop for which people need to register. You can, it's open registration. Once we get it online, it'll be open until April 16th to register. And um, with people registering for individual breakout sessions as well. There will be an FR notice for it that will come out. And um, I believe that the information, the documents will be held, uh, housed at the Pacific Fishery Management Council website, but we will have links to both the um, the agenda, the workshop, the registration, and how to get to all of those documents on our website as well as the um, collaborating party website. So that's as far as we've gotten right now, but we will definitely have it posted and obvious on our website for um, any of our stakeholders to participate in that workshop. Thank you, Dr. Stram. Questions from council members? Okay. Okay. Um, moving on to the next uh, slide. Um, a few things relative to upcoming agendas. Uh, we're planning for virtual meetings through at least the June meeting. Um, whether we, I'm still somewhat optimistic that we'll be able to meet in person in October, but I guess that'll depend on vaccination rates. But in any case, we're planning to come forward uh, with some ideas on uh, how we might return in person and how we might have a somewhat hybrid meeting. Uh, but I'll bring those forward in April, either in uh, the B report or under staff tasking. We posted a preliminary uh, April agenda for your review. Uh, we updated it during this meeting and reposted it. But uh, the ma major items at the April uh, meeting will be, agenda items will be the halibut ABM, of course, and we have a couple of uh, IFQ um, issues, including the three Gulf of Alaska Sablefish pot three-year review and the IFQ access opportunities. For the June meeting, um, 
there's been interest expressed to me from a number of people about shortening the meeting or changing the dates. And originally it was scheduled for an in-person meeting, of course, and you know we didn't want to start the week of uh, Memorial Day and have people travel on Memorial Day. So the original meeting was set for June 7th to 18th. Now we put forward a couple of options of how we might uh, move that earlier and finish up earlier. Uh, the first being the just start the week earlier, right after Memorial Day. Uh, we can do that now that it's virtual. And uh, doing so means that we would have just four days for the AP and SSC meetings uh, with the council beginning um, on the following Monday. The other option is, of course, it would be to rather than have the council meet through Friday the 18th to finish up on the 16th by meeting perhaps on the weekend, but that doesn't provide any um, break for the staff and everyone else. Um, and it might result in some uh, concurrent meetings between the AP and the council if we do it that way. So we're looking for feedback on how to schedule the June meeting. Uh, I think you did hear from the SSC that uh, the week of June 1st worked for them. We also got word from the AP members that that was their preference as well. We posted a revised uh, three meeting outlook based on the actions taken at this meeting and the conversation that uh, NIMS and council staff has had. And this is our view of what we can accomplish um, and be able to put on the upcoming agendas through October. There have been a few changes, of course, based on your actions. We no longer have the CRAB PSC action on your uh, three meeting outlook. Uh, the halibut catch sharing plan allocation review we've kind of put forward to perhaps December because it looks like we might you know, have action on the RQE funding mechanism. Uh, we've got a discussion paper for April and it's possible that that uh, bill may get signed into law in the short future. So that's what we have. I have not scheduled the trawl saver fish overage discussion paper yet. Uh, we're trying to shake out and see what staff is available. So that's the three meeting outlook. I note that we have some emergency rule requests and staff tasking um, under the comments, written comments. And so uh, one of them had to do with uh, vessel caps and the, we, we did, our staff provided uh, a tables and figures for vessel caps back in May when the council took emergency action. And uh, we've updated those tables. And if you have questions, I can, I'll stop here and see if anyone has questions because um, Ms. Henry can, walk through those tables if you'd like, but they're posted on our, as an attachment to this agenda item. Okay, moving on. And we, I used the slide into the B1 report, but just to remind you of what uh, NIMS policy is relative to emergency rules. Uh, Mr. Merrill spoke to that earlier, but I just wanted to remind everybody that's here for your reference. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Witherell, I just have a quick question on your June meeting uh, options. Under both of those options, can you tell me what day the council would start on, under each of those scenarios? Chairman, uh, Ms. Gimbel, under the first option, if we have the uh, AP and SSC start on June 1st, then the council could potentially start on June 7th. So that's Monday, I believe. Okay. And under, yeah, and under the second option, it would be depending on uh, how heavy the schedule is, and it looks like it's going to be a pretty busy. Well, no, not June. We, we're trying to keep it a light meeting, but um, if we started on the Friday, then we would be able to go through Wednesday of the following week. Uh, and whether or not we need to meet one of the weekend weekend days would 
we figure that out when we know what the uh, agenda time might look like, depending on what items are put on the agenda. Thanks. So and under that option, um, Mr. Chair, could you clarify what day the council would start under that option, the council itself? Yeah, I think that's um, Friday, June 11th under the second option. Okay, thank you. Further questions for Mr. Witherell? Uh, Mr. Miserell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Um, my question is about the RQE discussion paper that's coming up. What, would the intention, if we get that discussion paper and it's the council's will to move forward with the funding mechanism for the RQE, that that would be something we would uh, see in October? Is that how you envision that progressing, if that's the way it shakes out? Chair, Mr. Mesrell, that may be a possibility. Um, I, I could tell you with all certainty because it might depend on what comes out of that funding mechanism discussion paper and what alternatives get get added and how long that might take to analyze. So that's that would be a difficult question for me to answer at this point. Okay, thank you. Mr. Down. Thank thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. On the on the uh slide that you showed, Mr. Witherall, on uh, the virtual meetings, you mentioned that, that we'll be meeting virtually at least through June. Maybe we'll take a look at meeting in person in October and the uh, potential of returning to in-person meetings uh, and potentially a hybrid. But there's a third option that you, that you haven't mentioned, and that's to continue to do virtual meetings in the future to some extent, whether that's uh, occasionally when we can or whether it's one or uh, meeting a year or more but uh, I just didn't I didn't hear you mention that as one of the options and I, I thought that that's something that I've been considering doing these and I think uh, it would be worthy of discussion but uh, you spoke to this now a few times and I hadn't heard you mention that that third option yes like mr. chairman mr. down when I say uh, meet in person at this meet at, in October, uh, we still would need to have some uh, remote participation allowed um, because there may be vulnerable members and public that would not be able to attend in person. Now, we, we kind of planning on that for October and December or for a couple of meetings anyway, after we start meeting in person. The discussions we've been having this week suggest that we need to incorporate to some degree uh, remote participation in the future or plan for that. And I plan to come back uh, to the council in April with uh, more of a plan on how we could accomplish having an in-person meeting with some remote component. And I don't, I can't tell you at this point what that remote component might be, but that that I guess is what I'm referring to as a hybrid meeting, Mr. Chairman, if that helps. Yeah, yes, yeah. th th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Witherall. That, that didn't, that, that wasn't my point. I, I understand that, that we're not, we can't identify what the virtual portion of an in-person meeting might, might look like, this hybrid. Uh, my point is that for discussion, when we're considering these things, we may want to consider a completely virtual meeting like we're doing now and have been doing uh, since this time last year um, uh, into the future. In other words, this, this virtual meeting may be an option for the council to save money and to save transportation and time, and hotel fees, those kind of things. Why, why wouldn't we consider doing virtual meetings in the future, at least as a consideration? It's, it's the one option, but I've seen the third option. There's the, you know, when we get back to meeting in person, that's one option, meeting in person with hybrid, some participation, 
um, virtually and then a full virtual meeting in the future. That that was my question if that third option is uh, will be a consideration when, when we take a look at this. Whether I guess it should be, whether it should be a consideration when we take a look at this. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Mr. Down, I, I had not actually planned on having virtual meetings uh, in the future once we had the ability to meet in person because that's not how we laid out our grant, um, but we can bring that forward for further discussion in April. Uh, thank, thank you. I'll, I'll wait till April for, for the, any kind of further discussion on that. I just thought I'd mention that, that now. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for Mr. Wetherall? And Mr. Wetherall, that concludes your uh, staff presentation, correct? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Right. Well, that will bring us next to public testimony unless uh, any council members want to highlight uh, potential action uh, items for staff tasking before we get to public testimony. I know we heard uh, potential flagging of possibly adding another member to the climate change task force, but any other council members want to, to flag anything before um, public testimony? That would be a great time. Uh, Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have, uh, I did send uh, in the chat box to Mr. Witherall, but uh, but uh, he's asked, uh, I, I, I'm planning to circle it, staff casting back to uh, item C1 under the additional monitoring requirements and to have uh, a short discussion and I'll have a, a motion on that at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Down. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there, <clears throat> we might have um, some discussion or motion on uh, uh, relating to the risk table and, and some action. Um, I'm not sure uh, how that will go forward, but uh, just as a notification, may have some uh, some action on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I apologize if Mr. Witherell mentioned this. I just know we were going to kind of come back to the letter um, regarding the Legislative Committee report and the 30 by 30. And, and so I'm just putting that out there in case any of the public uh, feels they want to testify on that. Thanks. will then bring us to public testimony. In fact, we have uh, 13 members of the public signed up to testify. Uh, first up is Kareel DeSargent, then Craig Lowenberg, then Bob Alverson or Dave Franklin. Just a, a reminder that individuals and companies have three minutes, uh, organizations have we will be timing on the uh, Adobe Connect platform, and I'll also be keeping track here just in case there are technical difficulties, and we'll let you know. When I know. Uh -huh. What do you think? Uh -huh. All right, uh, members of the public, please uh, mute your phones if you're not testifying. Mr. Sargent, are you available? No, let's get, go, get in there. Mr. Bizargent. Okay, we can uh, circle back to uh, those who we missed. Craig Lowenberg. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. For the record, my name is Craig Lowenberg. I'm here today on behalf of the Bering Sea Pot Cod Cooperative. The Bering Sea Pot Cod Cooperative is a trade organization that represents stakeholders in the BSAI greater than or equal to 60 foot Pacific Cod pot catcher vessel sector. 
I'm the executive director of the organization as well as a co-owner of a vessel that participates in the fishery. I'm providing testimony today to once again ask the council to take action to rationalize this sector. At the February 2019 meeting, the council took action to signal its intent to develop a discussion paper on BSAI Pacific Cod pot catcher vessel management. Resulting from that action, a scoping paper was produced and stakeholders developed a draft rationalization framework for analysis. As you know, the council has received testimony from a variety of perspectives, both for and against rationalization. I would note the majority of the testimony to date has been in favor of rationalization. The council asked stakeholders to meet, discuss the issues and find common ground. Since that time, we've held additional stakeholder meetings. Um, the meetings were well attended and robust discussions took place. Additional options and elements were discussed and agreed to be included in the draft framework for analysis at the council level. The path forward as discussed at the meeting was for the newly organized stakeholder group, many of whom you've heard from uh, in public testimony in previous meetings to bring their proposals forward for consideration by stakeholders. Unfortunately, we have not yet heard back from that group on their intended path forward. It's, it's been essentially radio silence, leading me to believe they no longer intend to engage with us on this issue. The 2021 A season was yet another example of a short season with not only high, but, but new participation. Thankfully, we didn't have any loss of lives or, or vessels this season. However, the issues that existed prior to February 2019 still exist today. In fact, many have been exacerbated. So once again, I'm here to, on behalf of the Bering Sea Podcod Co-op to ask the council to help bring stakeholders together in a public setting where meaningful discussions can take place and stakeholders can be held accountable. Setting the bar to 100% stakeholder consensus before taking up the issue doesn't seem reasonable. I'm not aware of any rationalization programs where all stakeholders were in complete agreement at the beginning of the program analysis. So I urge the council to make rationalization of our sector a top priority to improve the prosecution of the fishery reduce bycatch, provide stability and sustainability for the resource, as well as stakeholders, and most importantly, promote safety. So I appreciate the opportunity to address the council and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowenberg. Questions from council members? Mr. Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lohenberg. I appreciate you coming forward to the council and, and updating us as, as we uh, um, ask to be kept briefed on this. Um, I'm just, you mentioned that you haven't had any meaningful discussions with some folks that had testified in opposition to this. Do you plan to reach out to them again here in the future and, and report back to us on that in, in April? Is that your, the, the, the next time we should expect to hear from you or, or is there uh, more of a request that you have here at the council today. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Down, for the question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I intend to reach out to the to the other stakeholders. We we have done so um, and intend to continue to do so. Uh, we appreciate their perspective and welcome their input in this process. So um, we'll definitely keep you informed as that as that continues. But as I've said in my testimony earlier, um, we expected to receive some kind of response back from that group uh, um, some time ago and have not yet heard back from them. So I I'm not sure what their, what their current position is. Further questions for Mr. Lohenberg? Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we uh, may have Mr. Bissargen on and available. Are Mr. Bissargen? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kirill Bissargen. I represent K Bay Fisheries Association. <coughs> um, we have a couple proposals we proposed to the council. <clears throat> One proposal is for the online pod pod. Uh, a Bay Fisheries Association is requesting on behalf of long liners a proposal to allow long line cost for the long line cost factor. Instead of using only snap on gear, the fishermen are requesting the AT Council to allow the long line sector to be allowed to use either snap on hook, pot, or a combination of snap on gear with pot during the Pacific Cost Fishery. We're proposing this like this is the reason being is there's long line fishermen that are still interested in using long line uh, snap on gear and we're not trying to eliminate the snap on gear for the 
long life director, but to include the pot, pot, uh, pot on the long line. The proposal is not to read a long line snap on view, but to include long line pot species in combination with snap on long line. The proposal request from the fishing is for the safety of the crew, snap on gear loss, and catch mortality. Fishermen are eager and willing to dive into better solutions to fish without hurting the ecology, environment, and fish habitat throughout the fishing industry. For bettering the fishing industry, fishermen are fishing more sustainably to preserve the habitat of the fish and the ocean that they are very concerned about. Fisher members of the Fishing Association are always looking for ways to fish efficiently, sustainably, and to bring in better sustainable resource. Uh, for the bycatch mortality, it will cut the bycatch substantially because one of the reasons being is uh, we're con very concerned about rockfish mortality. When the rockfish is being caught on long line gear, especially during a uh, uh, cod fishery, um, when Mr. they bring Mr. Yes. Mr. Besargent, let me interrupt you just for a sec. We won't penalize your time. I, I think there might be other members of the public who are waiting to testify that uh, don't have their phones on mute. Please, if you're not uh, speaking, put your phone on mute. Um, it's making it very difficult to, to hear. Um, all right, please continue, Mr. Besargent. Okay. So the bycatch mortality, we see the rockfish as being, uh, usually when you bring it out of the ocean, you fish out of the deep ocean, they die. And they, 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 they don't live. Uh, even if you poke their uh, uh, bladder or their tongue, that so they come up very sadly that you can't keep the rockfish and you have to toss them in the ocean then we see a lot of bycatch mortality uh, being thrown away and that that is a that's very devastating for our for for our fishery um, and we would like that that concern brought up uh, onto the uh, the second oh and the, and then the halibut mortality is maybe less um, it's uh, when you go cod fishing, a lot of small halibut is caught, and that will cut that substantially also. The second proposal we have is for the AP to look into um, our February 1st opener. Uh, we are we are reaching out to the AP in terms of the long line fish engaging the line of fish that we be caught. The, the Pacific cod fishery has been shut down for the past two years. The reopening of the Pacific cod fishery in 2021, we realized the urgency to preserve the cod fishery for the future generation. We bring to attention and the urgency to the FSCAT and Council and future dams fishermen to come together as we ask the fishermen to work together on asking all online fishermen to stand down from February 1st. Also, to include proposal to the council and open on February 1st from this date forward. Reason being, weather in January being terrible, high injury rates, bycatch is at its maximum, having a great impact on the fishery and closures requirements by national marine fisheries. The stand down and open on February 1st by the long line fishermen to include the request of the AP council have a great benefit to all the fishermen having better weather, safety of crew, minimize bycatch dramatically, increase the maximum profit. Most importantly, is to fish more sustainably and preserve our fishery for generations. Uh, it will help is because um, in January, when the fish is being deep, the, fish, the halibut sits in about 120 to 150 fathoms. And the cod, that's in January, that's where the cod is also. So the bycatch is, is, is tremendous. When February hits, the weather warms up a little bit, cod comes closer to shore, and the bycatch is decreased substantially. This year, our organization and all our fishermen in our organization, we voluntarily stood down to a 25th of of January is because we, we are very concerned about the, the 
bycatch mortality and the uh, if we, we, we're trying to fish more sustainably so we can have our future generations eating the fish in the future. So those are the two proposals we are requesting for the council to support and hopefully we can work on this together to have these two proposals uh, in the agenda. I'm hoping if uh, anybody has questions, we can all right, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Sergeant. Any questions from council members? Good. 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 All right, thanks again for your testimony. Okay, uh, next up is Bob Alverson or Dave Franklin, but I understand neither of them are available to testify. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. This is uh, Paul Clampett. I'm I'm here to uh, testify for, for the fish vessel owners and Bob Clampett. I mean, Bob Alverson. <laughs> okay. All right. Mr. Clampett. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, I'm Paul Clampett. I own the fishing vessel Augustine, and I'm a member of the Fishing Vessel Owners Association. I, I'm also vice president of the Sable Fish and Halibut Pot Association. So I'm speaking for both organizations, and we wish to thank um, the advisory panel for their unanimous, unanimous support for recommending that the secretary promulgate a continued emergency action to allow for a temporary transfer of halibut and sablefish IFQ for all quota holders for the 2021 season. We also agree with the AP that this should be counted towards the utilized, should not be counted towards the utilization of the IFQ medical transfer provision. And we agree with removing the vessel cap in area four. Uh, only 84% of the halibut in area 4A and 4B were caught last year and uh, it, was, it was left in the water. Most of the vessels um, that fish there have uh, are, are capped out already. And the only way that uh, most of our vessels that could help possibly catch that would be uh, if you remove the vessel cap. Um, the, pande the pandemic is a unique problem and not something that could be foreseen and adjusted to. Um, there are long wait lists for the vaccine right now. I'm 65 and haven't been vaccinated yet. And I'm on, uh, I've been on the list for two weeks. Um, we are gearing up for the upcoming season and I don't see how our crews will be vaccinated in time. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. And, uh, I appreciate you letting me speak for the, uh, for Bob. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm here. Great. Thank you, Mr. Clampett. Are there any questions? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Clampett, for your testimony. I have a question about uh, your recommendation. Um, it was, I believe, AP Motion 1 uh, recommending uh, that the secretary promulgate emergency regulations for uh, temporary IFQ transfers for halibut and sable fish. And then I think you referenced what's also included in the AP motion under number one there, uh, that use of this emergency regulation in 2021 to transfer IFQ would not be counted as one of the eligible years to utilize the IFQ medical transfer provision. Um, and, and my question for, for you is, I have heard uh, and read in, in um, comment letters to the council that what essentially stakeholders and IFQ fishery participants are seeking is an extension of or the rule that was implemented last year uh, for temporary IFQ transfers. And if that's the case, um, those temporary transfers were different from a medical transfer as I understand it. And also there was no uh, provision in that 2020 rule in terms of anything counting or not toward uh, the limit on medical transfers. So my question for you is, um, do you want, are you looking for the rule that was put in place uh, just like in 2020? Uh, and if that's the case is, is the medical transfer provision a necessary part of that? Because I guess I don't quite see that as being uh, an emergency in that um, 
the council may not need or want to deal with that issue right at this particular point in time because the medical transfer limitations don't kick in until later. Can you help me with that, please? Uh, thanks for the question and uh, uh, through the chair. I, um, I, I, you know, you've got me there. I was under the impression that the transfers that we used last year were, um, were, were counted as medical transfers and that they counted against, I believe we get two medical transfers out of seven years or it might be three, I'm not exactly sure. And uh, that was our understanding and uh, we made, have misunderstood that, but at any rate, we we, we would we uh, would like to um, side with the advisory panel on their motions uh, regarding this issue. And um, if we're incorrect, um, that's great about whether or not this medical trans whether this would count as a medical transfer and whether or not it would go against future medical transfers. We we would like to see it uh, not go against future medical transfers. And uh, I apologize for not being clear about my understanding there. Hopefully somebody from the AP can clear that up or somebody, um, you know, one of, one of the members of the council understands it better than I do. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clampett. Um, no apology necessary. The IFT program is somewhat complex. So um, that's, that's a very helpful answer. Um, I likely will clarify that with perhaps agency staff uh, as we go forward. No more questions, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Dr. Baltinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my response to your question was along the lines of, of Ms. Baker's. Uh, I'd suggest Mr. Clamper could actually talk to some of our agency people offline. There's different types of transfers. So I think there has to be care taken on which kind of transfer you ask for. And I think that uh, you know, the agency staffs is standing by, probably the wrong word for it, are certainly willing to help. And so uh, uh, we will straighten it out as we go through here today. If, if it doesn't get straight in your mind, please call someone on this, on this sample fisheries group. Thanks. Well, thank you for that advice, Mr. Balsinger. Any further questions? Thank you for your testimony. Okay, um, let's see. Next up is Mike Alfieri. Hello, uh, members of the council. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good afternoon. Yeah, hello there. Uh, this is Mike, uh, Chairman Kinead, members of the council. This is Mike Alfieri. I'm actually on the boat heading out to ADAC on the satellite phone here, so I hope that everything comes out all right. Um, I submitted a letter there last December um, about urging the council to get the Gulf rationalization back on the agenda, and I kind of forgot about it, and then I was asked again by one of the locals here in Sandpoint to, uh, if I was going to resubmit the letter. Um, at this meeting. And I said, well, I hadn't considered it, but if you want to get some guys to sign on this time, I'd be happy to. And that's kind of where we're at. Uh, there's, like I mentioned in the letter, there's 22 under 60 trawlers in the area. Um, 14 of them, we got to sign the letter. And really the only reason that they're all not on it is because of logistics and the timing of uh, trying to put this together. We kind of did it all yesterday and today. And for emails and we happen to be in town today because of weather. So um, I just, you know, again, urging the council to proceed, get Gulf rationalization back on the agenda. Um, we really need it out here. I'm battling weather right now to try and get out to ADAC so we can participate out there. Um, as far as the community out here, I mean, like I said, they came to me to do this and there's seven of the eight individuals in Sandpoint signed it. Um, really the only reason that there's four in King Cove haven't is because we couldn't get a hold of them. So I have I, uh, a plan on having 100% participation of the 22 by your April meeting. And uh, like I said, just really we're kind of in this position right now where everybody's realizing that 
they wish they would have done this a long time ago. So anyway, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Alfieri, and, uh, and for calling in on the, on the that phone on the way out west. Let's see if there's questions from council members. See any questions? All right, thank you for your testimony. Good luck. Next up is Mike Shelford. Yeah, hello, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Mike Shelford. We own and operate the fishing vessel Lucian Lady, which participates in the Bering Sea, Aleutian Island, Pacific Cod, Pot CP sector. I'm testifying today in relation to the discussion that was brought up during agenda item C1 about additional monitoring requirements for the Bering Sea, Aleutian Island, CP, Pot Cod sector. Our vessel does not currently have an approved observer sampling station or motion compensated platform scale. It would be very expensive and may not even be possible with the area that we have available. This is a fishery that we are struggling to make a profit currently and any added expenses would be a tremendous burden on the vessels. I do not see any issues with requiring pre-cruise notification and participating in pre-cruise meetings if this can help improve observer data quality. As for requiring a level two observer, I know there, have been, there has been trouble in the past with enough level two observers in the industry as observer providers have used our vessels as a training ground to produce level two observers. So I don't know if this would be feasible. Although the issues with data collection from our fishery was documented well on the analysis paper, we're talking about a fishery that as a whole harvests between 50 to 100 metric tons of cod per day. With this limited amount of cod being caught each day and how easy it is for our fishery with only a few participants to stay in touch with NIMS throughout the season, I feel the added cost to add cert certified observer stations and motion compensated scales is overkill. I request that NIMS not pursue additional monitoring requirements for the Bering Sea Aleutian Island CP pot cod sector at this time. I would also like to ask the council to take up a Bering Sea Aleutian Island pot Pacific Cod pot CP lap program. I think the council is fully aware of the issues facing our sector after the comments from industry participants over the past two meetings. Since no action was taken on agenda item C1, this is the only option available to save our fishery along with the crews and companies that have been dependent on this fishery. I appreciate your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Shelford. Questions from council members, Mr. Down. Yeah, thank thank you very much for 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 uh, jumping in and signing up for public testimony on this, uh, Mike. And um, I, I I heard your comments on the need for uh, a, a, a lap type program being your only option. Um, and but that's not what my question is about. I appreciate those comments. So the, uh, the my my question is. One of the items on the increased uh, additional monitoring requirements was a pre-cruise meeting, which is part of uh, a lot of catcher processors. Would being that that's you know if, if if the would that if you were approached as an owner of a vessel and the National Marine Fisheries Service asked you to conduct these pre-cruise meetings as a way to to heighten uh, the monitoring requirements, make sure that everybody understands what it is they're trying to do is that would that be something you'd voluntarily do or would you need to have that be a requirement no that's something uh sorry through the chair uh, mr down thank you for the question um that's something we would voluntarily do you know we we want to get the uh get NIMS the best data we can and, and and help the observers to to produce the best data available for our fishery so that we can catch um all the quota that's available to us we, we don't want errors in the data um and i think that's one easy way to help uh improve this data that uh that isn't uh, onerous on the on the vessels and companies thank, thank you very much and uh, thanks again mr shelford for for uh taking the time to to bring this back and and to give provide those public comments thank you mr chairman thank you mr down further questions for Mr. Shelford. Okay. All right, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next up, thank you. Next up is Patty O'Donnell, then Heather Mann, and then uh, Matteo Pasladon and Heather McCarty. 
Yeah, good afternoon. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Chairman, members of the Council, my name is Patrick O'Donnell. And uh, I'm calling in support of AP motion number two and staff to ask in, asking the Council to explore having an SSC representative available to speak with the AP in regards to certain agenda items, particularly when SSC minutes are not available prior to the AP taking up those items. And when the items have a strong scientific component, without SSC minutes or an SSC representative, the AP lacks what is sometimes very valuable SSC feedback. I observe that sometimes council staff is hesitant to speak to SSC deliberations and relying on individual AP members' recollection of a SSC discussion is not ideal. Uh, since I got appointed to the AP in 2013, this is something that uh, I, I've come across frequently. Uh, questions being asked, are SSC minutes available? Uh, do we have any information from the SSC to the direction forward? And I mean, this is a simple motion and a simple request. Uh, the council relies on uh, SSC input, and I think it's very, very important that the AP being made up of, sta made up of stakeholders that uh, we are afforded the same opportunity. And I know in the handbook that it states that the SSC does not report out to the AP. However, in, in my seven plus years on the AP, this is something that has come up time and time again. So uh, I, 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 I think in the virtual world, that the opportunity is there to stagger things a little bit further apart. I don't know what that leads to administratively for you guys. I'm not in your end. I'm not structuring all this, but uh, uh, to be stacked on top of one another, I, I, I think looking forward, maybe space things out so that either we have minutes or draft minutes so that we can get uh, some input. input. We are the stakeholders you rely on the science science and statistical committee for for the scientific aspect you rely on the ap for the uh, uh the stakeholders and the the, the hands-on boots on the deck participants to uh inform you so i think this is a genuine request an important request and like i say in my seven plus years on the ap i've i i've i've, I've uh, questioned this throughout that uh, whole time series. So I ask that you consider this and 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 make this uh, move this forward so that uh, everybody benefits, in, including the council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Are there any questions from council members? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. I I wonder if you can provide some context if you feel like this has been an increased issue or problem for the AP since we started doing virtual meetings, or this is something you'd identify as an issue, you know, all the time, like, for instance, when we're back in person. And also my second question, I'll just get it in there, is whether, you know, how important is it that it's an SSC member coming to you, or, or is it really the intent to understand the SSC minutes or report resulting from an issue as opposed to a member presenting it? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Ms. Kimball. Uh, I think this has been an ongoing issue. Like I said, in, in, in my seven plus years on the AP, uh, I've run into this time and time again. We're we're sitting on the AP and 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 we're looking to update on the old. I legislate on the uh, for the first three years. I I I did the hard copies. We had the big binder, and we didn't always have the. Uh, SSC minutes, which for the best part directs the AP and directs the councils on many different issues. So, uh, I I think it's an ongoing issue. And if, if if you would please remind me your second question, I didn't get a chance to write it down. Just I guess, Patty, how important it was that the motion actually specifies an SSC member coming to present to the AP. 
if that's untenable, is, is that how important is that? Or is it more important that you just understand what the SSC minutes or report might say prior to specific action? Uh, thank you, Ms. Kimball, through the chair. In, in regards to that, uh, there seemed to be a slight hesitation from the member staff to report out on SSC minutes. So I think this is what is leading up to this. Uh, in part that, and in part that we had an AP member report out on the deliberations of the SSC, which I, I don't think is appropriate. And and so if staff's not comfortable, then I think that uh, a member of the SSC, and, 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 and I, I know it's challenging, but I think the best approach to it in the virtual world is to maybe space the uh, meetings may be uh, an additional day apart, but 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 the optimal solution to this is is to have SSC minutes available. That's that's what I'm getting at. Is if the AP has the SSC minutes, uh, in, in 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 the absence of the ability to have an SSC member report out, then that that probably would 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 suffice. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Additional questions for Mr. O'Donnell? All right. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Yeah, thank you. We've been going for a, a couple of hours here. I think we probably ought to take a, a quick break. Um, let's come back at, at three o'clock Alaska time and continue with uh, public testimony and then we can take an additional break prior to, prior to action if, uh, if we need it. We'll come back at three o'clock Alaska time.
Council, please come back to order. We are ready to continue with our public testimony on staff tasking. Uh, next up to testify is Heather Mann. Following this man is Matteo Pasadon and Heather McCarty and then Julie Bonney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. My name is Heather Mann and I represent the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. Um, I wanted to take a minute first to thank the council staff for continuing to do really just a tremendous job pulling off these uh, virtual meetings. I know it's a lot of work. I also wanted to thank NIMS leadership and staff and council members. Um, really thank everybody for their continued dedication and perseverance through um, what are really challenging times. Um, your efforts really are um, appreciated and don't go unnoticed. It's, it's a big job. Um, M2C represents 29 trawl catcher vessels. Many are dependent on Gulf trawl fisheries completely or as a major part of their annual fishing strategy. Um, I want to lend support to the comments made by Mike Alfieri earlier, uh, both his oral and written comments. Uh, we truly are well overdue in getting some rational management in the Gulf. Along those lines, I would repeat a comment I provided last year, asking the council to carefully consider what you place on future agendas and be thoughtful in terms of your available bandwidth as you balance um, the urgency of some issues and allow space on future agendas to be able to take on dealing with things like uh, the Gulf trawl fishery. Um, you know, we continue to have a focus across uh, all fisheries on reducing bycatch to the extent practicable. Um, and in my mind, it really is a challenge to take a piecemeal approach and focus on bycatch reductions without also providing the fleet with the tools that they need to be successful at additional bycatch minimization and avoidance. So I hope you keep these thoughts in mind uh, as you set future agendas. Um, and I often recall the promise made several councils ago uh, to once and for all address the, the issues um, in the Gulf and I hope we can get there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I really had planned on talking about was uh, lending MTC strong support for the request contained uh, in the written public comment submitted by Alaska Groundfish Data Bank. Uh, you mentioned that Julie will be testifying shortly and she can provide uh, more details but the request is seeking an emergency rule uh, relative to the rockfish program. I believe the letter does a good job of providing the rationale for why this request meets uh, the criteria that's necessary uh, to move forward with the emergency rule. And I think not just in this fishery, but as you've heard in other fisheries, um, the situation many are facing is just really unprecedented. Uh, in this particular case, the flatfish fishery, um, in the Gulf, there isn't one. Uh, and no spring shoreside market hasn't occurred here um, in this way, I think for about 20 years. Uh, this is a direct result of seafood tariffs and COVID-19 complications. You know, it's my belief that that situation alone uh, meets the unforeseen circumstances that emergency relief criteria require uh, and which action could help address. Uh, no spring shoreside market leaves a huge hole uh, in the processing sector in Kodiak in April. Um, what we've seen occurring in the Bering Sea, excuse me. I apologize, Ms. Mann. That was another uh, member of the public's phone. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> giving feedback. Continue. Okay. So what we've been seeing uh, occurring in the Bering Sea, the severe uncertainty and disruption with vessels and processing plants um, doing, due to the pandemic um, is even evolved since we, uh, since Julie submitted the letter. Um, again, it's just unprecedented challenges. I represent several boats that are in the Bering Sea right now. The captains or crew are some of the most nervous I've seen not because of weather or for the race for cod, um, but not knowing if they're gonna have a market next week or be on their way <laughs> delivering and have uh, a plant shut down. Um, so the action that the letter that Julie wrote is asking for would simply move the start date one month forward to help fill that unanticipated processing gap and give fishermen another month to catch their fish. Again, as we're seeing in the Bering Sea, on any day, um, there can be a significant disruption 
you know, as a result of an innocent cough um, that begins a cascade of testing and quarantining and all sorts of activities that disrupt fishing and processing. Um, in this case, I think the council can provide a small bit of additional flexibility through the emergency rule recommendation. And I think it's well justified under section 305 of the Magnuson Act. Um, and it would provide a large benefit to the Kodiak trawl industry. Um, uh, I do recognize and know that NIMS is, uh, you know, working um, at a difficult time in their capacity. And this is a workload for NIMS. But I do believe the benefit of the action will provide um, direct economic benefit to fishing businesses, and that's worth setting aside some other work. And I hope you'll agree with me and make that recommendation to NIMS that they provide some emergency relief to Kodiak by moving the season start date for the Rockfish program earlier uh, by one month uh, to start on April 1st. And I'd be happy, uh, Mr. Chairman, council members, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mann. Are there any questions? Don't see any. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mateo Pasadon and Heather McCarty. Hello. Hello, this is me? Heather. Mateo, hi. Heather here. Yes. All right. You're so you start, Heather. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing us to get up here together in a virtual sense. Um, I'm Heather McCarty. I'm speaking on behalf of Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association, and Mateo is speaking on behalf of the City of St. Paul. Um, we'd like to address quickly a couple of um, items that have come up as a result of the uh, C4 agenda item, Crab PSC as well as the agenda item C5, the crab planting report. Um, so they have to do with crab. And then following that, we'd also like to address the halibut emergency action request um, for which we wrote support letters. Uh, first, um, I'd like to address a couple of recommendations that were made by the SSC. And they were made by the SSC and by the crab plan team. Um, you'll find them in both of their minutes. And in the SSC minutes, you find quite a bit of detail as to what they recommend to um, take their understanding of the um, abundance-based management of crab further. Um, they asked, uh, they recommended that the council initiate two white papers. Uh, the first one, um, a white paper that provides information needed to align the current PSC management with overall stock trends and management quantities or management recommendations from the stock assessments, and to develop methods to improve consistency between the current PSC stair step management and overall stock trends. The second white paper that, will, that was recommended by both the SSC and your crab plan team um, would be providing information on the regulatory intent and the historical methods used to calculate abundances associated with the PSC stair step procedures to better inform decisions about the abundance calculations for PSC limits. We are particularly interested in making sure these um, abundance-based stair-step uh, frameworks work properly because, as you know, we are asking for not a, exactly the same, but a similar framework for use in halibut ABM um, for bycatch management of halibut. Um, Mateo will address uh, the second uh, item. All right, hey, yes. um, I'm here. My comments are basically a follow-up of the comments I made yesterday on, on crab ESC. Uh, it, it is clear that we have a, a problem with the crab fisheries. The question is what, what do we do? What does the council do that is actually responsive to the national standards on, on conserving the resource, making making decisions based on the base available science, uh, you know, ensuring all, that allocations are, are are equitable among directed and bycatch fishermen, ensuring that communities sustained participation is protected. In this case, the crab communities, and uh, you know, reducing bycatch to the extent practicable. So, going forward, uh, we think that one area to begin to explore seriously is the central fish habitat angle. It is clear that notwithstanding the many crab protected areas 
several crab fisheries are declining or are closed. It doesn't mean that these areas, which have been in place for decades, haven't worked. It could mean that climate change and ocean, ocean acidification, along with, with stresses on the stocks of fishing activity, may have had a role in these declines. Who knows? But it is clear from the staff and scientists' presentations that a number of stocks are moving north or into deeper water, seeking colder waters. If so, shouldn't fisheries management be looking at new crab protected areas further north, including, who knows, potential marine corridors to provide these migrating species with maneuvering space they need to adapt to the new climate and their new or fluctuating habitats. Therefore, we would recommend that the council ask for an update in April under the EFH annual review on available research or additional information needed to inform future council action on spatial and or temporal, temporal management for the BSA crabs, BSAI crab stocks. It would be really interesting to feed into this effort if it's right enough, the work that the council is pursuing on LKTK and climate change, which would be responsive not only to the existing national standards, but to the various executive orders by the new president on climate change, science, and habitat protection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, finally, uh, we'd like to add our support for um, the council's work on emergency uh, actions to allow transfer of halibut and sablefish IFQ, and also on the accompanying request to waive vessel caps in area four A, B, C, D, and E. Um, we draw your attention to our pretty extensive letters on, on those subjects that were submitted to the council and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions from council members? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. McCarty, I think at the beginning of your testimony, you when you were speaking about crab, you mentioned the SSC recommended two white papers uh, related to crab PSC, and um, that is not quite my recollection. So I wondered if you could um, maybe elaborate a little bit on um, what papers you were referring to, please. Um, certainly, uh, thanks for the question. Ms. Baker, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I wish I'd written down the page numbers and I can't go back right now. <laughs> My hands are full. Uh, so um, there were two separate recommendations for white papers. The first one, um, it, it, and I have the quote from the SSC minutes um, that the SSC recognizes that aligning current PSC management with overall stock trends and management quantities will require considerable time and development. And it, it did say that they're not asking for these things to happen before final action on um, agenda item uh, C4. Um, but they said uh, instead that they recommended a white paper be, be prepared in response to the CPT review of this agenda item, which was C4. And that appeared under the C5 agenda item, which is the CPT report as a first step. Um, it said that the white paper would provide information on current and past methods and then explore flexibility under current regulations for changing the PSC calculation methods in the future if necessary. Um, and then the second one uh, is later on in the SSC discussion and it says, during the SSC discussion, it was noted that multiple methods to calculate crab abundance for the PSC stair step policy likely exist. Um, they wanted to better understand the historical framework associated with the method. It, uh, it did acknowledge that there was quite a, a good summary of how those methods were developed for the three species. I believe one, um, two of them came from uh, industry negotiations, as it was described, the SSC was asking for further information about what the basis for that uh, agreement was. And they wanted a more detailed description of the historical calculation methods. Um, they re recommended a white paper here. This is the second white paper, be prepared, that provides information on the regulatory intent and historical methods, et cetera. And it, as part of that, 
white paper, they they asked for um, whether the PSC stair step could be defined as a specific component of the crab population. For example, the mature male biomass, and they pointed out that they're different amongst the different species. And I'm sorry, I don't have the page numbers, but that's the best I can do to describe the two separate white papers that I um, saw in the SSC minutes. I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll um, do a little more follow-up on that. I appreciate the response. Thank you. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am um, specific to um, Mr. Pavlodon's testimony on EFH. I do recognize we have um, a consultation on projects that NIMS provides EFH information on in April and, and your request specifically, could you repeat what your request was regarding EFH? Yeah, uh, that the council asked for an update from staff in April under the EFH annual review on, on available research and or additional information needed to inform future council action on, on spatial and or temporal, temporal management for the VSA I crab stocks. And and that that's the, the not nuts and bolts of the request. And but you know, I, I think given the given the moment we, we are in, uh, you know, broadly speaking, I, I added to that, I think it would be really interesting to feed into this effort if it's ripe enough, the work that the council is pursuing on, on LKTK and climate change, uh, which would you know be responsive not only to the national standards but to the various executive orders that have been signed in the past few weeks. Thank you. Any additional questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Next up is Julie Bonney, then Jamie Gowen, and then last up, or then Chris Woodley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the council, for the record, my name is Julie Bonney. I own the business Alaska Groundfish Data Bank. AGDB is the inner uh, co-op manager for the Shoreside Rockfish Cooperative and is also the co-op manager for all the six individual cooperatives. Um, AGDB has submitted a comment letter, as Heather Mann pointed out, for staff tasking agenda requesting that the council ask NIMS to promulgate an emergency rule to change the Rockfish Program fishery start date from May 1 to April 1. All six shoreside cooperatives support opening the fishery earlier this year. We believe an emergency exists due to unforeseen circumstances that meet the economic, social, public health emergencies components of the rule criteria. Presently, there is de minimis to no shoreside markets for flatfish this spring, a first in at least um, 20 years in my history. This creates a large Kodiak community processing gap for the month of April, the traditional arrow to flounder fishing month. The poor flatfish market is unforeseen result of seafood tariffs and COVID-19. Opening the rockfish fishery a month earlier will allow rockfish deliveries to partially fill this processing void. Recent news reports of COVID outbreaks in Accutan and Unalaska shuttered three lar of the very large processing plants in the Bering Sea and has the entire industry on edge. These plant shutdowns this year were unforeseen. The processing sector and the state of Alaska has built strict mitigation measures over the last year to prevent infections, yet even with these measures in place, the virus found its way in. Shuttering processing plants that restrict processing capacity could occur in Kodiak and have a profound effect. In the AGDB comment letter, there's a figure that shows rockfish landings by week from 2016 to 2020. 
This figure demonstrates that actual processing days is restrictive once processing needs for salmon fisheries is considered. As the figure shows, little to no rockfish landing occurred during the months of July and August Adding the month of April to the rockfish fishing season will provide additional flexibility to participants. Due to economic hardships this year, which I would say is the worst that I can remember, the last thing I want to see is participants having to choose between revenue streams due to loss of processing days. Everyone needs to capture their traditional business plan. I've discussed the shoreside ER request with several of the CP rockfish participants and they are supportive of our efforts. All parties agree that each sector, sector can prosecute their fishery as they see fit. Each sector has their individual bycatch limits for both halibut and Chinook salmon and each individual participant can, participant can start their fishery when it makes sense based on the season opening date. I would also note that I discussed moving the rockfish season date to April 1 with one of the rockfish assessment authors and he did not have a concern with the change. In these pre unprecedented pandemic times, the fishing industry needs more flexibility in their efforts to prosecute the fisheries and lengthen them this season with an earlier date will certainly help us. Thank you and I'm open for any questions, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Bonnie. Mr. Down. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bonnie. Um, my, my question is, is twofold. So one, um, I, I think, you know, I, I was just looking back through that the AP motions and stuff, this, this didn't seem to come up with the AP. So I guess you could address that as to, as to whether I'm missing something or, or whether this was just something that came together in the last couple of days that folks decided was a, a good idea why it wasn't brought to the AP for their input. And and secondly, you mentioned that the people you've talked to that are in the rockfish sector that are in favor of this, is, is there any opposition to this that you know of that, that, that these dates that would infringe on other people's uh, ability to be on the same grounds at the same time or other reasons that, that you can think of? Sure. Um to the chair, um, Mr. Downs, thanks for the questions. So the, to, to address your first question about we, why we did not bring this up at the advisory panel, um, we <laughs> have been scrambling to get uh, our fisheries off the dock here in Kodiak and there's been a heavy lift with the Pollock fisheries. So um, it was decided that the best thing to do since there's been quite a bit of discussion about the start date was to go ahead and submit a letter under staff tasking with the idea that we would have a full-blown inter co-op meeting to you know make sure that we had consensus. So actually the inter co-op meeting happened after the AP adjourned and so that's why we did not um, bring it up at the advisory panel. We wanted to make sure we had consensus before we brought it before the council with the idea that if we did not, we could have withdrawn it um, during the staff tasking. In terms of your question with uh, moving the date, uh, every participant that I've talked to um, is in favor of that. In terms of Shoreside, obviously we have the six co-ops, all six co-op presidents voted in favor of um, the emergency rule request at our inner co-op meeting. And then also I floated the balloon with several of the CP companies just to make sure that they were okay with our request. And we all agreed that for the, from their um, part of the pond, um, they're protected and they can do what they want, but giving us the flexibility to change things a bit on our side made sense. So I hope I addressed your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Bonnie. Yeah. Dr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bonnie, for the testimony. That that's good information. Uh, answering Mr. Down's question, I think you spoke to all the groundfish people, but what about other fisheries? I, I know salmon isn't going big time on on April one, but had, did you speak to some of them as well? Um, through the through the chair and Mr. Balsinger, I did not. Um, though I would say that the processors that are all 
rockfish processors are also salmon processors, and those processors wanted to have the maximum flexibility to do both. Thank you very much. Just checking all the boxes. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Further questions for Ms. Barney? And thank you for your testimony. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is Jamie Gowen, then Chris Woodley, and then Stephen Rhodes. Good afternoon, Chairman, Canadian, and Council members. I'm Jamie Gowen with Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers. We represent the majority of harvesters fishing for king snow and bared eye crab in the Bering Sea. I'm testifying under staff tasking now that I've had more time to reflect on yesterday's question asked under C4 on crab PSC about what priorities we see as an industry, particularly to help depressed crab stocks. First and foremost are measures to proactively help slow the decline of Bristol Bay Red King crab, which the council has been advised by its scientists last October is approaching an overfish status. We heard in the staff presentation under Crab PSC that rebuilding plans require consideration of three elements. So it's a three-legged stool. The first element is the harvest strategy. And for crab, that's the purview of the state and board of fish, not the council. The second leg of the stool is bycatch control measures. For our directed fishery, our eastern bearing our eastern bear dive fishery was closed this year in part to reduce Bristol Bay red king crab bycatch. So our directed fishery is taking bycatch control measures. We have some promising gear design work with fixed gear sectors to keep crab out of pots. And we heard yesterday from all the sectors that we've got voluntary hotspot reporting and moving off of red king crab. So that leaves us with the PSC limit tool for our bycatch control. I think the SSC suggested white papers are important to address issues raised by both the CPT and SSC and the initial review analysis about the inconsistencies in PSC limit management approaches, whether it correlates with abundance, what are the appropriate source numbers, and how to set meaningful PSC limits that incentivize avoiding crab bycatch. While those white papers are important and needed to create effective PSC limit management for crab, we recommend they should be addressed as time allows. So that takes me to the third leg of the rebuilding plan stool, and one where I think we could be more proactive in our work, and that's the habitat protection measures. So given that Bristol Bay Red King crab is approaching an overfish status, and given the EFH work between 2012 and 2017 that flagged several concerns and protections for Bristol Bay Red King crab that have not yet been addressed, we recommend that you expedite EFH considerations for Bristol Bay Red King crab, which are due to start in 2022, by starting now to update the information and research since 2017 EFH review. I note the 2012 discussion paper on Red King crab EFH on page 35 laid out specific and detailed recommendations to the council to protect female Red King crab, to protect spawning grounds and molting crab. In addition, the CPT's top five research priorities highlighted at this meeting could tie in with this request and looking for more information on climate, habitat, and life stages for crab, which they note in their research priorities. I think a habitat focus and adaptive spatial temporal management is more important now than ever for red king crab, given its approaching overfish status a status that is especially troubling because Alaska's king crab stocks show little resilience and are difficult to build back from low levels. A habitat focus and adaptive spatial temporal management is also important given change in, changing ocean and climate conditions and could be informed by the FEP, Ecosystem Committee, and Climate Change Task Force work. Crab stocks that may have been more resilient to fishing impacts before and as previously assessed under EFH may be less so now under changing ecosystems, changing climate, and ocean acidification. And we need to proactively consider areas that help build their resilience. In closing, we recommend proactive actions to help slow the decline of Bristol Bay Red King crab, which is approaching an overfish status. To that end, we recommend the highest priority actions for BSAI crab stocks in the council arena, focus on adaptive spatial temporal management, building on work and recommendations highlighted in recent EFH work and with a priority on Red King crab to build more resilient crab stocks in the face of climate change and ongoing fishing impacts. 
And then as time allows, we encourage forward progress on the issues flagged by the CPT and SSC, including white papers to improve CRAB PSC limit management. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Questions from council members? Great, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Chris Woodley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to pass. All right, thank you, Mr. Woodley. All right, last up will be Stephen Rhodes. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Good afternoon, we can. Uh, Chairman Kinneen, members of the council, thanks for letting me speak once again. Um, I would like to speak about the changes possible if you move forward with the temporary transfer of IFQ this year. Uh, in speaking with fishermen and RAM and other processors, um, if you move forward, it would be great if you remove the notary requirement. Uh, the notary requirement is never required on a medical transfer, and it is on this transfer. And there was an awful lot of shipping paperwork back and forth across the state and delays that that could be solved by removing that. And I'd also like to ask you to consider using the hired master function at RAM instead of the transfer function. That the system at RAM is as old as IFQs and was taxed really hard, uh, both staff and infrastructure on the way that these transfers were put through. They weren't reversible, they weren't flexible, um, at the end of the year, the fishermen taxes were more confusing. It all got lumped together on one permit. And I'm asking to consider the hired master. It retains the original permit number for both the quota owner and for documentation for the processor and the fisherman. These are just a, a few tweaks. If you move forward with that action, I think these would be great to be considered. Thank you. Are there any questions? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rhodes, for your testimony. And I have a question about the second request that you made. And I'm, I'm going from memory here on the hired master regulations, so kind of winging it. But are, are you um, making the recommendation that we use the hired master? provision of the IFQ program instead of temporary transfers with the understanding, as I recall, there are also regulations that require uh, someone to own uh, some portion of a vessel for the past year to be eligible to hire a master under the current regulations. So would you be asking for those regulations to be waived as well if this is an emergency type rule? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Baker, thank you for that. Um, the exact tools in RAM are a little bit uh, hard for me to understand, but an A share gets a hired master. It is leasable. Um, you can lease it to multiple people. It's reversible. Both the owner and the harvester can view the activity from their own eFish logins, and it's very clean. The hired master under the 1220 rule functions the same way, but has a lot more uh, requirements that would need to be waived. And I don't know if this is a, a different provision you would have to push through, but the functionality of the transfer was really challenging last year. And I think if it mirrored either the A shares or the hired master um, with the 2020 rule would be a lot cleaner for everyone involved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one follow-up, if I might. And, and so I uh, appreciate that response. And my second question might be kind of difficult, but um, so that being the case, uh, where is the trade-off between getting a rule through quickly that um, NIPS has done and uh, we know what the regulations are under an expedited timeline and 
how important is that versus making the changes that you're requesting if it holds things up a little bit or potentially jeopardizes uh, getting it through on an expedited basis? Uh, through the chair, Ms. Baker, I think that all the fishermen uh, would like it done as quick as possible. And this would be a, a secondary request both for the staff at RAM and for the, uh, the winter paperwork that follows. And I don't know the, uh, the database over there or the, uh, the laws are usually more difficult than the database, but you know, the field that says can be leased, yes or no, if for the year, all shares were, could be leased, even though it's a, uh, it's a terrible word for the uh, owner on board program. But I think that if all shares were treated like a shares, except for freezing this year, that would be the uh, optimum. But uh, I think expediency is more important to the fishermen. Thank you, that's helpful. No more questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Ms. Baker. Further questions for Mr. Rhodes? Thank you for your testimony. All right, with that, uh, public comment is concluded. Let's go ahead and um, take a break until 3.50 Alaska time, collect our thoughts, come back and, uh, and wrap this up. Hold on, see you at 3.50 Alaska time. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm not sure that we talked about Julie Barnes thing.
Council, please come back to order. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we have concluded with public comment on staff tasking and are ready to move into whatever action the council would like to take. Um, so I can kind of start walking on the, the list that I have and then I know there's going to be um, others as well that I probably missed. So um, there was some discussion about uh, potentially an additional member on the climate change task force wish to provide any direction there. Ms. Kimball? I was waiting for Mr. Twight, Mr. Chair, but I'll just take it. And I, I think that was a recommendation from the Ecosystem Committee to potentially solicit and add one uh, member. And um, I think they explained it fairly well. Someone in, you know, with local knowledge or works in the industry to be part of that task force. So if the council thought that was a good idea, I would hope you could solicit nominations for that position. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Um, Mr. Twight? <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. And sorry, Ms. Kimball, I'm just super slow on the, um, the draw. Um, the only thing I would add to what Ms. Kimball said was just, um, and, and that uh, after you and the executive director have had an opportunity to review, um, if you could just go ahead and make an appointment too, uh, I think that would be useful. Other council members? Mr. Cross. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just so those two aren't alone, I I, uh, I support this also. All right, thank you, Mr. Cross. Um, sounds like that is turning into the will of the council, unless uh, any other council members wish to provide anything counter to that. I think we have a plan. Hey, great, thank you. Uh, we also discussed a, uh, uh, a letter on the emergency order that, that 30 by 30 and, and uh, emergency order uh, that was discussed at the, under the legislative committee, uh, Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm, other council members may want to weigh in on, on this as well, but I, I do think it'll be appropriate for the council to send its own letter on this in addition to um, letter that uh, the um, council EDs are working on that would be coming from the CCC. Uh, I, I, obviously, they both need to be, the 
the council letter needs to support whatever's in the CCC letter, but I think we can probably go a little further in some areas to describe um, <coughs> both um, how we view the work we've done to date as um, addressing uh, what we think a lot of the spirit of the EEO is and point out in cases where we think the letter of the EEO may um, actually make it more difficult to achieve what we think the real objectives of the EEO are, uh, that by interpreting some of those things too narrowly, uh, we're missing, obviously, we're missing opportunities to protect ecosystem diversity while still um, supporting sustainable fisheries. And, and again, just emphasizing the, um, the role of councils, the importance of the role of the councils in this, uh, and that um, <laughs> we're the appropriate forum to be working out a lot of these balance issues. Thank you, Mr. Clay. I think that sounds appropriate. Like the other council members, Dr. Balsiger. Dr. Balsiger, I think you're on mute. It looks like you're perhaps muted. There you go. Yeah, I, I was. I was seeing during the, the time out and the system shut me off. So thanks for turning it back on. So I agree with Mr. Twight. Uh, I think it's a, an appropriate response. Um, we hear our fisheries service head, uh, leaders in DC uh, speaking with NOAA almost on a daily basis, uh, clarifying what all of the EOs and in particular the 30 by 30 refers to. So as we hear that, we'll communicate with that with you. But I, I agree with Mr. Twight's suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Balsberg. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I just want to express my agreement. I think the uh, council should have a strong role in development uh, should that 30 by 30 go forward. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Marks. Other council members? Do other else that uh, give you enough of a framework? Okay, great. This does, Mr. Chairman. Perfect. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about the SSC risk table and the signal that uh, council may want to pick up on that. Mr. Twight. Mr. Chair, in this case, I do have a one sentence motion that um, staff has, uh, hopefully has. <laughs> um, and it's all about Norton Sound Red King Crab. Um, <laughs> I'll start reading it. Um, the council requests the opportunity to review the written report, including SSC comments and recommendations from the recent SSC risk table workshop before any changes are implemented to the process of developing and using risk tables. And with a second, I can speak to the motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Cross. Mr. Twight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think I need to um, delve very deeply into this as this is an issue uh, we discussed during the SSC report itself uh, and then um, <coughs> a little bit previously in staff testing. Uh, but um, we, we understand the importance of the risk tables. Uh, to our management now as, as one of several tools for adjusting uh, allow SSC recommendations concerning um, uh, allowable catch levels. And uh, that while we welcome um, uh, continued changes to those, in several cases we pointed out where we think changes are important. And so, so we certainly welcome the workshop that was held. Uh, it's just, it's critical critically important that we both understand any proposed changes and have an opportunity to make suggestions where we think those proposed changes may be <laughs> inconsistent with what we're looking for from the risk tables. And this would give us that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Twight. <clears throat> Are there any questions on the motion? Any 
any amendments to the motion? I had I had my hand up, Mr. Okay. Chairman. All right. Sorry. Mr. Cross. So so uh, Mr. Mr. Twight, thank you for the motion. I, I guess my question is that um, it doesn't say in in the in the uh, motion, but I'm assuming that staff will uh, make sure that the SSC uh, knows that we've made this motion and and are it, it's uh, important that they understand that before they move forward with a lot of things that this come back to the to the council. Uh, Mr. Cross, I agree with you and I, I'm confident that's the sort of thing our staff does very well. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay. Amendments to the motion? Or comments on the motion? any comments so I think we are ready to vote in the opposition of the motion no opposition and the motion passes unanimously thank you mr. Twight okay, there was also flagged uh, I guess it's part of the, the C1 discussion from the other day of potentially additional monitoring requirements mr. down did you wish to address that Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I, I've, I've provided a motion to staff, which they'll, they'll bring up here on the screen. I'll just hold off until that, that motion is posted. It's relatively short, but uh, uh, the council recommends NMFS not proceed with additional monitoring requirements for the ESA ICP pot cod sector until such time as the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council recommends proceeding with additional monitoring requirements for this sector. And with a second, I'll speak to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Down. Is there a second? Second, Nicole. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Down. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this uh, motion was a uh, natural progression from our C1 agenda item. Uh, uh, council members will recall uh, we spent a couple years on that agenda item uh, resulting in a no action alternative leaving the, the fleet with uh, with with little um, to uh, to no relief uh, from the council uh, after the motion we'd heard from uh, the National Marine Fishery Service uh, staff representative that uh, they, they intended to move forward with looking at additional monitoring requirements for that sector, which was a part of the analysis. The additional requirements are things like lead level two observers, um, uh, which uh, may not be a good idea, but if their lead level two observers are short and to come by. And this fleet is actually a very small fleet, but is providing a large percentage of fixed gear lead level two observers to the fleet that really desperately needs these now. And uh, because uh, the lead level two requirements are a prerequisite number of sets, this fleet is a fleet that said that sets an awful lot of uh, uh, um, gear, short strings. So they get the, a person to become a lead level two fairly rapidly by going on one of these boats. Uh, um, we heard in public testimony that a pre-cruise uh, notification of uh, uh, meeting um, that they, the, the one person we heard from said they would voluntarily do that, that, that they don't need a requirement for that. So really the big ones here are the requirement for uh, an observer station. We heard from one of the representatives that their vessel is, is the small, two, two of these vessels fish only 12 hours a day. Um, uh, and, and maybe there's there's more, but I know at least two of them that, that fish only 12 hours a day because of their size and the size of the, the crew that they have. They're not fishing a full day and, uh, and they just don't have room for an approved observer station. It's a footprint that just doesn't exist 
on uh, on at least a few of these boats. And the, the certified motion uh, compensated scale, I think the analysis indicated those were from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. I've purchased those scales myself. Uh, many of them, I know uh, what the cost of those are, and uh, I don't know where they got the fifty thousand uh, dollar figure, but. I can tell you that years ago they were eighty thousand dollars, and I think they're a hundred thousand dollars now, and that still requires installation, and they're hugely expensive to maintain. The parts for these scales that you, you once you have it and they're required, you can't fish without it. So you have to carry almost an entire scale worth of spare parts. These are this a very expensive that would uh, uh, it'd be very onerous to, to even consider uh, for this fleet at this time. My thought is that why waste the time now going forward and looking at this? This is something that should be looked at perhaps when this fleet, uh, um, uh, when if the council goes down a path or this fleet finds some other way towards a voluntary cooperative or they get relief from the council in the way of being uh, picked up in the effort to rationalize uh, the sectors, the COD sectors in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Down. Mr. Cross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Down, for the motion. I, I uh, understand it. Um, I was wondering, Mr. Chairman, if we could hear from uh, NIMPS. I remember, I remember under C1, I believe it was, uh, Mr. Merrill uh, talked about that there were other ways. I, I just, I remember there was something NIMPS staff uh, or Mr. Balsinger could answer, but there was something them staff said they could work with uh, the fleet on something else. I, I'd like to hear uh, their res their uh, their response to this motion because I thought there was other things that they had in mind. But um, I, I leave that to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It might be uh, good to get a, a little refresh there, I, um, Dr. Balsiger, if you'd like to respond. Otherwise, I, I know we do have uh, Glenn Merrill on the, the line as well. Might be able to refresh our memories as to what he he briefed us on. We have a lot of sustainable fisheries people online, so I think Glenn would be the right person. Or they, the sustainable fisheries people have various expertise, so they can speak to it, please. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Glenn Merrill. Uh, just briefly on this issue, I think what we had discussed under the C1 agenda item is that we had identified that there are a number of challenges with the data that we have that's coming from this fleet. We identified the fact that we've had some substantial challenges with uh, being able to get reliable data from the fleet. We've had some challenges in terms of what that means for our management of this fleet because it is a relatively small allocation and errors on one side or the other can have some substantive impact on either closing the fishery early or resulting in uh, over harvesting the fisheries allocation, which then has to be compensated for uh, through other allocations to other participants and other fisheries. So our thought consistent with how we've handled these types of issues in the past is that we would begin a rulemaking process that would rely on us working with the affected industry to try and find solutions to address some of these challenges, come back to the council, have an opportunity for the council to get an overview of that particular effort. There'd be the normal proposed rule process that we would undertake as well, and then a final rule that we can implement. It really wouldn't be that much substantively different than the council initiating an action other than the fact that I think we have identified in the past that it has been helpful, both from a council staffing standpoint, as well as consistent with the role of the agency in ensuring adequate monitoring of our fisheries to entertain rulemaking that can address these issues. In terms of the specific issues that, that we are looking at moving forward on, I think a number of these are likely not to be terribly controversial. I think additional analysis may indicate that they're less of a concern to the fleet than indicated. There are some that are likely to be a more substantive concern. And I think, Mr. Chairman, if I may, we've, we've been fairly successful in the past in working with the fleet to try and find solutions to these complicated monitoring programs in the past. 
by ha having a dialogue back and forth with our managers and the affected fleet. So, for example, I think we've all heard some of the concerns about some of the smaller vessels in this fleet, the potential implications of uh, requiring an observer sampling station, what that might mean in terms of deck reconfiguration. I think that's definitely the type of thing that we can look at. Uh, I think what we've anticipated in the analysis would be looking at a platform motion comp compensated scale, which is different than perhaps some of the scales that um, are on other vessels. And I think the analysis noted that's about a seven to a ten thousand dollar cost. Again, that's also the type of thing that maybe we could examine. Um, but I think additional analysis could be undertaken in consultation with other fishery participants, and we can provide the council with an opportunity to proceed with this process. I think taking no action um, would be problematic in the sense that we have identified some substantive data concerns with this fishery, and this would be an opportunity for us to begin that process of addressing them. All right, thank you, Mr. Merrill. Mr. Cron? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Um, so if we were to uh, not take any action on this motion and it went through with rulemaking, as you just stated, it would still have to come back to us at the council if, and if we thought the rulemaking was egregious or, or was, uh, was not appropriate, we could still do this motion at a later time if it didn't work out uh, properly. Is that my understanding? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cross, certainly the council could choose uh, at some later point to make this recommendation. Um, I think uh, we have provided that opportunity before. Uh, certainly we undertook a similar process with um, issues related to the freezer long line fleet some of the lead level two requirements and the other monitoring provisions that we put in place. We had an opportunity for the council to see that information. I think that even before we went to a proposed rule so that the council understood where we were within that process. And then the council could choose, I suppose, at that point, you know, depending upon that progress to uh, exercise its authority to uh, provide some additional course of action if there were concerns. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, is the, is the maker of the motion, if I, if I could respond, or uh, would you rather need to, to hold off until we get the rest of the questions? Uh, Mr. Dunn, uh, go ahead and respond. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to be clear. I should have made this clear in the rationale of the motion. Nothing in this motion prevents uh, National Marine Fisheries Service from moving forward with taking a look at some of these, what Mr. Merrill uh, um, as our substantial uh, um, data um, deficiencies in this in this fleet, I'm not aware of those. This is a fleet that had three vessels this year that fished for 12 days uh, in, in their A season. These are vessels that carry observers. We have observers on board, and these are vessels that are in touch with. Uh, with National Marine Fisheries Service in-season management almost on a daily basis because they've got to try to, hey, this is about what we caught. They, they encourage their observers to get the data in. Um, it just seems to me like, uh, you know, if National Marine Fisheries Service uh, did want it to, there's nothing in this motion that prevents them from looking at some of these things and bringing us some to some uh, something to council. My intention on my motion here is, to, is that, uh, to, is, is to determine whether the council uh, has an appetite for the kind of thing that, uh, that Glenn is is referring to here. It sounds like an awful lot of work for a fleet that has a tiny allocation and um, and uh, is already carrying observers and doing everything they can to just to, to add cost to them. So that that's that's my response. And I should have included uh, much of that in my the rationale for my motion. I appreciate you giving me that time. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, with your indulgence, uh, I, I have a question that's really better directed at Mr. Merrill or Dr. Balsiger than at Mr. Downs. Thanks. Um, 
Um, I, I understand the alternatives, and I, and I think um, there's some really useful flexibility and accountability there. The one um, issue, though, I haven't really heard discussed is if the agency moves forward on this um, through the approach that you're describing, Mr. Merrill, how does that affect the priorities um, for the other monitoring efforts that the FMAC have, have already set and, and sort of the the path forward that we sort of jointly agreed on with you as an agency for um, continuing to make changes to our monitoring. Uh, is, is there an opportunity? Do, doesn't the agencies work on this, this um, in, in some way affect their ability to work on the, the FMAC identified priorities? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Twight. You know, I think one thing is that we were probably anticipating that this would be encapsulated within this specific action. So to some extent, because of we, we have no action, we're still indicating a desire to proceed. We can look at our priorities. To be honest, I'm not sure if this is captured within that list of priorities or not. I think that there are probably some issues that are likely to have less of a crossover with FMA staff on this action than some of the other issues that are identified in the council's uh, monitoring and prioritization list. Overall, the agency will need to look at where this fits within the various priorities that we have. And we could do that probably a couple of ways. We can uh, come back with some additional discussion of where this issue fits from our perspective in terms of the existing list of monitoring and enforcement provisions. And then that would be something that um, you all would be aware of and we would have an opportunity to have additional dialogue in the future. But that would not necessarily preclude us from identifying this as an issue that we'd like to proceed with, understanding that there are other priorities. Thank you. Dr. Balsiger. I have not intended to raise my hand on this. Uh, I have some free, okay. free flowing electrons and make it go up and down and it will. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Kimball. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Mr. Down. I, I guess my questions might also be for the agency. Is there is there anything in this proposed motion that would you know, prohibit the agency from proceeding with its own rulemaking? under its own timing, regardless. This doesn't tie the hands of the agency if they really thought this was the most important monitoring issue that they could undertake, does it? This is, this is Jim Balsiger again. So we don't intend to surprise the council on this. Uh, I think that's part of the reason that Mr. Rell mentioned it in the B2 reports. And we will re-examine this. I think Glenn did say that he assumed that if this, if the, C1 had passed, it would have been part of the process of putting the whole amendment in place and working on it. Now that it hasn't go, got, did not pass and no action was taken, although that this wasn't my issue, uh, uh, it didn't pass. So I, I think that we can reconsider that and get back to the council as necessary. Yeah. We appreciate the FMAC prioritization thing. We appreciate the agency also has its own responsibilities. Let us look at this and I promise you, we won't surprise you on this before we find out what's going on. I appreciate that response through the chair, uh, Dr. Balsiger. And I, maybe, and maybe it's just semantics. Maybe if it if it had been led with, you know, we're going to work with the fleet and then consider what to initiate through a reg amendment instead of initiate a reg amendment and then we'll talk to the fleet. Maybe those are small things in terms of order, but I think it it made a big difference to the public that would be affected by this. So. I appreciate your response, and um, I also appreciate Mr. Down bringing this forward just to provide our concern with moving forward with a priority that may have um, value to the agency that we don't con haven't considered fully, um, but certainly has significant cost to the fleet and is not in line or added yet to our FMS priority that have to do with the observer program overall. So thanks. Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Down. I think this motion brought about an 
informative discussion. My question for you is after what you've already heard from Mr. Baltimore and Mr. Merrill, is there any reason to be considering this motion? If we know they're not gonna uh, surprise the council, that anything they suggest that they're gonna do is gonna be brought back for a council review, then does this motion really do anything after we've had this discussion and you know what you know now? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mesro. Um, I, I'm not sure I, I've heard anything that would compel me to, to withdraw this motion. I think it's, I think it's, it's quite clear. I, I think I, either the council has an appetite to, to take something like this for a small fleet to look at these things that, that I don't believe really fit in any kind of priorities that I've heard of the council or the, uh, the staff. And, and, and like I said, I, we, we've seen the data, you know, there, there isn't uh, overages in this fleet. This isn't a fleet that's overfishing. This is a, it's a very, you know, that these, this is a fleet with observers. I, I think it's good for, it would be good for the council to send a message that there's other priorities. Why don't we look at doing something else? If we see a good reason to, to move forward with uh, any kind of rulemaking or anything, um, they can present that to the council, yes, but it, it would be, uh, um, this would let them know, we don't want them to send a pretty clear message. We don't want them to proceed with rulemaking until the council uh, recommends that. I think that's a little, maybe a little different, uh, nuanced difference in, what we heard from Dr. Balsinger and Glenn and uh, what this motion's intention is. I think the motion is much more clear. Mr. Clay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Downs, sort of following up on Mr. Mesro's question, as I read the language of the motion right now, I would view it as, um, putting the council on record that we don't want NIMS to make changes to uh, how the data, the monitoring data get transferred to the shore, to, to NIMS um, and any of the requirements that affect any part of the current monitoring program. Um, I, I, would, I would read it as basically NIMS, the council's requesting that NIMS bring anything, any changes to the requirements not just those new ones that you were targeting, but uh, at least the way I read this is um, they'd have to bring almost everything to us to, um, for our recommendation um, if they were actually to follow that. And as Ms. Kimball's question pointed out, uh, the, the, this isn't binding on them, but certainly as Dr. Balsiger replied, they, they, they want to work with us. And so this would essentially be, uh, at least the way I view this wording is it would be covering the entire breadth of the current monitoring program. Is, is that really what you've intended here? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Twight. I was quite clear on this, the rationale for my motion. I, 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 I'd, I'd referenced the table 3.43 in the document, but there were four items that they, that they looked at. These were the only four items that we discussed at this meeting. Those were the, the flow scale, the lead level two uh, observers, um, the pre-cruise meeting and the uh, observer station, those, those four. This, this, is, this doesn't prevent anything to do with any other uh, items. And, and I, I certainly don't read this motion as, as doing that. This is about adding any of those additional four without the council's recommendation that they proceed down that path, let's save us some time and some energy and, uh, and focus on, on things that might be more important than additional requirements for a, uh, a small fleet that's fishing for less than two weeks a season. Additional questions on the motion? Sure. How about any amendments to the motion? Comments on the motion. Mr. 
Mr. Twight. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I'm at this point reluctant to support the motion, not because I don't agree with the basic sentiment, um, but I, I think two things for me came out of this um, discussion. One is the agencies indicated uh, their view of a path forward. And I, I think the level of council engagement and, and the opportunities for industry to interact with the agency on the path that they've described are, um, I think, um, address the, the spirit of this request quite well and give the council plenty of opportunity to sort of signal if we're concerned about priorities, uh, conflicting priorities, we have that opportunity to work that out. Um, I, I think that's there. I appreciate the agency putting that forward. Uh, secondly, I, I've um, also heard that uh, it's not binding on the agency and I prefer not to act as if we're binding them when we're really not. Um, that strikes me as, as sort of poor policy. And then finally, I, I am somewhat worried about the wording, but I'm in no position to try to um, uh, suggest some alternative wording. So I'm, I'm, I, I agree with the sentiment. I, I agree with the rationale, but I, I don't agree with the, uh, this particular vehicle. Thank you, Mr. Clayton, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll, I have similar thoughts to Mr. Twight. I, again, I understand the spirit of this motion, but I guess what I read pretty clearly in the C1 analysis was that in-season managers are having trouble getting reliable data from this fishery. And to me, um, that is, that's a problem. And so I, I don't think it's appropriate uh, to sort of substitute the judgment uh, of this council for those types of in-season management issues that we rely on the agency uh, to carry out. And so I, I heard Mr. Downs' rationale, but again, the words are important and, and the actual effect of this, which I agree with Mr. Twight, I heard that it doesn't bind the agency at all. And I agree with Mr. Twight a, a reasonable path was laid out consistent with previous practice at this council. And so I just, uh, for those reasons, I, I, I can't support this. Thank you, Ms. Baker, Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Down. I, I, I kind of echo what, what others have said. I, I agree with what, what you're trying to do. Uh, and I wish I had more time to think of a way to, um, you know, amend the motion to make it more palatable. But um, <clears throat> given um, I take Mr. Dr. Balsiger and, and Mr. Merrill at their word that, that uh, and the agency that they're going to they're going to look at this again uh, now that uh, the C4 didn't go through. Um, they're going to look at it, see if there's other ways to go about taking care of this. And and I as one don't and and they have stated that they think that there's um, reason for them to want to get more information to help manage that fishery. And I'm not going to second guess them. Um, I, I am totally sympathetic with what you want to do. And I think the agency is. So I think that they will work uh, with uh, the fleet, with you and the council to make this, uh, make this work. So uh, I won't support this motion. I, I totally support the concept. Uh, but I, I would rather let the, the agency come back to us and give us some suggestions so that uh, we can move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Cross. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Down, for the motion. I, I guess I align myself with the comments on the, you know, NIMS have stated the data challenges and errors. And I, I think it's important that, that, uh, we try to resolve those. I think that's important in all fisheries. I, I'm very sensitive. We, we've heard testimony from from uh, this group of folks, and and uh, the the costs are a concern for me. But I I would like to see some effort to to work this out and and uh, correct these data challenges and and hopefully look for a, a reasonable path forward. And, and I'm 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 going with the fact that. 
stated that we will see this again before anything goes forward. So I, I won't be supporting that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Merrick. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this is not uh, necessarily gaining a lot of support and I, I definitely understand and agree with a lot of what other council members have said. Um, at the same time, I just don't think this motion, whether it passes or not, changes anything. I, I think um, Mr. Down has put forward an intent and I think I'll support it. And I think in part because we have 19 different analytical tasks on our observer list. I know we didn't review that at this meeting, but we reviewed it in December and there's a lot of work there. And I don't quite understand how these new monitoring requirements on these few boats would fit into that list or supersede any of the things the council's already prioritized. So I think it's a little bit awkward what we're doing here. And I understand other council members process concerns, um, but I'll support Mr. Downs just for the priority list. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Additional comments? Mr. Witherell. Okay, calling the roll on requesting that NIMS not proceed with additional monitoring requirements for this sector. Mr. Down. Yes. Mr. Jensen. No. Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Marks. No. Mr. Mesereau. No. Mr. Twight. No. Dr. Balsiger. No. Ms. Baker. No. Ms. Campbell. Yes. Mr. Cross. No. Mr. Kinnean. Yes. Motion fails seven, four to seven. All right, thank you, Mr. Down. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, other council members? Uh, that that brought us to the, the list that, that I had, but we also heard a fair amount in public testimony, or you may have had other things you wanted to bring up. So look, look for hands for additional action. Dr. Balsiger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, uh, I appreciated the motions uh, and the discussions and all the dialogue around the Community Engagement Committee's report. Uh, quite a large uh, amount of public testimony on that. We've had a couple of calls uh, since that time, so I wanted to clarify just briefly, you know, uh, recognizing all the work that went into that, that you know, NOAA has specific responsibilities for the government-to-government -government tribal consultations. I spoke to it a little bit before, but but, you know, so at the Alaska Regional Office, we're assessing how we might more effectively engage with the Alaska Native tribal governments. So we have new guidance now, not in an EO, but in a presidential uh, memorandum from President Biden. And we have input from tribal stakeholders that we, we intend to use to strengthen the government-to-government -government relationships and to better implement collaboration and communication between the tribal entities. We, we welcome opportunities to engage with the Alaska Native tribes, with communities, and with organizations and discuss management concerns and particular coming council actions with them. So over the coming months, we will be working on ways to enhance tribal consultation processes. We look forward to briefing the council and the public on our progress at future meetings and to include the council processes where it is appropriate. So, so I may have blurred that when I spoke to it last time. I just wanted to, to state that. I could answer any questions, but I think it's a fairly simple thing. So thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Dr. Balsker. Definitely appreciate that. Um, any questions from uh, council members for Dr. Balsker? Mr. Twight, was this a question on, on this point or did you have a different motion? 
different motion, so please stay on this. Okay. All right, not a motion, right. but a different subject. Okay, all right. Mr. Mezzaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Balsinger for your statement. I think that was helpful based on the public comments we heard. I'm wondering if as part of that plan that you were talking about, it might include being able to coordinate with tribes on a tribal consultation prior to an action at the council so that they would be able to talk to the agency about that. That seemed to be a priority. And I'm wondering if there's a legal constraint or if that's something that might be possible in the future. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you, Mr. Mezzo. I'm not aware of any legal constraint on that issue. So uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're receiving new guidance uh, similar to the 30 by 30 rule. Uh, our headquarters, most people are talking to no less so we understand what requirements and what suggestions are contained in the presidential memo and how to interpret it. And we will work regionally, even absent that uh, on communication. So I don't think that we will look at an upcoming agenda and call every tribe that, that we can and say, here's the list of agendas you want to talk about it, but we will have some more proactive outreach. If that's, if that's your question, uh, trying to make sure certain that the opportunities for people are uh, understood. Thank you. Other questions for Dr. Bolsker? I do actually have a follow-up to Mr. Mesro's question and Dr. Balsiger's answer. Um, and, and hopefully relatively simple. Dr. Balsiger, it does sound like things are fluid. Um, I'm, I'm just hopeful that um, you'll be able to keep the council apprised um, uh, of how that, as, as you begin to arrive at concrete steps, I'm, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to keep the council apprised as that happens. Mr. the chair, uh, Mr. Flight, uh, I will pledge to do that. Thank you, Dr. Balsiger. Okay, back to you, Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I'm thinking about the, um, the request that we got for emergency um, uh, rules um, relative to allowing uh, the police to deal with um, some of the, the COVID related issues. And, and I have to admit, I ended up towards the end of that discussion um, getting rather lost in the um, in, in both the timing and the process. And I'm wondering if um, we can sort of revisit that so that there's some understanding, uh, collective understanding of timing moving forward and when in particular, when emergency rules would need to actually be in place. And I, I know that scheduling is really tight because they only last for a certain amount of time. So you want to implement them so that they'll target uh, in their limited duration, they'll target the most effective period. But I, I, I got confused about how that was going to work or when that was going to happen. So if we could return to that, that would be helpful to me. For Mr. Chairman, this is Glenn Merrill. I addressed some of that into my B2 report. If that's what Mr. Twight was referring to, I can uh, refresh the council. And, and thank you, Mr. Merrill, but in particular in, in, in relation to um, the FVOA request that Mr. Clampett discussed in public testimony, and then uh, as Ms. Baker pointed out, there, there was probably a wrinkle there that they weren't aware of. And so how you'll take that, that guidance that you offered us in V2 plus the input and staff tasking and move forward with all of that. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'll give it a go. So assuming the council wanted to proceed with uh, at least two of the actions that are very similar to what was done uh, last year, and that is the uh, vessel use cap, as well as the IFQ emergency transfers, um, we would 
applicants. And then we also have the issue of uh, moving up the season start date for the rockfish program, as well as uh, relieving the residency requirements for uh, participants using the IFQ from the ADAC CQE. So in terms of priorities, there's probably a couple of ways you can do this, but if the intent is to try and have those in place as soon as possible so that they are effective when they need to be to provide relief, uh, I think our intent would be to try and proceed first with the transfer provision because the season start date is March 8th and we've identified that that is a priority for a large number of participants as well. A uh, second issue would be then looking at the April 1st date for the rockfish program, which is also something that would require expedient action for the various vessels in those cooperatives to be able to participate. Um, after that, I think it's, it's a little bit hazier. Uh, the vessel use cap provisions, because they are relieving the maximum amount of the IFQ that can be harvested on a vessel, and are applicable in area four, we probably have a little bit more lead time in terms of the implementation of those because those would not be expected to become binding until potentially sometime in the summer or May time period when fishing really begins in those areas. Uh, similarly, that's about the same timing that we may expect that there would be harvesting occurring in the area 4B uh, halibut fishery. Uh, around ADAC. So I think both of those could proceed on a schedule that is slightly behind those of the first two actions I mentioned. Uh, the other action that I think was a component part of at least the uh, FDOA request was uh, looking at an emergency action that would relieve the requirement under our medical transfer provisions that we would not count uh, the, this year as a year that would be used to determine the maximum amount of time that you can use a medical transfer. So our regulations state that we won't approve a person receiving a medical transfer if they've used that provision for three of the preceding seven years. So it's sort of a rolling average. Uh, frankly, I don't know that that issue is ripe for an emergency action because we haven't reached that limit. So that medical transfer uh, provision was implemented and became effective during the 2020 season. So we've had the 2020 season, we're now in the 2021 season coming up, two years where uh, an individual could be using a medical transfer. And I'll also note that a medical transfer is different than an emergency transfer. An emergency transfer does not count as one of the years that you're using a medical transfer. There are different regulations and different types of transfers. So we also have another year then, 2022, which would be the third year that a person could use a medical transfer. Then starting in the 2023 fishery, a person, if they used it in all three of those years, would be precluded from receiving a medical transfer. A long way of saying we have another year plus before that medical transfer provision would become binding, and that would allow the council an opportunity to revisit this issue at some point in the future, perhaps in the fall, and make a decision to initiate a normal notice and comment rulemaking process that would allow us to implement changes if we wanted to, to relieve that uh, requirement or that restriction on the number of transfers that could be used. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, very well. Can uh, you indulge me though, just for a moment on your um, example um, there at the end in terms of the effect of cumulative um, medical transfers. Is, is that scenario that you walk through also true for an individual who had prior to 2020 used a medical transfer for one or two years? So, Mr. Chairman, the revised medical transfer regulations didn't become effective until the 2020 fishing season. So it's the okay, start of these new regulations. Yeah. Thank you. That Glenn really appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> it was just all in a muddle around that. Uh, Mrs. Kimball. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Merrill's at the the table. I just wanted to ask that something else that came up during 
this presentation and B reports, I had asked about the secretary's authority to promulgate emergency regulations that respond to a public health emergency and that it has a different timeline outlined, essentially that emergency regulations may remain in effect until the circumstance that created the emergency. In, in some cases here, the pandemic may no longer exist. And I wonder if there was anything further you could discuss about the ability to to apply that particular rationale in this case. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Kimball. Uh, I'll start and then if General Counsel, if Ms. Boker has other things to add, uh, perhaps we can do that. Uh, so just briefly under the Magnuson Stevens Act Section 305C3C does allow us to implement emergency rulemaking um, that would uh, be in effect uh, provided the public had a, has an opportunity to comment after the regulations published or a public health emergency. And, and this is the critical part too, the Secretary of Health and Human Services concurs with the Secretary of Commerce's action. So it introduces another layer of review. We have to get the concurrence of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. That may be easy to do, but it is not a procedure that we have used uh, in the past recently. I'll, I'll note as well, we're in the middle of a, a transition period between administrations, and sometimes that can make it difficult to reach the people we need to reach in order to obtain that kind of coordination. Um, it's certainly something we could explore, but I think that it would probably introduce potentially a, an unknown uh, risk that that process could take longer than the process that we have in place under our uh, standard emergency rulemaking authority. I can wait and see if Ms. Smoker has something, but I, I, I thank you for looking into that. That that doesn't sound viable. It sounds like, I mean, the intent was to provide some efficiency so we weren't continually, continually reevaluating and then extending the same emergency regulations under the same reasoning. Uh, but it does not sound like that gains us anything. So thanks for looking into it. Mr. Chairman, I, I have nothing further to add unless council members have some additional questions, but I, I, I think Mr. Merrill covered it sufficiently. All right, thank you, Ms. Smoker. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I also have a question for Mr. Merrill while he's here, actually two. So following up on that line of questioning uh, we just had from Ms. Kimball, I, I'm wondering about, uh, I thought Mr. Twight asked this, but maybe I, I misheard that. I, I'm wondering about the duration um, of the emergency rule. I think you uh, reminded us in the B report that the that uh, emergency rule recommendations are in, in place for about six months under the Magnuson Act. And then there is a possibility to extend that as we've talked about here. By my calculation then, should the council recommend emergency action to the secretary under the Magnuson Act for particular actions today? And should the secretary approve those and promulgate regulations that would, uh, the first um, emergency rule would expire in about September. It, say it takes you a month to get it in place. So it goes in place in March. That's about September, right? Is that correct? Through the chair, uh, Ms. Baker, yes, that's correct. And so what is it? Can you remind me? That's obviously not going to be the complete duration of the IFQ season this year. Um, we heard the other day that the commissioner IPHC recommended, I think December 7th or 8th closure date. What would be um, the process? Is it possible for us to sort of address that uh, under an emergency action at this meeting under the Magnuson Act, or is that something we would need to do later when the time is closer and do the evaluation there? Uh, through the chair, Ms. Baker, I'll, I'll give the uh, implementation shorthand and then perhaps Ms. Smoker can provide a little more detail on the specific language. But within our uh, statutory authority for emergency rules, we uh, can implement an emergency rule for up to 180 days and then it may be extended for one additional period for 186 more days, provided that the emergency still exists. And 
and also provided that we provide an opportunity for public comment. So one of the issues that I think we face is that if the council is to recommend emergency action at this meeting and we implement that before or close to the start of the uh, ISQ fishing season, by the time that first emergency rule expires, we will still be in the middle of the IFQ season. And assuming that that emergency still exists, it would probably be appropriate for us to want to extend that emergency rule so that we could continue to provide the relief from the regulations for the remainder of the fishing season. Um, I think the council doesn't necessarily need to speak to duration right now, but it could certainly indicates that we assume that we would revisit this issue later once we have a better understanding if the emergency still exists as we get closer to the expiry date of that first uh, emergency action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Smoker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll also add on to uh, Glenn's summary that the paragraph that allows the council, the agency to extend the emergency for that second period of time, in addition to requiring uh, the ability for the public to comment on the emergency, also says that um, in the case of a council recommendation for an emergency rule, that the council is actively preparing an SMP plan amendment or proposed regs to address the emergency on a permanent basis. I understand that this emergency is something that might not have permanency. So uh, we might wanna check into that and that it wouldn't be something that we would need to uh, address on a permanent basis, but that is another prong of being able to extend for that second period of time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Smoker. Ms. Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion on uh, the IFQ uh, program emergency rule request if there are no more questions from council members. I think we're ready for motions. Okay. Uh, the motion has been sent to council staff and I'll, I'll just say by prefacing this that um, I, I do intend uh, to address uh, multiple requests that we received for IFQ program revision, but after uh, talking it over with agency staff, um, have been advised to uh, do separate motions for each one of these for clarity for the public and for the council members. And so uh, that is my intent. So I'll wait for the motion to be displayed. The council requests the secretary promulgate emergency regulations under the authority of Section 305C of the Magnuson-Stevens Act to allow the temporary transfer of Tetra vessel halibut and Quibblefish IFQ for all individual quota shareholders for the 2021 fishing season. This action does not modify other aspects of the program. The second, I'll speak to it. Second. Seconded by Mr. Jensen, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks council members for uh, the discussion earlier. I, I felt like we got a lot of public testimony and, and emergency rules are not something we do every time, so we typically have to review process a little bit. Um, but with respect to this motion, um, I believe an emergency exists involving the halibut and sable fish IFQ fishery, uh, and I'm recommending emergency rulemaking to address social, economic, and public health situations that are present in the halibut and stable fish IFQ fishery. Uh, I believe the continuing COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting health risk mitigation measures, uh, health mandates and travel restrictions are an unusual circumstance that warrant an emergency regulation change to allow flexibility for individual catcher vessel IFQ holders. 
Uh, the impacts of the continuing COVID-19 pandemic on the 2021 IFQ fishery uh, is, are an unforeseen and recently discovered circumstance uh, as we experienced in 2020 uh, various restrictions to minimize spread of the virus and protect public health, uh, including travel restrictions and health mandates in Alaska and other states, uh, those that remain in place uh, and are likely to continue through most, if not all, of the 2021 IFQ season. Uh, the situation was clearly not foreseen when the council recommended and Im implemented the June 2020 emergency rule to provide for temporary IFQ transfers. Uh, that rule was effective only through the end of the 2020 season uh, in anticipation of relaxed or removed travel restrictions and health mandates uh, for the 2021 season uh, in response to development and distribution of uh, an effective vaccine against COVID-19. Since the end of the 2020 fishing season, new information has become available uh, indicating that vaccine production and distribution has not progressed as anticipated. In addition, new variants of the virus make it likely that travel restrictions and health mandates will continue uh, to be in place throughout Alaska during 2021. And this will directly impact uh, harvesters, processors, and communities that participate in the IFQ fishery and necessitates the need for emergency rulemaking. The travel restrictions, health mandates, and other operational challenges posed by COVID-19 present serious management problems in the halibut and sable fish IFQ fishery. IFQ holders may be unable to travel to fishing ports to harvest their IFQ without significant personal health risk, in addition to additional economic costs to comply with the travel restrictions. Without the increased flexibility to temp temporarily transfer IFQ, uh, it is likely uh, that a significant portion of harvest could be foregone and uh, the existing IFQ hired master and medical transfer provisions do not provide flexibility to a portion of IFQ holders to transfer IFQ to other harvesters who may not be limited by health or other economic factors. And in addition, many IFQ holders cannot either use the existing hired master or medical transfer provision. And in addition, the existing medical transfer provisions do not specifically contemplate transfers by otherwise healthy individuals to minimize their potential health risks or risks to their families, crews, and communities where they operate. Therefore, a broader IFQ transfer provision is needed to mitigate these economic, social, and public concerns. The current conditions uh, facing the IFQ fishery can be addressed through emergency regulations for which the immediate benefits outweigh uh, the value of our normal rulemaking process. Uh, the council received comment letters and testimony today indicating uh, support for this action among participants in the fishery. Uh, the need for this emergency action is well known and, and well supported by the IFQ fish, fishery participants as evidenced by uh, support for this action from our advisory panel. And uh, based on the timeline for notice and comment rulemaking, it would not be possible to modify the IFQ transfer provisions using our typical council process and NIMS rulemaking uh, prior to the beginning of the 2021 IFQ season in March, or even uh, probably by summer of 2021 when the bulk of IFQ fishing activity takes place. And finally, uh, this emergency action would not impose additional restrictions on the fishery, but would alleviate limitations on the fishery to address an unprecedented situation. It's also worth noting uh, this emergency rule would not increase the amount of available harvest, increase risks of over harvest or otherwise modify conservation measures. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Baker. Questions from council members on a motion? Mr. Dem. Uh, Mr. Down, you're on mute. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this in the rationale for your motion, so I apologize in advance if I did. But did you address the, the that uh, the difference between this and the AP motion, and that there uh, the AP motion suggested that we that uh, the use of this regulation not be counted as one of the eligible years um, uh, as a the limits are in currently in place that they would still be in place 
with this is did, was that something you addressed or was that something that uh, was intentionally left out and if so what was the reason for that Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Down, thanks for the question. I I did not address that in my rationale. Uh, you're correct. Uh, that particular uh, paragraph from the AP motion was not uh, in my motion. I did explicitly leave it out based on the discussion that we had uh, with Mr. Merrill uh, prior to uh, taking this motion. It was my understanding, uh, as he explained, that the temporary uh, IFQ transfers that I'm proposing for emergency action in this motion are not counted as medical transfers. And, and so that is the same approach that the agency took in 2020 for authorizing the temporary transfers. And so I was um, happy that Mr. Merrill explained that difference. And I also appreciated the explanation that if uh, fishery participants are concerned uh, about medical transfers that have taken place in, in 2020, 2021, uh, then that is something uh, that really isn't right for this emergency rule request at this point in time, if, if that's an issue that uh, the council chooses to take up in the future to address, uh, we have time to do that under our normal process. Yeah, thank you very much. That was my assumption too. And I just wanted, I didn't hear you mention that. And I just thought that, that we should, that, that helps me. Um, thank you for being so clear about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Down. Uh, additional questions on the motion? Okay, any amendments to the motion? Comments on the motion. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the motion, Mr. Baker. I'll be supporting the motion for all the reasons stated in um, Ms. Baker's rationalization. I, I think it's a good motion and, and it's uh, timely and, and needed. So I'll be voting in favor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Jensen. Mr. Twight. Um, I, I, thank you, Ms. Baker. I uh, really appreciate the work uh, that you put into this to uh, um, have it reflect uh, our discussions all the way through the meeting and as well um, the work you put in for the rationale just to make it clear that we are, we believe we're clearing, quite well clearing the emergency um, regulation hurdle that we, that we have to clear every time we use the emergency regulation approach. Um, and uh, I, I think this is one of those that ultimately, um, as we get time at some point in the future, I, I hope we can reflect a little bit on how some of these regulations really lock us into place. Some of the permanent regulations that we have really lock us into place and make it very difficult to, to deal with um, unforeseen circumstances like the pandemic and the amount of work that we put in and then certainly the agency has to put in for emergency rules um, definitely pulls away from other things, but this is absolutely the right thing to do at this point. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Additional comments before we vote? I don't see any. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, calling the roll on the emergency rule for temporary transfer of CBIFQ for the 2021 season. Because it's an emergency rule, uh, I'll be calling Dr. Balsiger last. Mr. Jensen. Yes. Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Marks. Yes. Mr. Mesro. Yes. Mr. Twight. Yes. Ms. Baker. Yes. Ms. Campbell. Yes. Mr. Cross. Yes. Mr. Down. 
Yes. Mr. Kinneen. Yes. Dr. Balsiger. To preserve the secretary's discretion, I will vote no. Motion passes 10 to one. All right, thank you, Mr. Witherell. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have another motion. The council requests the secretary promulgate expedited regulations to remove vessel use cap regulations under 50 CFR section 679.42H1 for IFQ halibut harvested in IPHC regulatory areas 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4D for the 2021 fishing season. This action does not modify other aspects of the program. Second, I'll speak to it. Second for Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, I uh, believe that uh, immediate action uh, is needed to address economic, social, and public health situations present in the uh, halibut IFQ fishery for areas 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4D. Again, um, as I discussed in the previous motion, I'll try not to repeat myself too much, uh, but the impacts of the continuing uh, pandemic on the 2021 fishery uh, were unforeseen and, and recently discovered um, the, the same travel restrictions and health mandates that I, I spoke of um, in the previous motion uh, were clearly not foreseen to be extended into the 2021 fishing season. Um, again, uh, for the same reasons that I spoke of before we uh, when passing emergency rules last year, uh, those uh, dates expired at the end of the fishing season. And so uh, based on the recently discovered circumstances about vaccine development and distribution, um, it's, uh, it's become clear that um, the ISQ transfer, uh, temporary transfer provision that we just passed um, is not uh, going to be quite enough uh, to relieve some of the challenges in area four, in the area four halibut fishery. Uh, the IFQ program uses vessel use caps in order to limit the amount of halibut that can be harvested on any one vessel. Um, this helps to ensure that a diversity of vessels are engaged in the fishery uh, and address uh, concerns about consolidation uh, if the fishery is conducted from a, a small number of vessels. Um, however, uh, again, due to the continuing travel restrictions and health mandates, um, this is going to have a, a direct impact in terms of the number of, of vessels that can be uh, sort of safely and reasonably made available uh, in area 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4D. And in addition, local quarantine and other health measures at specific remote ports in those areas uh, may further limit the ability of smaller vessels to operate uh, because processing facilities and vessel services may not be available. Uh, small communities such as St. Paul and ADAC are located in area four and may be particularly vulnerable uh, to uh, the virus due to residents with underlying conditions and, and limit, limited medical facilities and, and personnel. Um, a, a relatively large proportion of vessels participating in the area four halibut ISQ fishery are operating uh, near the current vessel use cap which again thereby limits the amount available uh, to accommodate any additional IFQ if it's transferred uh, to persons eligible to harvest IFQ on vessels operating in that fishery. And again, it's possible, although the season hasn't started yet, um, that uh, relatively low ex vessel prices due to poor market conditions and, and higher operating costs uh, may further limit the number of vessels that can economically harvest their halibut IFQ in area four. Um, just to be clear that this motion does not recommend a waiver of vessel use caps for halibut in areas other than uh, area four, uh, nor for any, uh, or nor for stable fish in any area. And again, similar to my comments on the previous motion, I believe that COVID-19 pandemic and resulting mitigation measures, health mandates and travel restrictions are an unusual circumstance that warrant an expedited regulatory change to allow uh, flexibility for IFQ holders 
And uh, just for process questions, I know that uh, since this action uh, is, would change regulations for halibut only, uh, I have not uh, proposed that we recommend this action under the Magnuson Act. Uh, I am instead uh, just requesting that uh, the secretary promulgate expedited regulations under the appropriate authority. Happy to take questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Don't see any questions. The amendments? Comments on the motion? Mr. Jensen. Uh, th thanks again, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the motion, Ms. Baker. I, I'll be supporting it, and it, I'll be, say the same thing I did last time for all the reasons stated by Ms. Baker to make it short and succinct. It was a good motion, and it's uh, needed for that area, and that I'll be supporting it. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Right. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Calling the roll on an emergency rule to remove the vessel cap regulations for IFQ halibut in area 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4D. Um, and while this isn't a Magnuson Act um, issue, so uh, I don't think I have to call Dr. Bossigal last, but I will anyway, just uh, to give him get the opportunity. Uh, Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Marks. Yes. Mr. Mesro. Yes. Mr. Twight. Yes. Ms. Baker. Yes. Ms. Campbell. Yes. Mr. Cross. Yes. Mr. Down. Yes. Mr. Jensen. Yes. Mr. Kaneen. Yes. Dr. Balsiger. Yes. It passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, third and final motion. So uh, the council requests the secretary promulgate emergency regulations under the authority of section 305C of the Magnuson-Stevens Act to suspend the residency requirements applicable to the ADAC community quota entity program for 2021 at 50 CFR 679.41 G6 Romanet 2. This action does not modify other aspects of the CQE or IFQ program. In a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Thank you. Second by Mr. Jensen, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe that an emergency exists involving Halibut IFQ held by the ADAC community quota entity, and I'm recommending emergency rulemaking under the Magnuson-Stevens Act to address social, economic, and public health concerns present uh, in uh, the Halibut IFQ fishery. I believe the continuing COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting health risks, mitigation measures, health mandates, and travel restrictions are an unusual circumstance that warrant an emergency regulatory change to allow flexibility uh, for IFQ holders. Uh, to help ensure access to and sustained participation in the commercial halibut and sablefish fisheries, the council modified the IFQ program to allow uh, ADAC and, and other remote coastal communities in the Gulf of Alaska the option to purchase and hold catcher vessel quota. The IFQ resulting from the CQE held quota share must be leased to community residents annually. Uh, the impacts of the continuing COVID-19 pandemic on the 2021 IFQ fishery uh, and the ability for residents to, to carry out this harvest of CQE held IFQ is, is an unforeseen and recently discovered circumstance. As in 2020, uh, several restrictions were imposed to minimize spread of the virus and protect public health. Uh, 
these restrictions remain in place and are likely to continue uh, through the 2021 IFQ season. Uh, in uh, particular, uh, the the ADAC CQE fishery uh, during the 2020 fishing season, um, there were no locally owned vessels that could be used to fish CQE held IFQ. Uh, as we know, the processing plant in ADAC was closed and therefore non-local vessels were not landing in ADAC as they had in the past. And as a result, the ADAC CQE was unable to find how that fishing vessels willing to take local CQE, local residents um, onto their vessels while the CQE held quota was being fished. This was due to the need to quarantine to protect vessel crew, as well as uh, complications relating to the need to pick up residents in ADAC, deliver halibut to an Alaska, then arrange to fly residents back to ADAC through Anchorage. Uh, these factors led to more than 93% of ADAC CQE halibut IFQ quota for the uh, 2020 season going unharvested. It's likely that uh, travel restrictions and health mandates will continue uh, to be in place through 2021 and, and again directly impact the ADAC CQE's participation in the fishery. And I think this ne necessitates need for emergency rulemaking. Uh, the, the COVID mitigation uh, measures in place um, present serious management problems in the IFQ, uh, halibut IFQ fishery for ADAC CQE. Uh, again, non-local vessels that could potentially be used to harvest ADAC CQE held IFQ will not be able to take local residents without significant personal health risk or additional economic costs in order to comply with travel restrictions or local mandates for quarantine. Without the increased flexibility to waive the local resident requirement, it's likely that a significant portion of the harvest will again be foregone. Uh, an emergency exemption from the CQE residency requirements uh, will likely be necessary to ensure the continued safety of the community while continuing important economic benefits of the CQE program. And the current conditions facing uh, the halibut IFQ fishery off ADAC can be addressed through emergency regulations for which the immediate benefits outweigh the value of our normal rulemaking process. Uh, relieving residency requirements would provide flexibility and prevent stranding of CQE health quota as occurred in 2020. Uh, the council received a comment letter uh, supporting this action uh, from ADAC CQE representatives and the need for this emergency action was also supported by the council's advisory panel. Uh, based on the timeline for regular notice and comment rulemaking, uh, it would not be possible to modify the CQE residency requirement uh, using our typical council process and NIMS rulemaking prior to, the, to either the beginning of the 2021 IFQ season or even by summer 2021 when the IFQ held by ADAC CQE is typically harvested. And finally, this emergency action would not impose additional restrictions on the fishery, but would alleviate limitation uh, on the fishery to address an unprecedented situation. And again, I'll note that this emergency rule would not increase the amount of available harvest, increase the risk of overharvest, or otherwise modify conservation measures. Happy to take any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Questions on the motion? Any amendments to the motion? Comments on the motion? Ms. Baker? Mr. Chair, uh, just very quickly, I, I wanted to um, just say that since uh, this is the third motion of three, uh, that inherent in my motion is um, a sense of, uh, I'm, I'm not directing and I haven't directed the agency in terms of priority uh, in dealing with these motions, uh, should, should this one pass as well. Uh, and I just wanted to say that part of the intent, although I didn't have it in my motion, uh, was for the agency to evaluate the different emergency r rule requests that might come in front of it in the way that Mr. Merrill described to provide uh, for the most expeditious way to implement these rules uh, that we can that we can achieve. Okay, thank you, Ms. Baker. 
Any comments on the motion before we vote? Great, thank you, Ms. Baker. Uh, I'll be supporting the, the motion. I think you've done a, a great job laying out the, the rationale and, and need and, and benefit for um, this this action. I certainly will be supporting the, the motion. Um, Mr. Witherall. Mr. Chairman, calling the roll on emergency rule to suspend residency requirements for the ADAC CQE. Mr. Marks. Yes. Mr. Mesereau. Yes. Mr. Twight. Yes. Ms. Baker. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Mr. Cross. Yes. Mr. Down. Yes. Mr. Jensen. Yes. Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Kaneen. Yes. Dr. Baltimore. To preserve the secretary's discretion, I will vote no. Motion passes 10 to 1. Thank you, Mr. Witherall. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a uh, motion. I'll wait for staff to put up on the screen. My motion is the council requests the secretary promulgate emergency regulations under the authority of section 305C of the Magnuson-Stevens Act to move the start date of the 2021 Central Gulf Rockfish Program fishery to April 1st. Regulations under 50 CFR 679.80A32. This action does not modify other aspects of the Central Gulf Rockfish Program. And with a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Second by Mr. Jensen, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is pretty straightforward response and it's, it's in direct response to a request submitted by Alaska Groundfish Data Bank who represents the majority of vessels and all of the shoreside processors that participate in the rockfish program. Um, they also serve, as was noted in testimony, as the rockfish co-op manager for the six shoreside rockfish cooperatives. Um, I would note it was not brought up in the advisory panel, so that's not part of their minutes. And I think that was due to the time needed to confirm that all participants were in support. And we heard uh, testimony today that that is the case. Section 305C of the Magnuson Act allows the Secretary of Commerce to promulgate emergency rules if it meets the criteria. I think we heard very clearly from Ms. Baker all the criteria. I think the situation caused by the global pandemic is certainly can be defined as an emergency. I realize the guidance says we should limit the use of emergency rules to extremely special circumstances. And I think the council is applying that standard appropriately in this and the other emergency rules being considered for the fisheries under our jurisdiction. As we heard um, and is in written testimony, there's no shoreside market for flatfish this year due to both tariff uh, situation and COVID, things that are very much outside the realm of what we talk about in this council process, but are affecting the health of the fisheries that we manage more than just about any issue we discuss or manage at this point. Um, the public comment also noted the high risk of closures, whether intermittent closures or longer of shoreside processors as they try to stay operational while also dealing with COVID-19, which is much more prevalent this year than last year and more difficult to keep plants and communities 100% virus free. So processors, harvesters, communities, the state of Alaska, they're basically working around the clock to try to keep people safe and to try to comply with state of Alaska health orders and to try at the same time to be prosecuting and processing all of the fisheries. This change that is proposed here and, and requested by the public would change the start of the fishery one month early. I think it was spoken to well, the flexibility of that should help allow the rockfish fishery to be prosecuted before overlapping with the summer salmon fishery, even if some processing is interrupted due to COVID. And spreading out these fisheries was part of the intent of the original program to try to maximize the benefits to the community, allow for more continual fishing and processing, I think we should do everything we can to provide what flexibility we can to assist in this situation. And I, I really just can't emphasize enough what a challenge this is this year. I think this um, action does meet the criteria, the recent unforeseen circumstances, the pandemic, 
a serious management problem in the fishery if we cannot get fisheries prosecuted due to processing plant closures or capacity. And that to the best of our knowledge, this situation can be made better by extending the season and allowing a longer time frame to get fish out of the water and delivered. I think the emergency action is justified and meets NOAA's guidance for both the economic and social reasons allowed in the guidance um, to prevent significant direct economic loss or preserve a significant economic opportunity that would otherwise be foregone. And then for the social rationale to prevent significant community impacts by preserving an economic op opportunity that otherwise might be foregone. I think more than anything, COVID presents a serious management problem with the potential of creating significant harm to the community of Kodiak and to the inshore fishermen and processors. And based on what we've seen recently, significant disruption to those dependent on inshore fisheries in other regions. I note Kodiak's in a very similar high risk position. I think that makes this request justified and necessary for 2021. I'd also note there's no conservation issues with this request. It does not affect the amount of allowable harvest. It only extends the time frame in which that harvest could be taken by one month. And finally, I would note that the intent of the motion says April 1st. That was uh, consistent with the request we received, but it's the implementation of that rule, getting the application, issuing it, the quota share. If that's not able to be completed by April 1st specifically, I think any earlier start date would be consistent with the council intent. That's my rationale. I'll take any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Are there questions on the motion? Okay, any amendments on the motion? And for comments. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just real quickly, thank you, Ms. Kimball, for the motion. I think uh, you captured uh, the, the key elements of this action. I appreciated the request and the testimony that we received. Um, I, I think the challenges are very real and, and Kodiak is at risk like you've described. And so I think this very well qualifies, meets the criteria for an emergency rule. So thank you for the motion. I'll support it. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support this motion. I thank Ms. Kimball for making it. We've had extensive discussions this afternoon already about the effect that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on seafood operations and markets. Those processors who operate in the Kodiak area have been beginning our 2021 operating season at a time when virus levels have never been higher and vaccines are not yet wildly, widely available for our workforces or for our fishermen. Um, you need to look no further than the situation in Dutch Harbor and Accutan to see how difficult it is to keep a processing plant operating under the current pandemic conditions. Kodiak is at high risk. Many of the plants have resident workforces who mix with the community. It makes it even harder to keep the plants virus free um, and there, as Ms. Kimball noted, there is no biological or conservation reason for the May 1st start date. It was always just designed to facilitate the flow of fish through the processing plant. And so, in my opinion, allowing fishermen and processors an additional 30 days to harvest in a year when we are facing unprecedented challenges will increase the chances that the allowable harvest can be taken and it'll minimize the risk of economic harm to fishermen, processors, and coastal communities in what is already a very, very difficult year. So uh, I'm fully supportive of this and, uh, and appreciate the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Other comments before we vote? Withdrawal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Calling the roll on an emergency rule to move the start date of the Central Gulf Rockers Program Fishery to April 1st. Mr. Mesro. Yes. Mr. Twight. Yes. Ms. Baker. Yes. Ms. Campbell. Yes. Mr. Cross. Yes. Down. Yes. Mr. Jensen. Yes. Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Marks. 
Yes. Mr. Kinnean. Yes. Dr. Baltiger. I vote no on the emergency rule. It passes 10 to 1. Thank you, Mr. Rothero. Further action from council members. If Campbell, I don't know that your hand is meant to be raised. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not trying to try everyone's patience at this late hour, but we did receive some testimony um, relative to some crab items specifically on ESH. And I was trying to pay attention to what we have on our April agenda for ESH and our ESH review. Um, I'm wondering if just very briefly, Mr. Witherell could, could provide us what, what's intended to happen on our April agenda item for ESH. And in particular, just to get this out there, whether what the public comment provided could possibly be accommodated at a very minimum, having those staff that are going to be talking about EFH anyway, be able to provide us kind of an outlook or outline of what we would expect in prepping for our 2022 review. And this was specific to crab and even more specific to Bristol Bay Red King crab. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Gimble. The agenda item that we have for April uh, specifically looks at the consultation, the annual consultation report, that is all the consultations that NIMPS Habitat folks have had with uh, NOAA Corps of Engineers and others and provided comments. We certainly could add a request to the NIMPS Habitat folks to provide a progress report, what they anticipate uh, doing for 2022 uh, not only the schedule, but the contents of um, what new research might be added and what the process would be if the council thought that additional regulations might be needed to protect habitat for some species. We can make that request. Mr. Chair, um, I think that's very responsive. I um, I don't want to just assume all council members support that. I could try to put that in a motion if necessary. Uh, otherwise, I, I think Mr. Witherell captured kind of exactly what we need in April to understand the process going forward from staff. And I, I would just hope that could be accommodated. Um, if you need a motion, please let me know. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think this is an information request, so it probably doesn't need a motion from my viewpoint. Right, thank you, Mr. Witherow. Dr. Balsiger? Yes, to the extent that the agency NIST people are involved, we can uh, see that that happens without a motion as well. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Balsiger. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Cross? Well, uh, if, uh, if the council will uh, indulge me a little bit, uh, um, I think we did have some public testimony um, from an AP member asking about SSC. Um, and I would just like to address that with um, the council has uh, dealt with this for uh, the 25 years I've been involved, um, and it's it's a it's a scheduling issue. Um, we can't get an SSC uh, just to address the the AP because the SSC requires a group uh, that comes up with a um, report, and and then it's reviewed by the chairman. Um, and so it would be inconsistent for the, uh, an SSC member to give the AP some their kind of version of what's going on and then we get a different version when the final uh, the final report is given to us. Uh, the SSC does a, a lot of work on their uh, uh, report to us. It's uh, gone over by the main authors and then it's gone over by the chairman and they reach a consensus and, and make sure the wording is correct and, and exact. 
and, and even we get it a little late sometimes, but we usually get it. Um, but I think it would be hard, uh, and we've dealt with this for many years, trying to figure a way to get it. And, and the staff does a really good job of, of keeping the scheduling going as much as possible. And once in a while, uh, it does occur um, that the AP doesn't get it. It happened on the 16 years I was there um, times, and we just had to deal with it. But I think that's better than getting one version to the AP and then making a decision and then another final version from the SSC that may be different to us. Oh. So, so I, I, uh, I, that's just, I wanted to respond to the, to the public comment that, uh, and other members can uh, also add in, but that, that's my view of it. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Mr. Clay. Mr. Chair, I agree with Mr. Cross. I will note that some other councils deal with this by having the SSC meet at an entirely different time and often in a different location. And in my view, uh, that's problematic for several reasons, but I really appreciate the close connection between the council and the SSC uh, that we have. And I think in part that comes from being together for uh, meeting weeks. And so I would be very reluctant to try uh, separating out either either body um, from the main council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Council members. Anything, any further action under staff tasking? Okay, great. Um, oh, real, real quick, we did have a uh, finance committee meeting on uh, January 29th that wanted to cover just super high level. Um, again, we met on the, the 29th to review the status of council finances and determine an appropriate amount of stipends for eligible AP members and provide guidance on eligible AP stipend days. The council reviewed the status of council funding and expenditures and uh, noted that the council's in reasonably good financial shape at the beginning of year two of our five-year budget. Um, noted that there are some cost savings associated with not having in-person meetings, uh, but there's still large costs associated with having these virtual meetings. Um, there's phone bills, IT costs, and it's, it's more expensive than uh, and we would have imagined, I think, um, committee indicated that the ED should draft a plan for the council to review that would, to the extent practical, continue remote participation for in-person meetings after the pandemic is controlled. We may have a review of that at some point in the future. And then uh, at direction uh, of the council from its executive session uh, in December, the council discussed different stipend levels for AP members after weighing total annual stipends, cost of stipends within our ability to absorb this new expense into our budget uh, from 21 through 2024, the committee decided that a stipend level of $150 uh, per day for AP members was an appropriate amount and that would only be paid during um, actual AP meeting days. Um, so that's a high level summary of the finance committee. Mr. Mesro. Mr. Chairman, I actually had my hand up from before, but you didn't recognize that I did that. So I would gladly put my hand down if Mr. Baltzinger has a comment about the thing you were just talking about, and then you can circle back to me or I can lay out why I have my hand up now. Okay. I'm not seeing any, any uh, questions or comments on the finance committee. So uh, Mr. Mesro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My uh, my comment here is based on um, a comment I made earlier at the beginning of the meeting. Um, the Community Engagement Committee recommendation, one of the recommendations was to have specific um, indigenous people from specific locations on all of the advisory bodies that we have. And um, my thought was that while that may be problematic, it, it seems like it would be pretty simple to just add a column to the uh, matrix that we use when we're determining AP appointments that would allow 
participants on the advisory panel to voluntarily choose to indicate if they were an indigenous representative. And that way, when we go to balance out the council appointments, we would have that information front and center. It's not always evident who is representing who and how people are identifying themselves. And so what I was hoping we could have a brief discussion um, to see if it's possible for Mr. Witherall to just add an additional column to our matrix that would allow the council to immediately identify that. On that matrix now, there is a, an opportunity for someone to say that they represent a tribal government and that they represent subsistence interests, but there isn't one for someone that doesn't represent subsistence interests, but represents indigenous people. And I thought that might just be a step in the right direction for the council to at least be able to recognize at a glance people who voluntarily chose to indicate that they're an indigenous representative. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mezzer. I guess in, in terms of implementation, that sounds like it'd be a relatively simple um, simple thing to do. And I, I suspect that there's probably uh, the, the fact that you make it a, a voluntary notation is, is probably a, a reasonable idea. Um, Mr. Witherell? Mr. Chairman, that should be pretty easy to implement. Other, other council members? Ms. Baker? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mothero, for the suggestion. I, I do think uh, it's a good one and, and quite responsive to uh, some of the feedback we received at this meeting. Um, I guess I would know my understanding, uh, the matrix that you're referring to, I think it's pretty clear that all of the information on that matrix is self-reported. So it, it's all voluntary in terms of uh, who AP members, um, what AP members choose to list as, as like you said, identifying themselves. So I, I think um, that would be very helpful and, and I would appreciate um, staff being able to do that if, if the council wishes. Thanks, Ms. Baker. Dr. Balsinger, did you have anything on this topic? I had a different topic, but I do support this as okay. well since you, since you asked. Great. Other council members? You, Mr. Mezzaro, or Mr. Marks. I, I just wanted to say I, I support this as well. Thanks. Okay, back to you, Dr. Balsker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we did have a legislative committee report, and I think there was some brief discussion about perhaps drafting something to Senator Sullivan about language in, in, in some bill. And I, I don't know if we needed, I don't think we need a motion, but I'm not sure if we completed that. So I just want, didn't want it skipped. Um, I'm going to have to refer back to my legislative committee in minutes. We did, we, we, we discussed the, the EO, we, we talked about the Huffman bill. There was conversation about um, um, the Cook Inlet um, letter sent from the state. Mr. Twight? Thanks, Mr. Chair. My memory on this is that um, the, the, while the legislative committee was very interested in um, being able to recommend uh, um, to Senator Sullivan a solution for uh, the problem that emerged um, that we ended up having to um, reluctantly put into place in our, in our vote on this. Um, there was, the legislative committee was interested in trying to find a solution, but there was some concern that the, um, the solution that Senator Sullivan was looking at might need a little more investigation first to make sure it didn't have any, uh, any unforeseen consequences. And we recommended some additional fact finding, and I think it was determined that we had some time to do that. 
And with that, I think I'd like to look back to Mr. Weatherall and see if he's had any ability to um, determine how and, and when that might, that additional um, research might occur. Mr. Chairman, my, my takeaway from the legislative committee was that uh, it would be up to the state of Alaska or the Senator's office to explore the other possibilities, not council or council staff. I, you know, I did get the request from an email from the Senator's office. And since we really can't prepare a written recommendation relative to this request, my plan was to simply respond with the paragraph that summarizes the legislative committee discussion, noting that we did talk about another more specific approach rather than the broad approach that was already proposed and noted that the center's office could reach out to NIMS for technical drafting assistance um, on any legislation or or approach that they were interested in. So that's my plan to respond unless the council has further direction. Thank you, Mr. Willero. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Witherell, for that. That, um, yeah, I, I guess, uh, I, I thought we had this discussion in the B reports and that was my understanding of how you would respond. And I think that paragraph that you referred to in the legislative committee report captures the discussion appropriately for the response to Senator Sullivan's, Sullivan's office request. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Mr. Twight, did you have a yeah, that's not an old hand. That's, that's an, um, I, I noticed Ms. Campbell has her hand up as well. She may be interested in saying what I think I might be about to say. Um, so I, I yield the floor to her and then, or not. Um, I, I'm concerned about, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm. I, so first off, I, I thought that we were going to do a little collectively in the council process, probably led by the state of Alaska, do a little bit more thinking about this. I'm concerned about a response back to Senator Sullivan's office that basically says, um, well, you've got the resources to figure this out and, um, and, and you can always ask the agency for drafting help. Um, that's not the kind of response that I think we wanna give to the center. And maybe I'm being a little too blunt. I'm sure we were thinking wording it a little more diplomatically, but. Still, that's how I would read it if I were um, on Senator Sullivan's staff. And, and I'd like to not do that. Thanks, Mr. Twight. Ms. Campbell. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure that, that I fully appreciated the, the you know, nuanced tone um, that Mr. Winterall planned to strike in his response. But we have a very substantial problem here. Um, the council was put in a, one of the most difficult positions that, that I've encountered since I've been here. We have a member of the Alaska's delegation uh, reaching out with a proposed solution. And it's my fervent hope that we could uh, reward that, collaborate, support those efforts um, uh, just just as much as we possibly can within the bounds of, of what is acceptable for the council because um, it really is my hope and I think the hope of many that we will be able to get a congressional solution that, to this because it really does seem to be the only viable alternative. So that's what I don't Thank you, Ms. Kimball, Ms. Ms. Kimball. Mr. Chair, I was hoping to get more clarity. We, we, the intent of Mr. Witherell wasn't just to kind of forward these minutes, but can we 
and I assume the smoker will stop me if I'm saying anything wrong, but can, can we kind of extend our hand to, to help with this and stop short of providing alternative language, which I, I know has been a bright line of, you know, our allowance under our restrictions on, on lobbying Congress. For instance, are there conversations to be had about, you know, an approach that might be fairly narrow uh, versus an approach that might be broader to include other areas and species? Can that can those conversations be had, or is that is that not allowed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Um, yes, the council can talk and discuss. Um, all, all kinds of things, including alternate proposals. Um, the, the, the trick comes, that the problem comes with actually making a written recommendation to Congress for an alternative proposal. Um, there, there, there might be ways, as you mentioned, to discuss um, pros and cons, narrower or broader, that, that we might be able to provide uh, because it might not necessarily mean it's, it's an alternative proposal. But um, you are, the council may talk about uh, specifically and, and, and specifics of alternative proposals. It, it's just that um, when it comes to the recommendation from the council to avoid a lobbying issue, the council would not want to provide that specific, those specific proposals. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Smoker. So given given that, and that there were, you know, some other proposals provided even in these brief minutes, um, is that something we would need a motion for, or could we, can we just provide to the executive director our hope and intent that those types of solutions are discussed with the senator's office, given this request, without making a formal recommendation for any particular avenue. That was uh, that directed at Ms. Smoker. Yes, Ms. Smoker, Mr. Witherell, anyone who would like to. I could try to respond. Mr. Chair, um, we did act, Senator Sullivan's office had one piece of specific language they actually requested our opinion on. And I, I thought at the legislative committee that we weren't ready yet to deliver that opinion because uh, there was some interest in trying to think through a little further. And I, I thought that's where the council members who are sort of closest to the situation, we're gonna take that in hand and and, um, and then come back. But I, I didn't think we were just gonna tell the Senator to um, that we didn't have anything to offer. Uh, and that's what worries me. So we have some language from the Senator, it may not be the right language, but, and the Senator did ask us about that. Ms. Smoker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Twight, get, uh, for a moment, Ms. Kimball, I'm sorry, let me address Mr. Twight. Um, yes, the, the, the Senator's office did ask about unexpected outcomes, um, unintended consequences of the state's proposal. And that is something that the council may directly comment on. Um, the council needs to avoid language such as we oppose or we support, but you can couch your comments in terms of your ability to carry out your responsibilities under the grant to manage fisheries in light of that proposal. And Mr. Twight, my recollection that I will uh, yield to other members of the committee, but my recollection was the committee discussed also the um, approach that had been taken in the West Coast Dungeness crab fishery and I had thought that you had made the suggestion that 
more uh, effort in terms of finding out how that approach is working is what you thought it might be good to get some more information on. I, I did not uh, pick up, now it might have been you also uh, were addressing that towards the state's proposal, but I also commented in the committee meeting that um, that section of the Magnuson Act, section 302H1, was the uh, main leading argument in um, the salmon litigation we were involved in with Amendment 12. And the agency's position and arguments were that that section should be interpreted as including the term federal. It wasn't there and the Ninth Circuit disagreed with us uh, with a plain language statutory construction ruling. But we, we did argue that it was focused on federal conservation and management. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, Ms. Smoker's recollections are mine as well. Um, and, and that's why I was a little surprised to hear that we really did not have a plan forward and that in fact we were going to be simply responding my, what I heard was that we were going to be responding back to the Senator that we essentially did not have much more to offer. Um, and that was what I suggested in the beginning was I thought we'd agreed we had a bit more work to do before getting back to the Senator. So, um, and with that, I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Dwight, Mr. Marks. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I, that description follows my recollection of the conversation and that the, the uh, proposed change with the word federal was fairly broad, but there, without making a recommendation, there's also an example of a more specific action and, and that uh, there was gonna be some investigation to determine a little more background on the uh, West Coast crab issue uh, before moving forward with that or offering it. Thanks. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just uh, say that that was my recollection as well. And, and as Ms. Smoker mentioned early, earlier, it, it was my intent uh, to, to work with Mr. Witherell on following up on some of those uh, fact gathering um, uh, yeah, to get some more information, like we talked about, um, understanding uh, the bounds that the council has to work within. Um, I'm still learning those myself. And so, but yes, uh, the, I also had the understanding that um, we had a, a little bit of time to put this uh, response together and that uh, those of us uh, with particular interest in this issue would take the lead on doing that. Baker, Mr. Twain. I'd like to um, thank Dr. Balsiger, and I don't mean this ironically. I'm really glad you brought this up because it looks like we didn't have as much clarity around the path forward as we should have, and I think we do now. So thank you. Well, well thank you. And so, Mr. Chairman, I, I think we've resolved how this is going to go forward. I'm sorry to belabor this so long, but I, I, I occasionally forget how things work out, so that's why I brought it up. But, but thanks for batting it around. Um, I appreciate you uh, reflagging that for us. I think we do have a plan forward now. Um, okay. Other council members, anything else? Great. Well, um, Mr. Witherell, uh, uh, thanks to you and your, your staff for an incredible job again. Uh, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm getting used to these, these virtual meetings, but certainly it's becoming 
more and more familiar all the time, and you and your staff uh, continue to do a, a fantastic job uh, making these these things happen. So uh, thank you so much, and thanks to the council and the, the public for uh, for uh, uh, another successful meeting and, and sticking sticking with it here today and, and, and getting through here on on Wednesday. So that concludes our uh, business. Great great job, everybody. Um, we will see you in April. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.